Hi guys. I would like to invite you to the audiobook service where we upload more than 300 hours of different audiobooks a week, link in details in the video description. Chapter 147 At first, I thought I heard it wrong. There's already a rumor about my title. I turned to the place where the voice came out without realizing it. As soon as I did that, a scream-like voice rang loudly. The tyrant looked at me. Don't say nonsense. It's a coincidence. No. Lady June's bright red eyes definitely turned towards me. You're doing this because you're jealous, right? And Lady June. I knew that the Black Knights, including the elite troops, were treated as a kind of idol, but I never thought that even I would be treated that way. Unlike the people around me who jokingly called me tyrant, when they sincerely and seriously called me that, I broke out in a cold sweat. Is the title really okay? Am I the only one who's weird? Why is everyone so natural? My face was rejuvenated as I heard people chant tyrant. I glanced at Meyer's face in front of me. His face, which was seen obliquely, was full of smiles as if he was so happy that everyone was lifting my title and praising me. Yeah, it's a relief that even Meyer is satisfied. I averted my gaze with a sigh and rushed to look ahead. Considering the ripple effect of people's eyes meeting and spreading once, it seemed I would have to stare only forward from now on. The special unit, perhaps inspired by the fact that someone had noticed them, looked a little upbeat and raised their hips. They all seemed to want to look plausible and good-looking. Sevi, pretending to be a grown-up next to me, raised his chin and complained in an envious voice. The vice commander has a title, it must be nice. What do you mean it must be nice? And you're going to have one soon. Hee <laughs> hee. Sevi's cheekbones twitched up. Just thinking about it seemed to be exciting. Wow. Black Knight. Tyrant. The only hope of mankind. People blindly praised the Black Knights. Flames of hope and expectation blazed from their fervent gaze. A thirst so intense that even I, glancing sideways at them, could feel it. That's when a little girl came out of the crowd. Miss Tyrant. More than the ridiculous designation of Miss Tyrant, my horse's spine sharpened, startled by the child that had suddenly jumped out at it. I hurriedly grabbed the reins of the surprised horse and calmed it down. Whether she knew she was almost stepped on by a horse, the child calmly gave me a fist. Please defeat the demon king. The child handed me a white wildflower. I couldn't help but take the flower. It seemed as if she tightly gripped them, the stems were crumpled by her small hands, but the petals were intact and beautiful. This child is in danger I'm sorry. The child doesn't know anything. Later, a person who appeared to be the mother of the child hugged the child and bent down to me. The surrounding area was so noisy that I couldn't hear it even if I was told to pay attention, so I just waved my hand as if I knew. The sound of the child's mother holding the child tightly and scolding her sounded distant. Don't you know what kind of person she is, how dare you approach her like that? I know. She's the one who will defeat the demon king. Sigh. The vice commander is a person of high integrity, so she didn't yell at you. You mustn't do that again. But daddy died because of the demon king. So I really wanted to ask her to defeat the demon king. I watched the child's face for a while as her mother held her and told her she was whining. It's already been 17 years since the gate opened. It's been so long that they're sick of it. Behind the seemingly peaceful landscape of the capital lurked the fear and anxiety of never knowing when and where the gates would open and the demons would pop out. They were all waiting for the day to come when they could go out into the fields to herd sheep, plow the fields, and sleep with their legs stretched out without any worries. To do so, we must resolve the war against the demon king and end this war. Faced with people's fervent expectations, I realized that the load on my shoulders was heavier than I had expected. But the load that Meyer was holding must be much heavier and much older. This little wildflower-like expectation I had received today was received dozens hundreds of times. I looked at Meyer's broad back as he moved silently forward amidst the cheers of the people. His black cloak swayed in the wind. He was alone in the midst of the deafening cheers. It was time for the performance report meeting. As the Black Knights entered the ceremony hall, everyone looked at the Black Knights with awe. 
the people who had looked at me last year and whispered in my ear were no longer there. Everyone naturally treated me as the vice leader of the Black Knights. Perhaps it was because I had passed the 60th level. But it must have been a deeply moving change, considering that when I had passed the 60th level in the first round, all I got back was taunts that I was not up to par. This is why treatment at home is so important. A son who is not spared at home will not be spared outside the home, and a troop member who is not recognized by the expeditionary team will not be recognized by anyone. It had nothing to do with me now. I sat down naturally in the chair Meyer had given me and looked around the ceremonial hall. Naturally, the Black Knights were in first place again this time and were placed closest to the Emperor's seat. However, there was something unexpected that even I didn't see coming. It was that the Fabian expedition was in a higher rank than I had expected. As I thought, there was no aegis, and the majority of the existing expedition members did not appear. However, the vacancy was filled with people who I couldn't recognize. I've never seen them in character settings. The person who appeared to be a wizard looked very familiar. However, seeing that I couldn't remember at all, I thought they were a person who passed by at the time of the first round. Fabian was proudly raising his chin. At the same time, glancing slightly toward me seemed to want to see me break down. Don't be ridiculous with your friends. With a small snort, I didn't even turn my head to that side. There was also a title awarding ceremony at this year's performance report meeting. Last year, no one was level 60, but this year was different. This year was different because even excluding the special unit, each expeditionary force had one or two people who were level 60 by now. It is the great happiness and hope of mankind. The emperor laughed out loud in delight at the appearance of level 60s. Fabian was also above the 60th level and was included in the list to receive the title. One or two of the 60 level expedition members were called up, and now it was Fabian's turn. I surreptitiously looked at Anasta and Jean's faces. Jean shrugged her shoulders so as not to catch Fabian's eye at all. Anasta, on the other hand, remained on her haunches, staring ahead. However, she could not turn off all of her thoughts, and her hands on her knees trembled finely. Still, both of them reunited with Fabian more resolutely than I had expected. The more I understood Jean and Anasta's feelings, the more I cheered for them in my heart, in a small way. Fabian, who walked proudly, knelt in front of the Emperor. It was a majestic atmosphere as if it were a ceremony to appoint a knight. But for me, it was just a skit. I crossed my arms and watched his ridiculous appearance. The Emperor said, tapping Fabian's shoulder with a sword twice. I will give Fabian Ignis of the Fabian Expedition the title of Crimson Prosecutor. Thank you. Fabian's expression, who received the title, hardened. The title of Crimson Prosecutor was not very bad, but there was a lot of difference from the title of Crimson Warrior in the first round. He was dreaming that he would be given the title of Warrior again this time. The title of the Warrior was not given to anyone. In the first round, Fabian's qualities had stood out, but now he was out of the Emperor's eyes due to the minor forest dungeon, which earned Fulger's pumpkin last year. It must have been frustrating to be tested for not being a brave warrior, but moreover, the moment he received his title was different from the first round, and his concentration was different. All the spotlight was in the past, and now he was merely a complimentary figure. People's attention was immediately drawn to the title holder as he passed by. Titles were sometimes given by the emperor based on a combination of a person's skills, job group, and reputation. If there was a nickname that was strongly etched in the minds of the people around them early on, he would give it to them. Some examples reflected the opinions of the people involved, but if they thought it was excessive, it was dismissed. A warrior became a prosecutor. Of course, if someone's hard breathing intervened, as mine did no matter how excessive it was, I just had to put it on. After their turn was over, it was finally the turn of the Black Knight's special unit. Anasta, whose name was called, made her way to the front of the Emperor. Her body wobbled due to the tension in her body. I give Anasta Quatre of the Black Knights the title of Black Veil. The title of Anasta had been requested of her. In honor of April's death, she submitted a new title, Black Veil, which meant funeral. Black Veil Anasta. Her gaze flickered over Fabian for a moment. Fabian didn't even notice that moment. Anasta, 
who had turned away completely, was still holding all her emotions. I greeted her quietly, pretending not to know anything. Chapter 148 Since then, all special troops have been awarded titles one after another. Those who attended the title ceremony opened their mouths wide. Will all the special forces be named? It said they were all raised by the vice head of the Black Knights. She's amazing, really. Why didn't the vice commander of the Black Knights attend the titling ceremony? Of course, she would have been level 60. You're late on rumors. She already has a title thanks to the Black Knight's request for a title from the Emperor one step ahead. You must have been stuck in the dungeon for a long time because you don't know that all the people in the capital know. Wow it's so sincere of the Black Knight to pay attention to each title. It's only been two years since they passed level 60 for one unit, I should do my best. I'm not very pleased that my story is on and off people's lips, but what Fabian was angry about was a small pleasure. I smiled little by little at Fabian's face, which was crumpled like crushed mud. After the title ceremony, the banquet time had arrived. The Black Knights gathered together and laughed around the special unit that was praised this time. Let's have a drink, my spirit. Rober laughed gaily and poured cherry juice into Sevi's glass. Sevi's lips remained bumpy. They had continued to be that way since the title ceremony. This was so because the title Sevi had come to receive was Spirit of the Wind. It was a title that gave him considerable ability, but it was far from what he had hoped for, which was Destroyer. Unhappy with his mercurial title, Sevi stared at the cherry juice placed before him with a miffed expression. Julieta exhorted Sevi with half the heart of appeasing such Sevi and half the relief of him not becoming a da. What's wrong? It's a pretty cool title. You got a cool title, Julieta, so you don't know how I feel. Julieta smiled awkwardly at Sevi's pointed voice. Julieta's title was God's Mace. I don't know if it's cool or not, but it sure seemed strong. Tyrant, God's Mace, Guillotine. Black Veil even Jean was praised as Ice Wall and everyone looked strong, but why am I Spirit of the Wind? Sevi was so frustrated that he gulped down the cherry juice that had been placed in front of him as if the heat had been turned up. Yes, yes. Julieta immediately filled his empty juice glass with juice. Rober smiled and added a thin layer. Titles, even if it seems like a separate thing, it's not a big deal. There's nothing to be called anyway. I hope so I don't want to be called guillotine, no matter how strong I look or am. Nova muttered somberly. It seemed to be a title created thanks to his slaying of monsters' heads without mercy with an axe, but it seemed strong. To the point that it rivaled my title of tyrant. While the special forces and the black knights were whispering like this, I felt gazes standing in the distance, looking in our direction and whispering. To be precise, it was a gaze toward Jean. The owner of the gazes was none other than the Fabian expedition. Jean still doesn't seem to notice I silently glanced at the people who were whispering and looking at Jean. Then they hurriedly averted their eyes, coughed, and quickly and casually left. I stuck out my tongue and turned my head again. It seems so ironic that Jean has joined the Black Knights and received a title. I took a glance at a corner of the banquet hall where the Fabian expedition was located. I thought Fabian would be crumpling his face and clouding the surrounding atmosphere. But my prediction was wrong. Fabian was nowhere to be found, and Decca's face was rather gloomy. Did he not attend the banquet because he was so bothered by the fact that Jean and the special forces received titles? But something was not right to say that. I beckoned to Sevi. However, how he mistook it, Meyer, who was in the same direction, quickly approached. What? You can't open the bottle. Do you want me to open it for you? Then, before he could even hear my answer, he took the moralizing bottle and immediately pulled the corkscrew. With a gleam, my empty cup was filled to the brim with alcohol. It was not something he had done in a day or two, but his face turned in an all too natural manner. It wasn't as if there were no attendants in the banquet hall to pour the alcohol. Sure enough, the servant, who had unknowingly been taken away from his work, had hardened. It was a moment when everyone in the banquet hall was glancing at Meyer without him knowing. Everyone was startled and astonished by the scene. The Black Knight poured alcohol with his own hands. 
Despite the crowds, the Black Knights seemed calm as if it was nothing. Feeling ashamed for no reason, I retorted to Meyer. Do you think I always drink? You don't. I was really surprised to hear Meyer's words back, and I shut my mouth. There were no words to say when he asked me back like that. Rober grabbed the bottle and blew the trumpet. Is this alcohol suitable for the vice commander's taste? Your Excellency should have raised it up. I drink alcohol as precious as it is and as common as it is, so it's okay no, that's not it. When the other person drank on the other side of the room, I almost unintentionally inertially lifted my glass to moisten my mouth. But now there was something that needed to be resolved first. What? Meyer bowed his back and whispered quietly in my ear at my attitude of stirring alcohol unlike usual. There's something that's a little unpleasant. Sevi. After putting down the glass, I called Sevi exactly this time. Sevi, who was being teased by other troops, rushed to me as soon as my call fell. What's up? Sevi, I'm sorry that this is during the banquet, but I have a favor to ask of you right now. Just tell me anything. Sevi said confidently. He was very dependable, quite different from when he had complained that he was unhappy with his title. No matter how much I whispered in his ear in hushed tones, I did not know how the words would leak out just because we were in the banquet hall. I couldn't tell him to go after Fabian with impunity, so I hinted at the other side that I was constantly struggling with it. Do you remember the person I asked you to do the background check around this time last year? That much hint was enough for Sevi, who had been in the dungeon with me all year round. Sevi, who understood me perfectly, nodded and replied. Of course. Trust me. Sevi left right away. The special unit and the Black Knights, who noticed that I had made Sevi work, made a fuss and turned the attention of those around them to themselves. I also smiled and raised my glass. For the endless glory of the Black Knight. Anyway, you. Meyer chuckled and lightly bumped his glass against my glass. I smiled and finally tipped my glass. My lips moistened and my eyes glistened insistently as I stared at the distorted image of the Fabian expedition through the round glass of the cup. Fabian challenged dungeons again with the support of Countess Nearus. Whatever he wanted to do, raising his level was the first thing to do. Having attacked dungeons with clenched teeth, he was soon able to exceed level 60. However, as if to ridicule Fabian's efforts, June and the special unit easily exceeded level 60. He had to admit the talent of June Carantia in raising expedition members. Fabian gritted his teeth as he looked at the back of the special unit receiving the title, leaving himself behind. But worse than the feeling of being late, however, was the fact that for a moment they felt like the chosen ones in their shining place. Everything he did felt like a futile struggle, a denial of reality. Fabian shook his head. His choice was not wrong. Fabian took advantage of the complicated banquet to meet Countess Nearus. He said that the dice had already been thrown, but there was still a chance to defeat his opponent. He could not give up his hopes of trifling expectations until the dice fell to the floor and revealed their eyes. Countess Nearus. It's Fabian Ignis. At the sudden visit, Countess Nearus shot back at Fabian, not hiding her annoyance. I would have told you not to approach me so noticeably. If you had contacted me first, I wouldn't have come like this either. Have you prepared what I asked for? Are you interrogating me? Countess Nearus snorted dismissively. However, contrary to that attitude, Countess Nearus was also surprised by the growth of the special unit. She thought Fabian was in a hurry when he told her that he would take care of things at this debriefing session, but he couldn't wait much longer. It was fortunate that she had prepared just in case. Countess Nearus replied matter-of-factly, keeping such true feelings under wraps. I never thought you'd doubt my work I've done all the preparation. As long as you don't grab my ankle. Then this will be perfect. Fabian also responded with confidence. Both of them had so much confidence in their own abilities that they distrusted the abilities of others. Fabian thought of Meyer's smile as he looked down on him during the title performance ceremony. Let's see how long the smile will last. You can only smile for this moment. Resentment toward June, jealousy toward Meyer, and feelings of inferiority Fabian gave up forgetting his feelings. 
He only liked the hope of the wretched joy that would bring them down, as only he would be miserable if he had to find out. Chapter, 149 As expected. After the banquet, I clicked my tongue quietly after receiving Sevi's report late at night. Just in case, I asked him to follow Countess Neris, not Fabian, but I found out that the two were meeting. He seemed to know a lot about Tragula it looks like he had quite a bit of information about Countess Neris. It would have been nice if I could hear the conversation, but unfortunately, when Sebi arrived, it was almost the end of the story. Well, should I say I'm glad I can get this much information? Meyer, who heard Sebi's report with me, clicked his tongue as if it was pathetic and leaned against the back of the sofa. He's completely corrupt as an expedition leader to borrow someone else's hand to fill his power. Fabian must have been in a hurry. If it weren't for this time, he would know best that there's no chance. The Demon King battle is now in countdown. After the debriefing, I and the Black Knights would go back into the dungeon and be lost, so now was the only chance to do something about it. He's blatantly shouting to hit us on the back of the head, but being cheated so obviously also hurts my self-esteem. I clicked my tongue and touched my temple with my fingertips. What's wrong? There's one person that keeps bothering me. Among the Fabian expedition members who were whispering while looking at Jean, there was a very familiar person. The guardian of the shield, who seemed to have been welcomed in place of Aegis, that looked somewhat gloomy. The only problem was that I had no recollection of who that person was. Maybe I had run into him in the first round. As I was scratching my head and worrying about it, Meyer asked me about it. Should we do research? I don't think it'll come out easily because he's a human being attached to Fabian, knowing that Countess Neris will take on the Black Knights, but please. As soon as I said that, I had a flash memory that came to mind. It wasn't even an appliance that fixed itself when I called the repairman. I did not know him well. I had only crossed paths with him at the first performance report. It was a brief contact that I don't remember, and it's no wonder I don't remember him. Still, I remember him because of the discomfort I felt at the time. He was filled with dissatisfaction, as if he had not been treated decently, despite the fact that his abilities as a shield seemed to be as oh so. His somewhat gloomy atmosphere was especially uncomfortable to see in his eyes, which were shiny with frustration. He was all the more memorable because he had the opposite of the generally vivacious and cheerful disposition of the shield guardians. I've never attacked a dungeon with him, so I haven't checked the start window, but. It's mainly the behavior of those who hide something. And it's not of their own volition, but half the time by other intentions they want to show what they're capable of, but they can't, so they do it in a roundabout way like that. There was a similar aspect to Whipra, the captain of Spearman Unit, who joined the Black Knights and was the first to be cut off. Don't tell me. When I thought of Whipra, one hypothesis instantly came to mind. If my prediction is correct. The use of that shield was a hidden move by Countess Neris and a means to lower her external reputation. It's a double-edged sword. I mumbled, touching the tip of my chin. If we play our cards right, this time we'll even get Countess Neris involved. Meyer shook his head as if he couldn't understand me. You care about Countess Neris quite a bit. Fabian and her, they're not threatening at all. But we're going to enter the Demon King battle soon. We can't leave them behind and get stabbed in the back then. It's better to get rid of your troubles early. Seven people would enter the dungeon of the Demon King, but that was not the end of the story. Gates to the Demon King dungeon will be opened and gates will be created simultaneously throughout the Empire. If we cannot prevent that, even if we defeat the Demon King, the damage to the Empire will be enormous. So Meyer has been raising other units in addition to the elite one. In the past, I would have thought that Fabian, who was still hailed as a hero at one time, would not be able to withstand his own branch and drive the Empire into danger, but now I think differently. He's the one who tried to kill his childhood friend April, too, so maybe that's true enough. I thought Fabian's re-emergence was like a camel going through the eye of a needle. So at the time I saved April, I did what she asked me not to kill Fabian, and I did. If I had known that Fabian and Countess Neris would hold hands, would have just taken care of him last year. When Fabian acted quietly alone to kill April, it was the right time to deal with him. But now there are many eyes to see in Countess Neris. 
It was all kinds of trouble. But that did not mean that I should try to defeat Countess Nearest first. If I had known this was going to happen, I would have at least left a hole in the law. Meyer clicked his tongue low. The more an expeditionary force member advanced in the dungeon, the greater the difference in force between them and non-expedition members. And the use of force by an expeditionary force member against a non-expedition member outside the dungeon was strictly sanctioned by imperial law. Such a law was passed because Meyer Knox was both the originator and the guardian of that law. Since Meyer, who was the highest level as well as the strongest expedition member at the time, proposed the law first, everyone else had no choice but to follow. I patted the back of Meyer's large hand to comfort him. We needed such a law at that time. Not even exceptions that's why, even though the world was in turmoil in the dungeon, there was little damage to civilians. But it didn't seem to be that great a comfort. Meyer sighed, holding my hand with one hand and his head with the other. Unlike the way he usually solved everything by force of arms, for once he had to get down to anticipate the numbers of his opponents. Meyer added tediously. If you want, we can just ignore it and take care of him. The emperor will have no choice but to overlook it anyway. We can't do that. I shook my head firmly. Meyer's honor should be protected. He rolled in dungeons for almost the entirety of his life to defeat the demon king, and to have the stain of attacking politically for a mere scammer like that I shudder and tremble in horror just thinking about it. Regret was a thing of the past. I was fortunate to have made his acquaintance before it was even too late. They'll approach us first anyway. I don't know how they will open the mouth of the water they'll probably approach either me or Jean. Because Fabian approaches from the side he knows better. It was basic to approach from the side with the least amount of information. Once we knew where to aim, the next step was even easier. We can use that opportunity to counterattack. It was ironic. They went through great lengths to drag us down, even having secret meetings. Do they know that it will end up hanging them by their own necks? I chuckled. At that time, I remembered that Decca's expression was unusually dark at the banquet hall. Yeah. We can't just sit still and wait here. I smiled broadly and spoke vigorously. If we do well I think we can get another hound. Hound. Meyer heard back a beat later. At that moment, his sharp eyes were fuzzy. He seemed to have had an unusual thought during that moment. He's very relaxed because I'm using my brain. I was puffed up, and I raised my eyes and urged him on. You're not concentrating, are you? No, I am concentrating. Meyer shook his head in surprise. I glanced thinly at him. That's not the expression of a concentrated person. Meyer frowned ruefully. What, if you insist so strongly? Seriously. Earlier, I was just. I know, I know. I dismissed Meyer's excuse and turned it over. That wasn't what was important now. What do you mean, you know? You're completely mistaken. Aha. I raised one eyebrow toward Meyer, who kept refuting. Only then did Meyer's backlash subside and shut up. Now that it's quiet, the atmosphere to talk has been created. Only then did I calmly confide in their expected hideous system and plans on how to defend. So. How long has she been in the Black Knights? Jean's reached level 60 already. Is that the girl who was said to join the Black Knights? Because she's young and she's quick. I made eye contact earlier, but she didn't even pretend to know me. Those lent by Countess Nearest and the remaining Fabian expedition members gathered together to make a fuss. Jean used to be their colleague. She was also cherished by April Decca's lips trembled. But in the end, he couldn't say anything. Countess Nearest forces tended to listen only to Fabian's orders, and the existing expedition members would be troubled if he said something and withdrew. Thus, with Decca's tacit approval, the Fabian expedition members strengthened their friendship and unity with each other by pointing the finger at the young Jean as a traitor. Chapter 150 If the tale is long, it will be stepped on, and eventually, they ended up being scowled at by the vice head of the Black Knights. And finally, they kept their mouths shut. But when the banquet was over and they returned to their quarters, the bad-mouthing began again.
Perhaps it touched their self-esteem that they had seen the complexion of a wizard who was only a support wizard, they began to accuse even June along with Jean. She's very proud and full of the black knights on her back. Decca recalled the ideal expedition he had drawn when he formed an expedition with Fabian and April. Now it was completely different from that. Was it okay as it was? As Decca was filled with skepticism, he heard especially clearly the mocking tone of the mumbling voice of the shield guard that Countess Nearest had attached. Soon, she won't be able to even make a sound. What does that mean? Decca quickly dug into it. As if he had made a mistake belatedly, the shield kept his mouth shut. He replied back, clicking his tongue as if he had become annoyed. It's nothing. I made a slip of the tongue. The shield shrugged and shut his mouth. I don't think it's nothing. Tell me in detail. What are you digging for? Phew, I feel like I'm a sinner. The shield laughed and shook. Other troops giggled as if they were mocking Decca. The vice commander's authority had long been in the ground. Decca's pride was hurt, but he deliberately questioned the shield. But there was no information to be gained. He was just convinced that Fabian was definitely up to something strange with Countess Nearest. Come to think of it, things seemed to have taken a strange turn since he had joined hands with Countess Nearest. There was now a whole lot more that Decca did not know, and Fabian was also mingling with the people that Countess Nearest had put on him. It was no wonder that the new influx of people ignored Decca, as they got along with him better than Decca, the vice commander of the group. He tried to talk to Fabian several times about that phenomenon, but Fabian just dismissed it as if he was worried for nothing. What the hell was holding back and what was coming back to its place? Fabian's words were vague like catching a floating cloud. In addition, after coming to the capital, the tendency to exclude Decca became more severe. How did this happen? It had been a long time since the family-like expedition, which was warm and smiling just by sitting together, disappeared. The lounge, where the expedition members were gathered, was no longer comfortable. Decca couldn't stand the stifling air in the break room that constricted his breath, so he quietly walked out. He swept his face, which was awfully dry, as he strode down the hallway in a wide stride without a destination. What was he going to do now? At that moment, someone who had been following Decca hurriedly touched his shoulder. It was an overly intimate approach. Except for Fabian, no one in the capital could act like this to Decca. Decca looked back, frowning between his eyebrows. Who? The other party quickly pulled the black veil over their face. Decca's eyes grew big and wide as he finally saw his opponent, and they warped with a bright smile. Long time no see, Decca. What's going on? April. The melancholy that had been hanging over Decca's face vanished without a shadow of a trace. Decca greeted his longtime friend and hugged her. It was the first time in what seemed like a year. Since they had always been together since childhood, that year apart felt really long. There were so many things he wanted to know about April during that time. Decca asked in a rather high-pitched and lively voice. How in the capital? Are you trying to come back to the expedition? When asked by Decca, who was inflated with anticipation, April only smiled vaguely. Um Decca. I have something to say without anyone knowing. Can I have a moment? Anyone? Without Fabian knowing? To be exact, it's a story that shouldn't fall into Fabian's ears. When Fabian's name came out, an indescribable contempt and hostility came to April's face. What in the world what happened the day you left? Decca asked, perplexed. The memory of that day was as vivid as if it were yesterday. Fabian said he had seen off April well. At the same time, Fabian's words that he had a quarrel with another expedition on his way back came to Decca's mind. With the thought of no way, Decca looked at April with a firm face. April was still awkward and ambiguous, with a rigid smile somewhere. April asked once again. So do you have time, Decca? Unlike last year, when I only avoided people, I actively contacted other expeditions at this performance briefing session and embraced the surroundings. The gist of the question was which region they would like to see taken care of when the Demon King Gate was opened. Many points were frustrating because we could not reveal the fact that the Battle of the Demon King was at hand. So, in the end, I had to ask and negotiate with them, 
but since Meyer, the leader of the group, would not have been able to appear in person, I, the vice leader, had no choice but to do so. In retrospect, it's all for peace in the world where we're going to live. Moreover, I was a better negotiator than Meyer. Still, it was quite rewarding to see a significant decrease in the number of people who were actively engaged in the process, as was the case last year. I don't know if it's because I'm now over level 60 and they're afraid to push as hard as they used to, or if it's because I was so effective last year in spreading the rumor that I was in a relationship with Axion. I'm not sure which one it was, but it was certainly welcome that the troublesome thing had disappeared. Do you have to do this? Nova, who had followed me as an escort, asked curiously. I explained roughly what would happen if the Demon King Gate was opened and what we needed to do, but he still did not seem to understand. There's no need for the vice commander to match it this much. But that's pretty cheap. I replied with a laugh as if nothing had happened. If it had been a truly outrageous request, I would have run over and said, go to Meyer now and say it again, but he, too, kept straight and narrow in his own way. And there was something to check while facing them like this. Check. Who has what kind of dream something like that? Do you do mind reading, too? Nova was surprised and asked back. I had no choice but to laugh a little louder than before. Mind reading is that? There's just something I can see. There was no need to see exactly what they were thinking. It was enough to figure out if there was any connection with Countess Nearest. And that goal had been fully achieved. There were about three expeditions that were ascertained to have joined forces with Countess Nearest, out of the ten ranked expeditions. However, they may have been completely encompassed, and they too seemed to be in a state of liver watching. Who would want to confront the Black Knights openly? I smirked. Still, as there was enough possibility to shake the back of my head, I could not completely entrust them with the defense. They should be placed where they are relatively unimportant and cannot act halfway. Perhaps they should be kept far apart so that they cannot gather and conspire with each other. In this way, I was immersed in the expeditionary team layout at the time the Demon King Gate was opened, and at the moment I was passing through the corridor to get to my lodgings, someone suddenly shouted my name. June. There are not many people who could suddenly call my name. Moreover, if the other person was a middle-aged woman. I furrowed my brow at the unpleasant prospect and looked ominously behind me. Sure enough, I saw some not-so-pleasant people. How did you guys get here? I can't believe you're calling us you. We're your parents. My stepmother screamed. The evil way she screamed remained the same as she had been at the time she had hammered me alone in the dungeon. My father also stood behind my stepmother. He pretended to be all by himself, classy in his position, one step back, as usual. Do you know how embarrassing it was for us to leave the village like that? We have never raised you as a child who neglects her parents. I don't think you've ever raised me properly in the first place. As soon as I clicked my tongue, my stepmother shouted, reaching out to my hand. Your brother Eugene is quite sick. That child hangs around sick and cries to see you. Yet you are going to shun us so coldly. My stepmother's hand never reached me. It was because Nova beat back her hand. It was a very quick assessment of the situation, perhaps thanks to the precedent of Julieta's parents. Nova stood firm against them. Don't approach the vice commander. The faces of my stepmother and father contorted when Nova blocked them. Immediately they yelled out loudly. You disrespect your parents this much just because you became a Black Knights member. I was confused by their unexpected appearances, but my head slowly sank coldly. And as a result of calmly examining them, I was able to grasp the hidden innermost thoughts under their atrocities before long. They appeared to act brazenly, but somehow they seemed impatient and desperate. It was as if they were being threatened. Chapter, 151 Come to think of it, how did mere villagers get into the capital and the imperial castle for that matter? Surely someone must have influenced them there are only a limited number of people who could do such a thing. You're going to come out like this. In the first round, my stepmother and father were clingy when I joined Fabian's expedition, and after making my name known as a warrior, they even came to the base. 
so there was no way Fabian could have known about them Countess Nerissa's power must have played a role in bringing them into the capital and using them in this way. It seems that she planned to use my parents to pull me out. I had no idea that Fabian and Countess Nerys would form a party and end up making several rounds of expeditions. I guessed that there would be some more sinister and vicious souls, but I had no idea that they would use such means. I should say that I am fortunate because it is easier to defend against than to use Jean. I clicked my tongue low. Anyway, it was strange. How dare they shove these parents in my face. I didn't even care because they weren't even worth being used like that in the first place. Well if it was me in the first round that Fabian already knew, maybe. In the first round, it was my first time in this world in many ways, and as I was not familiar with the fact that I was possessed, there were many things that I was puzzled about. Typical was concerning parents. At the time, I did not know that my parents would be so terrible to June, and I was more inclined to think that I should have some degree of decorum, first of all, because they were the parents of the body I possessed. So, wanting to get a good result, I behaved somewhat indecisively, and that was the defeat that pushed their relationship with me to the worst. But I learned enough about them to be disgusted and completely unsympathetic. For the sake of the original June, I could not see these people carrying the name June on their backs. But it all came in the second round and I was renewed in my resolve. Fabian seemed to think he had only ever seen me at my wit's end and warily for my parents, so it would work for me if he used them. I did not respond as well as my stepmother would have liked and she bit her lower lip. Perhaps she would have thought that raising her voice in front of strangers and accusing me would have made me come in with my head down to appease them in the face of others. But I was a human being who could be quite brazen in that kind of gaze. The degree to which people pointed back at me was nothing. Before, she would have tried to pull my hair out, but now I was a 60-level expeditionary member. No matter how much I said my stats were trash, there was a big difference between an average person and someone at level 60. I pretended not to notice and said in frustration. If it's something you need money for, don't go off on a tangent for no reason. How can you say that when Eugene misses you on his sickbed as his older sister? Eugene followed you so well. They squeezed tears that weren't there. I don't know what Countess Nearest paid for, but they even seemed to be acting their best. I said it as if I couldn't win. The expedition team is busy right now, so I can't go back to my hometown. We have a sense of shame, too. Would you like to come back to your hometown knowing that we're in trouble? We just came up to the capital together to help Eugene recover from his illness. You can go to the inn right now and at least show your face. Okay. If you tell me the location of the inn, I'll visit him later. You're not going to come after saying that, right? Poor Eugene is probably waiting only for you. It drives people to be very trashy. Whether I smile outright or not, they quickly grab me by the sleeve to achieve their goal of taking me away anyway. Eugene's condition is urgent. Hurry up and follow me. I don't think I can go on if I have to be deceived by being so obvious. Of course, the reason I can peek into their true feelings this way may be because I cannot have any feelings at all for them and hate them. Even Nova, the raw man next to me, was half deceived by their words, because he was so warily trying to figure out what to do and what my mood was. Certainly, if I had thought that my biological parents were still blood-related, I might not have been able to see them across the river disrespectfully as I did now. If I was the original June I would never have been able to let the story of my young brother being sick go unheard. Therefore, it was even more vicious. What a way to take advantage of people's goodwill and good hearts. I hid my heart, properly, and pretended not to win. Ha okay. We can go now. Nova. Go back to the dorm first. I'll be right back. But I'll be in trouble, Vice Commander. His Excellency told me that the Vice Commander should not be working alone in individual activities. Nova was perplexed and dissuaded me. I stared at Nova and said clearly. Special situations can't be helped. It was only after hearing the code that Nova opened his eyes wide as if he had already realized it. He was also far from a good actor. I glanced sideways to see if my stepmother and father noticed. Fortunately, they seemed nervous and didn't notice anything about him. I continued to speak naturally. 
what's the big deal? I'm going to see my family. Besides, it doesn't take long because it's in the capital. Then all right. Nova was also insinuating. As things went as they planned, the corners of the mouth of the stepmother and father were excited. I pretended not to know. Take the lead. Why yes. Things were going better than they expected, so they deserved to be suspicious for once, but they only hurriedly moved on. I glanced at Nova and followed them. If you want to catch a tiger, you have to go into the tiger's den. I stepped forward without hesitation. They escaped from the rough castle and entered a secluded alley past a nobleman's mansion. All the while, it was worth taunting me with absurd words, but they kept quiet and silent until they reached their destination, as if they didn't want me to be offended and leave. What they had in front of them was a quiet vacant lot. They found a place like this. I looked around and asked calmly. So, where's the inn? My stepmother and father gave no answer with a frightening stiff face. At that time, a group of people came out from behind us and surrounded me from a distance. The captain of the group who appeared through people was Fabian. I wasn't surprised because it was exactly what I expected. My stepmother leaned flat in front of Fabian and said with her head bowed. As you said, I brought June here. So, my son. I wondered what he had raised as a price for what they did over there, and it seemed that he had captured and threatened the life of Eugene. What would happen to me after being dragged away like that should not have been their consideration. In the end, June was not a child to them. I chuckled. The emotion that had been there otherwise was completely gone this time around. Fabian said it as if my stepmother's and father's plaintive cries were bothersome. Take them. Fearing Fabian's words would fall, others tied up my stepmother and father. Saw save me. We did everything we were told to do. Please. So our son, is our son okay? They shouted frantically, but Fabian ignored their words, smiling and listening irritably. How does it feel to be betrayed by your family? What do you mean? It doesn't matter. Are you bluffing even in this situation? Is this the only thing you do? You're not a villain, you're just a third-rate thug, Fabian. I burst into laughter and looked around at the people around me. Some were members of the Fabian expedition, others were not. I didn't see any Decca. I shrugged with room to spare. Aren't you gathering too many to catch one wizard? I'd think you were fighting the Demon King. You're not just a supporting wizard, but you're the vice head of the Black Knights, Tyrant. We have to be polite to greet you. A spearman replied cheerfully. It was a woman in my memory. I spoke nicely. It hasn't been that long since I've seen you, but it's nice to meet you here. She was the head of one of the expeditions I visited in the last few days. I don't think the Black Knights made a very bad offer. In the end, the Black Knights share the leftovers. People may want to eat more. Aha, you're greedy. Why? Were you promised that he'd give you a seat at the Grand Duke's table? Did you fall for that kind of nonsense? At my words, the spearman's face turned red. It seemed to be the essence. I laughed out loud and gradually moved my eyes to the side. What? Why are there so many familiar faces? I smiled when I found another one. Out of the three spies Countess Nearest planted, it was the spy that infiltrated the Yellow Lightning Unit. Her eyes were blue, as if she resented me for the amount of insults I had inflicted on her and kicked her out. Whether she did or not, her resentment was only ridiculous to me. The fault was hers, so why pretend to be sorry? I clicked my tongue and shook my head. To bring the double swordsman do you have no intention of hiding that you joined hands with Countess Nearest, or did you not think of it because you were stupid? That much, I was guessing because it would come out roughly if you collected the information you knew. But you probably don't even know what I prepared holding hands with the Countess. Fabian then smiled with a significant smile. I grumbled at the disgusting appearance of being elated. You're very confident. On the subject of a thug. So far, he had maintained composure against any sarcastic words, but Fabian couldn't hold back and was unbearably indignant because the word thug was quite painful. Fabian looked a little red-faced and threatened. Be careful with what you say. What do you trust in this situation? 
Meyer knocks. I've confirmed again and again that there's no one after you. It seems that people were planted and monitored in the middle. I clicked my tongue and twisted my mouth. How thorough. If it were the commander, he would come after me right away even if he was a little late. Is it okay to hold on to the tail like this? Don't worry. It won't take that long. I guess I look easy. As soon as I finished speaking, I immediately activated Fulger's pumpkin. Scorpion lightning. A glistening bolt of lightning in the air fell piercingly toward Fabian and the other incorrigibles. With a rippling roar, a cloud of dust blocked my view. Chapter 152 Gradually the cloud of dust subsided. My blurred vision gradually opened and I was soon in contact with a towering earthen wall. The pile of dirt that had blocked the scorpion lightning quickly scattered and collapsed. A woman with brown hair stretched out her hand over the crumbling dirt. It's normal brown hair, so I wasn't aware of it. I quietly clicked my tongue. I didn't know you'd bring an earth property wizard. I thought you might have Fulger's pumpkin. I'm well aware of the dangers of lightning magic. The electric system was at odds with the earth attribute. Fulger's pumpkin could be considered useless. Holy devotion could only be used on the same party member. It wasn't that I thought I could completely subdue them. Because there were more than thirty opponents. I also know how to objectively see the situation. I laughed sarcastically. You're amazing, Crimson Prosecutor. Don't call me that. Fabian, enraged, shouted. He was more furious than when he was called a thug, and his eyes were filled with anger and frustration at not being called a warrior. Whether he thought he was too expressive, Fabian belatedly straightened his face. Raising his lips, he pretended to be relaxed. No matter how great you are as a supportive wizard, you are only a supportive wizard after all. So, you brought these people to kill me, a supportive wizard? Isn't it such a waste of manpower? Me? You? Why would I kill such a talented person? Fabian shook his head curiously. I hated the way his red hair fluttered and scattered along with the leaning pass. I thought about it, but I think the Black Knights would collapse without you. Fabian said so and reached out to me. I'll give you another chance, June. Not the Black Knight, but an opportunity to follow me. What? I thought I heard it wrong at first. Or perhaps it was a mockery. The expression of giving me a chance was as if it was very beneficial. Why do I have to follow him now? I snorted and asked. If I refuse? Even if your parents and younger brother die? And no. The stepmother and father, who were held by their group, screamed. Only then did my father look at me and beg urgently. June. I understand that you can resent us. But your brother what is your grudge against that poor little boy? They were desperate as if they would hang on to my feet right away if their arms were not bound. But the desperate cry just passed by my ear. You took the wrong hostages. I continued without even looking at my parents. I don't care if they die or not. How can you do that, June? How can you be so spiteful? As soon as I finished talking, my stepmother screamed with a seizure. She opened her mouth to criticize me, but her father next to her was a step faster. My father tried hard to stimulate my guilt and gain sympathy. You pretend to be calm, but I know very well that you are, in fact, deeply compassionate. I know that you just said that because you are angry think about it again. Hmm. It's not a bad suggestion. That's right. Your life is not in danger and he appreciates your abilities. Unable to hold back a little, my stepmother cried out. Misery flashed across my father's face as he looked at his stepmother, who was not only useless, but adding fuel to the fire. I stared at them with dry eyes. My gaze didn't even pass by very long. Realizing that the weight of my heart in my gaze was as light as a feather, my father rushed to speak back. You still haven't forgiven us, June. Forgiveness? I burst into laughter quietly. Then I smiled at them and said. I can forgive you for deceiving me this time. Hope was about to rise to their faces. I poured cold water on the rising hope without hesitation. But I can't forgive you for pushing me into a dungeon. 
I can forgive them for trying to screw me over. But the matter of pushing me into a flying dungeon. If I had not been possessed, if I had been unlucky, June would have died. It was not for me to forgive. It was the role of June. My father, who didn't even notice that someone possessed his daughter's body, made an unreasonable excuse to persuade me somehow. T that would bring you to the attention of the Black Knight, so it can't be all bad. Hmm. Please. I don't have to listen to them anymore. This is enough time to take time. I asked Fabian, facing his head again. Wasn't it easy to bring my family? Is there anything difficult about it? They're just village bumpkins. But in one way or another, they're the parents of the vice captain of the Black Knights. They might be used in this way, but did you think Meyer Knox would just leave them alone? Of course, he would attach people to them. Fabian's brow wrinkled, my head would get complicated as to why I would bring this up. I chuckled and shook my head. But I dissuaded him. They're not even worth using for me, so don't waste time or money. That's why you were able to easily bring those humans. So what you did was a waste of time and a waste of money. I said, and the color of my stepmother's and father's faces turned pale. It was as if they finally admitted that I was not going to save them. Fabian didn't want to believe that I had guessed everything, so he deliberately asked back with a nonchalant look on his face. If you did that in the first place, why didn't you not follow them? Isn't it proof that you're being swayed by them? I was curious. Of who was such an idiot? Curiosity has got you by the scruff of the neck. It's good that you're not afraid, but that indulgence will catch you off guard one day. You're the one who should stop being so arrogant that I'll hold your hand. You threw something away when you didn't want it, and you're still clinging to it after all this time. I sneakily know, I couldn't scratch Fabian's insides openly, so I dug up the hook. I had to bring up all the information Fabian had. Soon after, Fabian, who ran out of patience, gritted his teeth and flashed his eyes. I made a final offer to you, June. His self-esteem seemed to be bruised. I inwardly exclaimed with pleasure, but outwardly feigned unconcern. It was the most difficult double act I had ever done. So. Are you going to kill me now? No. You're useful. Fabian tingled his finger as soon as he finished talking. Then a man who had fallen behind stepped forward. It was the gloomy shield I had been paying attention to. The shield shouted a magic starter at me. Shackles of the mind. Kut. I felt a stabbing in my brain. I wobbled and caught my head. I was on my knees on the floor, scratching my head and writhing in pain. Fabian came up to me, half-conscious, and murmured. I was definitely going to guarantee your freedom and will. You're the one who refused. I clenched my teeth and tried to open my eyes straight, shooting at Fabian. A brainwashing mental wizard. Yeah. Countess Nearest has quite a wide network. I didn't know she'd really hide a mental wizard. Fabian smiled with his eyes bent as if he were having fun. Mental wizards were not as welcome as support wizards. However, there are significant differences. Support wizards are ignored, and mental wizards are feared because of the intense means by which they can harm others. Brainwashing, confusion, enchantment. Compared to other wizards, the social impact was greater when they made a bad decision. Moreover, as they used mind-related magic, the magic was colorless. The color of their hair did not change. That is why mind wizards were strictly registered and controlled in the Empire. It was a capital offense for a mind wizard to conceal his or her true identity. Of course, being a mind wizard did not mean that anyone could use brainwashing magic. Because if they could have brainwashed anyone in the first place, they would have brainwashed the Emperor and Meyer Knox right at the time they brainwashed me. Brainwashing was used properly only against those who had lower magic defense than their magic attack power. The Emperor had the blood of a hero and had a higher magic defense himself, and Meyer, well. He was a monster. Even with such conditions, there was much they did not like about them to take them easily to a dungeon attack, which was even just sensitive and cautious. It was the same now. There was a secret look of disgust on the faces of those who looked at the shield. 
Anyway, after being treated like that, it wasn't easy for mind wizards to raise their level, and so they were all on the low side of the magic sky. On the other hand, the shield in front of me was. I see he's reached roughly the 50th level. If he's a mental wizard, I don't think anyone would have let him in on the dungeon crawl. It looks like he fooled his way around the dungeon with his shield. Considering that his talent as a shield appeared to be decent, Countess Nearest must have put a lot of effort into secretly raising him to this level. A mental wizard approaching the 50th level. He leveled up with a shield, so his magical attack power shouldn't be that high, but the basic magic coming from his level was formidable. Chapter, 153 I could not see his exact level or stats because that mental wizard posing as a shield was not a member of my party. However, at this point, my dungeon experience was roughly felt. I scoffed as I looked up at the shield's turn in a struggle. I guess Countess Nearest lent you a mental wizard. It seems that Fabian trusts you very much. Your mouth is still vivid, so I don't think it's brainwashing is her magic defense stat low. Even though she's a support wizard, I'm a little nervous because she's over 60 levels. The shield, no, the mental wizard, still held his head and clicked his tongue quietly at me, who was only suffering. Whether he remembered exactly my stats in the first round, Fabian firmly dismissed the anxiety of the shield. I know her stats better than anyone else. Mental magic is not affected by artifacts. That's right, but if it doesn't work out, only the Countess and I will be able to catch the candy, won't we? The shield shrugged. He pretended to be calm, but Fabian also urged him as if he was nervous about the shield's words. Just in case, one more time. It's useless. This was enough. I stood up and muttered quietly. I'm not who you know anymore. The brainwashing magic had long since been used. All the pretense of suffering was merely an act. Fabian frowned between his eyebrows that I had not been brainwashed and snickered involuntarily. He seemed to think I was doing my best to resist. Bluffing. Levels are effort, but stats are human talents. It doesn't change even if you die. But when I looked back in time, it changed a bit. I replied jokingly. There was no way that Fabian did not know that this was the second round and that stat points had taken over to some extent perhaps he was just saying that to beat me to the punch. At most, a support type wizard, if stats were taken over. Fabian responded sharply, cutting back sarcastically. You don't think I would have considered that? It should also be within the scope of consideration. Well I don't think so. I shrugged. I was sorry to see him being so stubborn about not deviating from his own expectations. How did someone who at one time I had no doubt was the hero of this world become like this? In every way I saw him now, he was a despicable scoundrel, nothing more, nothing less. I felt a sense of turbulence that I was the trigger for that. I spoke plainly. Then, as you said, try brainwashing magic one more time. Damn it brainwash one more time. Shackles of the mind. The mental wizard clenched his teeth and tried the magic again. But no matter how many times he tried, it was meaningless. It was no use if he couldn't break through my magic defense in the first place. One more time. I also understood Fabian's reluctance to be so sure about my stats. In fact, if it was my magic defense stat, I would have been brainwashed already even if I was considering the added stats as it became the second round but the reason why the brainwashing didn't work. It was because I, who had a vague grasp of the existence of mental wizards, ate the dragon's pearl and put the stats on it just in case. But I really didn't know he'd bring a mental wizard. It was worth eating with tears in my eyes. Fabian did not even know the existence of the dragon's pearl. So there would be no place to guess at all, and it was a set step to be so confused. It was within some expected range that he chose me, not Jean. Among those in a position that could cause confusion within the Black Knights group, I had the lowest stats. Even the direct physical attackers, Rober and Nova, have higher stats than I do. They wouldn't have thought about Jean. The more prepared I was for all of this, the more I stared into his inner thoughts, the more I honestly moved as Fabian intended, to round him up. Dealing with Fabian was rather easy. The problem was Countess Nearest. 
To minimize her influence, we had to take on a weakness that she could not get out of. It was that mental wizard that bloomed in my eyes at that time. Because of the precedent set by Wipra, I recognized immediately that he was a wizard with blinders on in other job groups. And even if Countess Neris had not joined hands with Fabian from the beginning, she would have held his hand but would not have given him a mere gifted person as a shield. I never knew the experience with Wipras could be so useful. It was so much more than I had experienced in my life and I felt like there was nothing bad about it. It's a big sin to cover up a mental wizard the relationship between that wizard and Countess Neris will come out when dug up. At my words, the mental wizard came out pale and looked alternately at Fabian. It seemed that there was indeed much to worry about. The good days for both you and Countess Neris are already over. You didn't have a good time in your life, right? I'm sorry. Don't be arrogant. I tried to brainwash you because I thought you might be helpful. If it only interferes, then. Fabian drew his sword as he said this. His injured left arm appeared to be free as if the injury had healed over the past year. Looking at the blue-black sword blade, I suppressed the thought, will you stab me too? With the sword that had pierced April. It was too soon to explode here. And Fabian was not the only one who had finished his business. The presence of a mental wizard was also revealed, and the time was extended long enough I realized that the time had come, and I said with a laugh. Do you think I really came here alone? As soon as he couldn't speak, Fabian stared at my stepmother and father. My stepmother and father shook their heads desperately with faces covered with tears and runny noses. No. I am sure she came alone. There was no sign at all that she was even aware of her surroundings. Please believe me. That's right, Fabian. She didn't have time to do anything. There was no one chasing her. One of Fabian's flock interjected. He seems to be the one he put on watch after my stepmother and father. I see. There must have been a lot of uncertainty in entrusting everything to them, as ordinary people, because they could change their minds or make mistakes. It's a trick to take time. Things went wrong, so let's take care of things quickly. There's nothing good about dragging it out. The mental wizard urged Fabian as if anxious. He deserved to be nervous because his identity was revealed. I added as if it were a pity. It's too late. At that moment, a gust of wind came from somewhere. The eyebrows of Fabian's gang furrowed at once in the calm weather. All of a sudden, the wind. Blade of the wind. Nice timing, a cheerful starting word came from the sky. Soon, a gust of wind attacked people like a sharp whip. Gasp. W wind magic. All the eyes of those who were torn by the wind headed to the sky. A little boy, Sevi, was looking down at us from the sky, fluttering his green hair. People pointed their fingers at Sevi and shouted. The spirit of the wind. Ah, I don't want to be treated like a real spirit. Sevi stepped into the air from the sky, hopping and grumbling. Then he shouted somewhere. I found the vice commander. As soon as his words fell, a scream was heard from the alleyway we walked in. Damn, what power is this? Kuak. Get out. With a loud shout, people who were blocking the narrow alley flew in the air one by one. Those who flew from the sky in such a way fell to the ground one after another as if hail was falling and vomited blood. It was Julieta who appeared among the dark alley dripping with blood. Her eyes sparkling in the darkness and her mace that knew no mercy were enough to scare Fabian's gang around me. Out in the clearing, Julieta swung her mace wide and said gracefully among Fabian's gang. I'm here to pick you up, Vice Commander. Good timing. I chuckled. The scorpion strike I used was to attack Fabian's group, but from the beginning, it was a signal to call in the Black Knights. Nova would have told the story well, and it would not be long before Sevi would find me in the capital. So I had plenty of time to spare like this. Damn it, come here. Kut. Fabian, who was late to grasp the situation, quickly grabbed me. He was going to use me as a hostage to get out of this place, but it was meaningless. At the moment Fabian grabbed my hand and pulled me with him, something huge fell next to us. Boom. 
It was as if a meteorite had fallen and caved in a crater. The earth was shaking and there was a cloud of dust. Then, a black knight raised his body from among it. His golden eyes, full of chaos, were so bright that they could not be concealed even through the dust. His eyes, tinged with madness, blazed like the scorching sun. How dare you try to hurt June? A deep anger as if it were ringing from the bottom of a deep canyon. Meyer was the embodiment of a berserker itself. Chapter, 154 Meyer was angry as if I had been stabbed by Fabian. Oh, my! He made me use sacred devotion every day just in case something like this happened he should know better than myself that I don't have a single blemish. I, with a body as fragile as mung bean jelly, did not come into Fabian's scheme without thinking. And Meyer wouldn't have sent me in the first place. Ack! The moment Fabian put his strength into my hand, Meyer swung his sword at him. I did not apply any attribute transformation, so he did not use any magic power on the sword, but Fabian shuddered from the sword pressure alone. Fabian just barely escaped, but Meyer's sword tip pursued him relentlessly. Meyer's sword rushed in as if it had to break Fabian's arm, holding my hand. Damn it! Eventually, Fabian gave up on me. Releasing my hand, Fabian quickly spread the distance and gritted his teeth. Still, he was quick, as he had once been a hero. There was a great commotion as people mingled and tried to flee. Amid the scattered chaos, Meyer made sure I was safe first. Are you all right, June? His eyes were filled with anxiety as he took my arm and looked around. But what was important now was not my safety. I shouted to the special forces, pointing to the mental wizard, who was trying to sneak away in the chaotic gap. That brown-haired shield must be taken care of. Yes. The special unit that had captured Fabian's flock followed the very same mental wizard. Before that, the twin swordsman, who at one time belonged to the Black Knight's Yellow Lightning unit but was kicked out last year due to a unit reorganization, stood in their way. Damn it! Rookies! Know your honor! Nova, who was with me at the time she was kicked out, recognized her and shouted. While Nova was dealing with the twin swordsman, Julieta shot forward like a ballista. Cook! The tip of Julieta's mace pushed back the mental wizard, who was running away as it were. He was no match for Julieta, even though he too had raised his level as a shield. Like an insect specimen on a fixed pin, the mental wizard could not move except to flap his arms and legs miserably. The twin swordsman was also subdued by Nova. Nova clucked his tongue, wiping her blood from his chin. It's harder to catch them alive than I thought. The demons are much easier to kill. Julieta calmly responded by dragging the back of the mental wizard. In case he said anything, the mental wizard's mouth remained blocked. Thanks to the advance notice to capture them alive, everyone's hands and feet were in sync. I looked at them sitting one by one and said to my satisfaction. They'll be our precious witnesses. You can't kill them in advance. This time, as it happened in the capital, only a small number of people were brought in. In the case of Axion, his magical destructive power was too strong and wide, so he was excluded. Jean and Anasta are intertwined with Fabian, so they are excluded in consideration of possible variables. I asked Rober to escort Jean and Anasta. In fact, as most of Fabian's gang couldn't or barely cross the wall, it could only be handled with the trio and Meyer. I saw Meyer still weaving between them and chasing Fabian. Fabian put plenty of magic into his sword, only to be hit by Meyer's sword, which had no magic at all. Each time their swords clashed, a wave of magic power changed the air around them. The old walls of the neighborhood began to crumble little by little as the air hummed. It was fortunate that this was a deserted area. While Fabian was frantically running away, Meyer had as much time to spare as a hound hunting down a rabbit. Sevi, who was dealing with the remaining Fabian gang, admired the sight. It still doesn't seem that he is not without the ability to run away so far against the commander. Although he said so with his mouth, inwardly he was not happy to admit that Fabian's ability was better than his own. Well, he may look like that now, but he was once a hero. It seems that the ability he gained by confronting the Demon King had not rusted. In addition, it seems that his level is quite high I don't think he's in the early 60s. 
Although he was pushed back, he would have been at least mid to late 60 levels if he had hit Meyer a few times. It wasn't this much a year ago as the expedition collapsed, did he monopolize the experience by himself? There was a possibility in its own way. He's at the level of the other crew, and if he brainwashed me and brought me in, I thought he could raise himself enough before the Demon King gate opened. Shit. Even though he raised his level like that, he wasn't good enough to be Meyer's opponent. Meyer's sword raked through him. Fabian's injuries gradually increased. Being on the defensive, he clenched his teeth. There was a sense of inferiority and defeat on his face. Then the sky suddenly darkened. Everyone stopped due to the sudden solar eclipse in the middle of the day. Solar eclipse? No, I can feel the energy. The magic of a dungeon. How is that magic here? All those who were mixed up looked up at the sky and murmured. All these people here have been rolling in dungeons all their lives. More familiar with dark, damp, and murky magic than the clear air of the world. There was no way that they wouldn't recognize magi. Crows chirped noisily. The sky was packed with birds as if they were fleeing somewhere to avoid some evil creature. I know this phenomenon. I've seen it once. This was the sign of the opening of the Demon King Gate. Time flies so fast. I sighed low. Months earlier than I had expected. Maya was also flustered by the fact that his encounter with the Demon Lord was earlier than he expected, but his gaze was stolen for a moment toward the anxious sky. And that moment was enough to create an opportunity for Fabian to escape. Ah! As soon as I shouted, Meyer swung his sword at Fabian. But Fabian had already torn the movement scroll. A swarm of light from the movement scroll wound around Fabian. Fabian's blue eyes glowed with obsession and anger as he bled and disappeared. Meyer's sword disrupted Fabian's afterimage. Fabian vanished without a trace, and all that remained was a magical haze of the movement scroll. Meyer gritted his teeth and sighed. Movement scroll. I didn't expect him to have ancient artifacts. The movement scrolls are a relic from a thousand years ago, and there is no one who can make them now. They are disposable, so they wear out fast, and I thought they were a phantom item and that the remaining scrolls had also run out. It seems that Countess Nearest had one. There was enough possibility as she was a person like a mallet. But it was surprising that she gave it to Fabian. I clucked my tongue. Countess Nearest must have been very anxious and she took out all the cards she had hidden. I let my guard down. I shouldn't have pushed him like that, I should have killed him with a single stroke. What a foolish thing to do. Meyer clasped his head in agony. A shadow cast over his regretful face. I added, putting my hand on Meyer's arm. It's the same with me to be careless. Because I was also watching as I spectated. I didn't think it was necessary to go as far as to use attribute conversion therefore, since Meyer could not use his magical powers, it wasn't just Meyer's fault. There was no time to think about losing Fabian here. I quickly raised the mood. But don't worry too much about Fabian, for he has unleashed his hounds. In this case, the first thing to do is to prepare for the battle of the Demon King. I'm not sure how active the hounds will be I swallowed my anxiety. I have a lot of work to do. At times like this, I had to empty my head. Meyer immediately nodded in agreement. Well, then I'll go to the Imperial Palace first, tell the Emperor about this, and call up the Black Knights and the expedition leaders. Please do. Fortunately, there was still time to spare for the Demon King's gate to fully open. The last troops had to be maintained until the demons flew out. Since most of the Black Knights' elite were now at the Imperial Palace, as well as the rest of the expeditionary force, it was at least a relief that opinions could be passed on quickly. Maya went ahead to the Imperial Palace and we captured the rest of them except Fabian. The mental wizard, the core cause of the felony, was trembling. Even if he wanted to kill himself, he couldn't do anything about it. While the waiting Imperial soldiers were transporting the sinners one by one, Nova asked, looking around. Um, Vice Commander, what should we do with your family? Taking advantage of the commotion, they fled, hiding in a quiet corner between the collapsed walls, shaking. Nova's voice was filled with frustration as he clearly saw next to me that they were not very good parents. 
I glanced at them. I saw a momentary glimmer of hope in their eyes, but they just looked pale to me. I answered smoothly. We must deal with them in accordance with imperial law. Chapter, 155 June, June Even if it wasn't, the world is still a complicated place we don't want any accidents to happen, so put them in jail for now. June I'm sorry. I made a mistake. They cried desperately as they were being dragged away. They say they're sorry, but they don't know what they're sorry about and what they've done wrong. I added to Nova. Apparently they took my brother and used him to blackmail them. Shall we interrogate them? I'd appreciate it if you could. Of course. Nova smiled. It was a bright smile, the exact opposite of the way he had cruelly agonized over them earlier. I ruffled Nova's auburn hair as I spoke to the trio of the special unit. Now let's be diligent because the Second Holy Demon War is about to begin. Upon entering the Imperial Palace, I immediately turned on the party member status window to check the status, level, skills, etc. Of all Black Knight's personnel. Then I fell into trouble. The special unit was the second of the so-called elite units, and still lacked the level of the elite. However, the problem was that the difference was not large. It was enough to be covered by leveling up in the Demon King dungeon. They were all equally talented, and their skills were unique, so there was a great deal of choice. I and Meyer are unconditionally one set, but I am wondering how to fill the remaining five. Then Anastic came to visit me. What? You're going to fall out of the Demon King battle? Yes. I know that I am short of Priest August, but I still thought that the Vice Commander might be distressed. Anasta's complexion was slender as she said this. She looked very distressed mentally when she heard that Fabian had tried to use my family to brainwash me. She was in a dilemma, wondering if her choices had driven Fabian this way. I said repeatedly that it was different, but Anasta's guilt was too deep to let it go at that. I'm not sure how focused I'd be in a dungeon. If I defeat the Demon King, I can become a Grand Duke, which is a tremendous position I'm not sure I'm allowed to enjoy that honor. You believe me, and I'm sorry to show you that I'm vulnerable in this way, caught up in an old causal relationship. No. I murmured with regret. Anasta said with a grin, as she tried to pull the corners of her mouth. If there are other positions available that you need, I will do my best. I couldn't catch it when she said that to tell the truth I felt more at ease because Anasta said so. Yes. The Demon King's gate will be opened and the demons will come out to the Empire. Take care of this place while I'm inside the Demon King's castle. Yes. I don't know how much you can trust my will after my weak words earlier, but even if I should die, I will endeavor to ensure that demons do not harm people. Don't die. Anasta nodded, smiling more powerfully than ever. So Anasta left and the healer was fixed with August. With Anasta gone, Jean also became difficult to take with us. All that was left now was how to choose four people between the wizard attackers Axion and Sevi, the physical attackers Dragula, and the defenders Nova, Julieta, and Rober. While I was having so much trouble, the surroundings turned serious. The cooperation of the other expeditions, the interrogation of the Fabian group. Meyer denounced the other expeditions. He instantly resolved the chaos that could have led to a riot. It seemed that, because of the situation, he used means that were closer, more convenient, and quicker than words and law. The effect was, of course, outstanding. Nova, who had tracked down Eugene's whereabouts through interrogation, immediately rescued him. He did not bring him to me, however, but only made a report to me. There are signs of fear and beating, but there are no signs of illness. What should I do? Nova, speaking about Eugene, seemed sad and pouty, out of his usual state. Especially considering that Eugene was a twelve-year-old child. I asked back in wonder. But he's my little brother, so I thought I'd take one look at his face for the first time in a while he hasn't been seriously hurt, has he? Indeed, even if he was seriously injured, there are so many healers in the Imperial City. Although my stepmother and father were somewhat shameless, the young Eugene was just used. I didn't mean to ask Eugene to pay the price. But Nova hesitated for a long time and asked again. Do you really need to see him? 
Oh I was complacent. Looking at Nova's reaction, I got the hang of it. After I joined the Black Knights, my stepmother and father would have repeatedly cursed me. It's been two years. Long enough for my brother, who was cocky with his sister, to turn against her. When I clicked my tongue, Nova smiled bitterly and tried to joke in a bright voice. I had high hopes because you said he looked like your brother, but there was no resemblance to you at all. I never said that we looked alike. I said I remembered him. I replied with a chuckle. It seemed like yesterday when I met Nova two years ago in the first round. You didn't just say something snide in a roundabout way because you didn't like me, did you? Ha, huh, that could have been the case. I laughed out loud at Nova's plausible change of air. In the meantime, I decided to send Eugene to Nocantoria Castle. I added an approximate explanation of the situation to Vince the butler. As long as he was well monitored, he could use him as a stable keeper or as a gardener assistant. This is not a bad choice, at least for Eugene, because meals will be served on time and he will be safe. If he didn't come to his senses when I came out and defeated the demon lord. I was not going to raise a reckless brother in my name, so I was going to take special measures then. I hope Eugene understands that this is the last time I will give him a chance. I clicked my tongue low. Countess Neris, the big mother, was brought in. She continued to plead her innocence. However, no one would listen to her words because of the critical situation just before the opening of the Demon King Gate. Even if they did, her liver was not big enough to defend against the crime of kidnapping and trying to brainwash the vice commander of the Black Knights and even hiding a mental wizard in the Imperial Palace where the Black Knights had gathered. The Fabian expedition was also brought in. They remained at the Imperial Palace, unaware of Fabian's ulterior motives. They were flustered by the commander's failure to return and his sudden imprisonment. On the day before Countess Neris's trial, Tragula barely made it to the Imperial Palace. While the results debriefing was being held, he seemed to have come in a hurry after hearing the news that the Demon King Gate had been opened as soon as he left after closing the dungeon. Countess Neris. Tragula's face hardened at the unexpected news. Soon he smiled bitterly. She deserves it. I was surprised to hear that. Tragula looked confused and delicate when he heard that Countess Nearest trial was tomorrow. Even though I thought it was fortunate that he arrived early, it was a day full of emotions that he should have arrived after everything was over. I outlined with a sigh. As for Countess Nearest, I think she intended to use Fabian since it was related to the mental wizard and also because the other leader, Fabian, escaped, she has to be held responsible for everything. I'm not sure if the mental wizard is quite loyal or not, he's always been quiet, but in the end, it's hard for him to survive. The family itself may be destroyed. Tragula's complexion grew darker than before. He opened his lips as if he had something to say. I asked in wonder. Is there a problem? No. Tragula shook his head. I grinned at his pointless attitude, patted him on the shoulder, and stood up. Then you should rest for a while, as it must have been hard work getting to the capital. Because once the gates start opening from now on, you won't have a bit of time to rest. Vice Commander where are you going? To open the loyal dog's mouth. That way I'll know what he's got in his mouth. I said so and shrugged my shoulders. I didn't mean to go out myself, but I couldn't help it because the mental wizard held out quite longer than I thought. Did he have guts, is he deeply loyal? or does he just not open his mouth I will have to get answers before the trial. So I left Tragula and headed for the underground prison where the mental wizard was locked up. The underground prison was gloomy and dreary. The chill of the walls seeped into my skin as if I had entered a dungeon. The prison guards immediately brought in a wizard from the spiritual world. He was wearing a magic restraint, and his appearance was unbearable to behold. The Inquisitor seemed to be in a hurry to get information, as tomorrow was the day of Count Nell's trial. Thrown in front of me, he made a distressed sound. I asked the usual questions to ascertain his identity. Hedekalinia. A mental wizard who's posing as a shield keeper. Am I right? Hedeka did not even reply. I thought maybe he couldn't. I clicked my tongue. I don't have time. Then I clapped my hands. The interrogation room door opened in August, 
as I had called him, entered, his large body crumpled into a big frame. Even in the dark, his white priest's uniform shone brightly, but his hard smile and large size were intimidating. I said with a grin. I think I'll try to be more effective. Chapter, 156 As soon as I concluded my words, August used his divine power. A piercing light filled the dimly lit prison, which was barely illuminated by a few candles, and it was immediately quiet. The messed up Petica was restored to the way he had been before his capture when he had looked down at me triumphantly beside Fabian. But the situation was the opposite. I looked down at him and said. Why don't you be honest and confide in me about your relationship with Countess Nearus? I will die anyway. He answered bluntly. Even after all this time, he was still insubordinate, and I felt that my patience had run out. You're going to die anyway. What are you talking about? Death is a matter of course. I burst into laughter. What carefree thing is he talking about now? I clucked and kept talking. Our summer saint, as long as his life is tidily attached to him, you can make him okay, right? Didn't he cleanly fix him, who was actually on the verge of dying? I spoke in hushed tones as if I had gone rogue. To die peacefully, like lying in bed with your hands on your chest, or to live with both eyes open and feeling the flesh of your entire body gaping open rawly I really don't know which one Mr. Mental Wizard will choose. Was it blatantly expected to unfold in front of him? Hedica's complexion turned pale. Along with the interrogations he has undergone so far, the wizard's peculiar imagination would further fuel his fear. Perhaps because of the horror, he had been dribbling tears from the start. But Petica shook his head to the end. I can't betray her. That's strange. I didn't think you were such a loyal type. I mumbled, stroking my chin. A look of frustration crossed Petica's face. Whether it was because of my assessment that he did not look loyal, or whether it was because he was not loyal to Countess Nearest that he kept his mouth shut, it was not particularly compartmentalized. It's not that there's nothing I can guess. I looked back at August and asked. There may be some brainwashing spells at stake, so release him. Do you mean brainwashing magic? Isn't this a mental wizard? Yes, but if the conditions are right, he can brainwash himself. August clicked his tongue softly as if he hadn't thought of it, and used clean mental power to remove mental magic. Ugh. Hedica grabbed his head. If it weren't for the magic of the mental system, there would have been no reaction it seemed that my prediction was right. Immediately Pedica gasped for air and suddenly crawled to me and shouted, holding my legs together. Save me. I'll say anything. The interrogator stuck in the back was surprised by the 180 degree change in Pedica's appearance. It was natural that he would be confused when someone who had never opened his mouth, despite rigorous questioning, would suddenly be like that. Hmm how did you come to cast brainwashing magic? I could guess from the situation, but I needed to find out a little more precisely. Hedica confided honestly with his head bowed. When my level was low, Countess Nearest had me brainwash myself. If I raise my level, I'll hit the back of my head so that I don't betray her that's why I couldn't say anything, I didn't mean to deceive the vice commander. Said Pedica, and his head clenched on the floor. Vice commander, please do me a favor I will do anything. From the looks of it, it seems that he can open up honestly about his relationship with Countess Nearest what do you think? Asked the interrogator cautiously. I stared at Pedica. The Pedica I have seen was so gloomy and inferior that he was jealous of young Jean. I would never want such a person anywhere near me. But there may be a lot of good things to use him for. Especially after defeating the Demon King. Having made up my mind, I quietly cut him off. As long as you've hidden yourself from being a mental wizard, you'll end up dead. Even hanging is a luxury. Hanging was a moderate pillar of the death penalty. Hedica dropped his head when he heard my story. He asked me to help him, but he seemed to guess that he had no choice. I said to him. But what if I could save you? Sister June. August hastily dissuaded me. It was clear that I would be forced to put a time bomb next to me. On the other hand, Pedica looked up at me blankly, as if he had heard the voice of St. Marianne from the sky. He asked in a trembling voice. Can I really live? 
Opportunities always come with conditions. Contrary to Petika's desperation, I reluctantly continued in a relaxed voice. So make your choice. Either die with free will or be my loyal dog after Countess Nearest. He needed to brainwash himself to show his loyalty to me, as he did to Countess Nearest. Because no one would try to save Petika if I didn't hold the reins so tight. Especially ordinary nobles without magical powers. It was Petika who knew better than anyone the fear, contempt, and hatred of those around him for mental wizards. And immediately Petika replied with a sneer. Better the Grand Duke's dog than the Count's dog. August and the interrogator were taken aback by this attitude, which was not painstaking, and I laughed muffled as if I thought it was so. Preparations were completed to deal with those who rose like mold before entering the Demon King battle. This was clean-up time. It was the day of the trial of Countess Nearest. Countess Nearest's eyes flashed defiantly as she was brought before the stern presiding judge. She was not a guilty person until the outcome of the trial. So there was no great torture, I suppose. That didn't mean she was treated like an aristocrat, and her dust-free ceremonial dress, which she always wore with authority, remained wrinkled and soiled. At first, she gained momentum. What crime, your majesty, am I guilty of sponsoring gifted expeditionaries for your country? This is a conspiracy to frame me and the nearest family by someone who is jealous of us. But it has been discovered that you secretly hid and raised a mental wizard. That's ridiculous. Despite the emperor's stern words, Countess Nearest shouted at the top of his voice. Her wincing and trembling appearance were truly like that of an innocent victim. But I heard there was a witness. Pardon. A sense of unease flashed across Countess Nearest's face as if she had not expected it. Her face hardened as she looked back to see if anything had been spilled. Witness, step forward. It was Petika who appeared on the witness stand. As soon as she saw Petika, she had a small smile on her lips. However, as soon as Petika's mouth was thin, the smile was shattered. Don't deny it, Countess Nearus. Have I not used my abilities to the fullest in return for your material and moral support? You. Countess Nearus was about to point, but she stopped. Realizing that the brainwashing magic had been lifted, she clenched her teeth and shouted. What mouth does a con man have to speak? Don't tell me you don't know me. I was taken to the lake when you met Marquis Condicio face to face in the spice-related business. You, 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 you. The shield. Marquis Condicio, who had been staring at him in awe, pointed his finger in surprise at the spark that fell on his feet. That's right. Then I suddenly thought it strange that I had stamped a business contract in favor of Countess Nearest. I feel like I've seen him when I'm talking to Countess Nearus about business no way. There was growing frustration among the nobles. Countess Nearus's face turned pale. The expedition was a money-losing hippo. No matter how wealthy Nearus was, how could she support so many expedition members? She could not easily use his mental-based magic on the expedition members because of the possibility of being grabbed by the tail, but she used it little by little on the nobles to open the door to money for herself. Countess Nearest continued to defend herself, but the axis of judgment had already tipped. Perhaps relieved by the prohibition, Countess Nearest let Petika do quite a lot of illegal things. The charges spread to every corner of this court. She lashed out in anger at Petika. Do you think you can live just because you let everything out that you know? You're like a dog that doesn't even know how to thank me. Despite Countess Nearest's criticism, Petika remained calm. Countess Nearest, who had been making a long meaningless accusation, turned her anger. Fabian. Where is Fabian Ignis? It's all about his ulterior motives, your majesty. He deceived me. Nevertheless, it is a felony to conceal a mental wizard and use them for private matters, Countess Nearest. It is indeed the crime of concealing a mental wizard. The charge of abduction of the vice commander of the Black Knights has not even been taken up yet. The Emperor's cold words tore down Countess Nearest. Falling down, her face on the floor was filled with emptiness and injustice. But there was something strange about Countess Nearest's manner. I was missing a step through the trial, and I couldn't resist my curiosity and stepped in and asked. Isn't it you, Countess Nearest, 
who gave Fabian the movement scroll. I don't understand how you could have given him the means to escape, and yet search for his whereabouts. Scroll. What are you talking about? Even if there was such a thing, it wouldn't be given to him. What's the point of him running away by himself? Chapter 157 Countess Neris exclaimed as she looked at me fearlessly. For the first time, I remembered that the movement scrolls were dropped from dungeons. In the worst cases, the location of the drop was random. It's not the game system that lets you out of the battle, and it's ridiculous that it's an item, and the odds of even getting it are horrendous. The players vented their exasperation, stating that they could feel the production team's earnest desire to somehow increase the difficulty of the game. So much so that I could not easily imagine a movement scroll, since I had no intention of getting it in the first place. It was an item that I had never seen before even pulling out my nose in the first and second rounds. I sighed and clicked my tongue. After all, he is the protagonist. He's lucky, too. He just happened to get it. Anyway, Countess Nearest answered my question, so my business was done. I took a step back and nodded. The witness had come forward, and Countess Nearest had also made an appearance of acknowledgement, so what more could be asked? Soon Countess Nearest was sentenced. The scheduled death penalty. However, I was able to prevent the destruction of the Nearest family except those involved in this case, because I defended that it was a great loss ahead of the Battle of the Demon King if all of them were named in that way. You pity them. Countess Nearest shouted angrily, but I ignored her gasps without hearing her. Countess Nearest went wild. But it was useless. She was held by my guards and forced to be taken to prison. On the way to be dragged out of the court, her eyes met those of Tragula, who had come to stand trial. Countess Nearest's lips twisted. As if she had given up everything, she burst into laughter and cried out to Tragula. Are you feeling better, Tragula? It must be cool. The miserable downfall of the person who was holding your leash. The presiding judge became quiet as if she had poured cold water. Only then did those who remembered that Tragula was Countess Nearest's adopted son began to murmur. I thought Countess Nearest had adopted Tragula only to support the possible expeditionary members from what Countess Nearest is saying, it seems that there is a deep connection between them. No matter how much the relationship was broken, Countess Nearest rebelled against the Black Knights will the Black Knight forgive Tragula. Tragula listened calmly to her abusive language and speculation of the people around her, staring at Countess Nearest in silence. In the noisy situation of the presiding judge, the guards rushed to cover her mouth. But Tragula held up a hand to restrain them. Countess Nearest could have exposed his shameful part, but he did not seem to care at all. Countess Nearest snickered and accused Tragula of such a thing. You sold your pride for your family's long-cherished desire. One hundred years. For the long-cherished desire of one hundred years. Then she immediately bent at the waist and started laughing. Unable to see her, the king's guard dragged her out of the courthouse. We are a thousand years. A thousand years. Countess Nearest laughed like a madman and walked away. The unidentified persistent malice swirled alone for a long time, then disappeared faintly without swallowing anything. Countess Nearest was taken away, and now it was Petica's turn. The emperor looked at Petica in the witness box and said. Now I will proceed with the trial of the mental wizard. I would like to make one more request to the emperor. I had already made a request once in connection with the life of Countess Nearest. When I stepped forward again, a look of wonder came over the Emperor's face. What is it? Tell me, Vice Commander June Carantia. The Emperor tried to accommodate me only because I was the victim in this matter. There must be a sense of Meyer, who is sitting in the corner of the presiding judge. He was reluctant to mention my title, but he had no choice but to refer to me as Vice Commander June Carantia. It was an awkwardly distancing designation, considering that others often refer to me by titles at times, but I am 100% sympathetic to the sentiment of not wanting to call me a tyrant. Perhaps he must have felt some inner relief at the fact that he did not have to have my title conferring ceremony. I passed on the dilemma of the emperor's title, pretending to be unaware of it. I have put a leash on Petica, I beg your pardon for his judgment. Leash. He, too, was a victim of brainwashing magic, 
driven by the adulterous intentions of Countess Nearest. However, I put a prohibition on him just because the possibility of disrupting society with mental-based magic makes people uneasy. What kind of prohibition is it? Now he can't use mental magic unless it's my command. As soon as I dropped my words, the presiding judge once again made a fuss. Several nobles whispered in secret, then one rose to his feet and stood up. It was Marquis Condicio, who had once been brainwashed by Countess Neris. That means that Vice Commander June Carantia may use mental magic to brainwash others. It's dangerous. Why would I? I asked back in wonder. I asked too calmly, and Marquis Condicio was at a loss for words. I personally counted the possibilities one by one. The Black Knights don't work with brainwashing. Therefore, it is not possible to use the mental wizard for political purposes within the Black Knights. Only expedition members and non-expedition members, who are at the most at a very low level, can be brainwashed. What am I going to do by brainwashing them? That's. When asked so openly, Marquis Condicio murmured his words. The battle of the Demon King is right under our noses and the addition of power will now be on the move. Once the Demon King battle is over, Meyer will be Emperor and I will be Grand Duke. My office and power alone should solve most of the problems, so is there anything to gain by thinking carefully about low-level people or non-expedition members? I asked jokingly. Are you afraid I'll brainwash all the handsome men of the Empire and get them to listen to me? That's ridiculous. Meyer, who had been fulfilling his duty only by attending, cried hastily with a white face. Even if he was in a hurry, he would have been less urgent and desperate than that. Meyer's loud cry caused everyone in the courtroom to stare at him in dismay. The Emperor was so startled that he slipped on the throne for a moment. Oh, really? Don't make it obvious like this. I tried to suppress my desire to cover my face with my palm in misery. In any case, I had to deal with this situation. Well, I can't do what I want to do because His Excellency says it's ridiculous. If you have any other concerns, please let me know. I looked around. They were speechless by Meyer's spirit, and they said nothing. It's an opportunity. I looked back at the Emperor and urged him. I understand that there is no particular matter. Your Majesty, then please. Do as you wish. The Emperor nodded vaguely. The same was true of the pardon Pedica, who was distracted. He had a foolish look on his face, and it was Meyer who had a more foolish look on his face. Meyer frowned and showed his displeasure regardless of the atmosphere around him. There was no way that the Emperor near Meyer could not feel the strange atmosphere. The Emperor, under silent pressure, cried hastily. This is the end of this trial. Bang, bang, bang. The trial was closed with the sound of the judge's clear gavel. In any case, the purpose was achieved by pardoning Pedica in a slippery way like jumping through a hole in a wall. I smiled with satisfaction. Wait, June. When the court was declared closed, I tried to disappear among the people leaving the courthouse as if on the ebb tide, but Meyer, who had approached me at some point, held me back. Let's talk a little. Even among the bottleneck phenomena that pinched in, there was no miracle of Moses behind the path that Meyer took. I sighed low as I wondered how he had caught up. If I caught up with him again like this. I could feel the glancing gazes around me. It could not be an illusion that the stagnation of the fluid population around me was intentional. I couldn't stay here like this forever and refuse Meyer's proposal, so I nodded. H.M. all right. It was obvious what we were going to talk about anyway. However, even after he took me to his drawing room, he hesitated for a while and his mouth trembled. I felt frustrated by his reluctance to speak, and, unable to resist, I said one word to him. Don't write a novel in your head, just say it. I won't be offended. You didn't really save that mental wizard for that purpose, did you? I knew this would happen. I opened up about Meyer's specific intentions that he tried not to say. What purpose? Gathering handsome guys and making them listen to me? It was just a joke, but Meyer's face turned red. He looked as if he would faint if I were with another man in the future. I added with a smirk. Then I wouldn't have to keep the mental wizard alive. 
if I come out after defeating the demon king, they will stand before me without having to brainwash them. Meyer's face suddenly became serious. Chapter, 158 My story sounded pretty reasonable. He let out a depressed groan as if he was struggling with what to do. Oh, look at him believing me again. I was looking forward to seeing Meyer's joy and sorrow at my every word, but I didn't want to disturb his concentration with this kind of thing before the Demon King battle. I patted Meyer on the back of his big hand and said firmly. I won't do it. I won't do it. I'm not going to let them make a fuss about it. I'm too busy just raising my big dog. Dog? Since when did you have a dog? Asked Meyer, jumping. His eyes were filled with wonder. No matter how much I looked at it, he didn't seem to understand my joke. It was embarrassing to say with my mouth that I called him a dog. Feeling awkward, I changed the subject. There is such a thing. Have you been raising it secretly? Secretly from me? Why? For what? Oh, seriously. Even though I pardoned the mental wizard, I had no intention of letting him join the Black Knights. For whom should I leave alone to get a spoon of rice? Even the guy who tried to overturn the rice by kicking it. Since he was only separate personnel to clean up after me, I had planned to leave him unattached and make him my private enlisted after we came out of the Battle of the Demon King. However, since there was no specific place for him, I decided to place him first in the dormitory of the Black Knights. I was worried about what would happen if Petika made any futile attempts, such as wandering around here and there, being overbearing. Or trying to act like a know-it-all to the Black Knights, but he remained locked up in his room and didn't move. He seems to have a grasp of the subject matter. Perhaps as everyone in the Imperial Palace learned that he was a mental wizard, he could not withstand the unpleasant glances of the people around him. The trial was shortly followed by the execution of Countess Nerus. Although it was scheduled, the taste was not refreshing. Just then Tragula came to visit me. Perhaps he had returned from seeing Countess Nerus off at the end, but a faint scent of blood permeated him. Thank you for leaving the house of Nerus. He gave me a thank you message. The day before the trial of Countess Nerus, Tragula, who had been agonizing for a long time, asked me to make sure that she was the only one responsible for the sins of Nerus. To be honest, I did not have much against Countess Nerus. If he wanted Countess Nerus' life to be left, but to leave the family behind, it was at least a request that I was willing to listen to in order to gain Tragula's trust. So I asked the Emperor to leave the house of Nerus alone. But there was something I did not understand. Well, it wasn't a big deal. It's just Tragula, I thought you would want to destroy Countess Nerus completely. Is that so? Tragula smiled bitterly. Why don't you at least get back the Golden Falcon? It looks like it is now owned by her successor, Optatio. Given her sin, perhaps he would be honest enough to return it to you. Optatio has it. Tragula opened his eyes wide as if he had not expected it. I shrugged my shoulders and delivered the information I knew. At this performance report meeting, you might have guessed that things might go wrong it seems that all the important artifacts have been transferred to the successor. For a moment, Tragula shook his head low. That's enough of the Golden Falcon. It looks like it's already out of my hands. He looked somewhat refreshed. It's a waste. Why? After all, the heir won't be able to use the Golden Falcon. It said that the bloodline of the other heavenly palaces held by Countess Nerus was younger but do you really need to bury it there? Moreover, the successor was young. Everyone was watching Nerus like a wildcat, with only the young successors remaining, and it was doubtful how long Optatio, now the owner of the Golden Falcon, would be able to protect that treasure. At that time, something popped into my mind. The bloodline of the heavenly palace, as Tragula said, is in his early teens. And Optatio, the heir to Countess Nerus, was ten years old. The blood of the heavenly palace. Yes. Optatio is he's my son. Said Tragula, nodding his head. I asked back in perplexment. But Optatio is the heir to Countess Nerus. Countess Nerus has your son as her successor. Because he is also a child of Countess Nerus. Tragula made a shocking statement with a calm face. I stared at him blankly, not knowing how to react to his shocking confession. 
At that time, I was desperate enough to give her the lineage of the heavenly palace maybe, at the time I made that choice, I didn't deserve the golden falcon. His voice died down. His eyes, with his eyelashes hanging down, became dim as if they were reminiscent of the child. The vice commander might want me to have the golden falcon. But I am more pleased with the slightest possibility that the child may defeat a demon that threatens his life than I am with the golden falcon to kill a thousand demons to save the world from danger. His face was filled with a contradictory feeling of remorse and relief. I couldn't find any words to say to the man, so I just stayed silent. Tragula smiled and looked at me. So I'm just afraid of the golden falcon the vice commander may think I'm being foolish. How many people can be wise when it comes to the past? I think each person has a different way of getting refreshed. If you chose that way, it would be the best we could choose. I comforted Tragula. Of course, I don't know how comforting my words would be. Are you going to reveal the facts to Optatio and have him enroll in Cornu? He grew up to be near us. He'll find out anyway, but he'll be confused right away for now, I am a traitor to his mother. But you're going to take care of him from behind, aren't you? Instead of answering, Tragula smiled quietly. Tragula held and unfolded his hand. It was a gesture that seemed to reflect on the weight and shape of the golden falcon he had always held. However it is foolish to give up strategic cards in pursuit of individual stubbornness in this situation. Having given up the golden falcon out of greed, I am not yet qualified to be a hero. I give up on the last seven. Tragula. You may not have considered it in the first place. As soon as I was about to dissuade him, Tragula added with a laugh. It was a joke, but it felt sharp, like a stab in one corner of my chest. I shook my head in a hurry. No, you're an excellent archer. I've been thinking about it. It's good news while I'm listening to it. Said Tragula, looking out the window of the drawing room. The sky, filled with a magical atmosphere, was so dim that it was hard to tell whether it was night or day. He looked out the window and mumbled something to himself. I'm glad there are people in the Black Knights who are better than I am. And seven heroes are not the only ones who can save the world. I will try to protect this world in my place. After finishing his speech, Tragula smiled broadly and reached out to me. I held his hand firmly together. Trust needed no more words. Fabian, who had escaped by using the movement scroll, staggered through the forest. A knife wound throbbed and stabbed him. It was luck that he had gotten the scroll. An item he happened to get in a dungeon that was no big deal. While going around the other dungeon, which was not in the first round, he looked forward to it, but the movement scroll was all he got at first. Fabian moved to a hideout built in the woods around the capital. The place where the Demon King Gate was to be opened was near the capital, so he had built it just in case, but he had no idea it would be used so much. The hiding place was a place that June did not know and was created after the last performance report meeting. Since there were very few acquaintances, the information would not be leaked easily. It was a safe space. And in the safe house, there was holy water just in case. Fabian headed to the safe house. When Fabian arrived at the safe house, he was greeted by Decca from the safe house. Fabian. Decca. Fabian was facetious and welcomed Decca with open arms. Perhaps the capital captured the Fabian expedition he never told Decca about the plan to brainwash June, so he didn't expect Decca to get out. Indeed, Decca was an archer. It should not have been difficult for him to get out of the imperial palace, just because he was quick and swift. Hope sprouted in Fabian's heart at the unexpected strength. Yes. With Decca, the possibility of recovery was a little greater. It was not over yet. Fabian leaned against the approaching Decca and hurriedly said. You're just in time. First, pick out the supplies that I have cooked. Fabian's abdomen burned in a circle. Muscles ripped and nerves felt like they were burning. It was painful enough to swallow the pain of his limb torn by a sword. There was a knife picking at his abdomen. Fabian's hand held on to Decca. Fabian shouted, staring at Decca with his bloodshot eyes wide open. Decca, you. Fabian's face was twisted and full of betrayal. On the other hand, Decca's complexion did not change much from before he stabbed Fabian. 
Deka asked quietly. Why did you do that? You cook, are you crazy? What are you doing? Why did you want to kill April? Chapter, 159 Deka's eyes glistened heterogeneously at Fabian's eyes. Deka recalled a conversation with April at the Imperial Palace. Even though he was so angry, April only smiled. A smile that seemed to dissipate as soon as it happened, a shadow of its once powerful appearance gone. And yet, the gentleness with which she worried about Deka. How hurt April must have felt to know that she was about to die at the hands of a man she had no doubt was her childhood friend. How betrayed she must have felt. As for April, it was only natural to regard Decca as a group like Fabian. However, she visited Decca and deliberately let him know the truth she must have been worried about Decca. However, he worried only about Fabian, without knowing anything about her so far. Decca's eyes were turned upside down by the terrible betrayal that this fact gave him, and with a sense of sorry for April. I've always thought it was strange. You didn't want to see April again. Decca spoke in a low voice. Decca's hand trembled as the blade pierced Fabian's abdomen. Fabian stared at Decca, covered in blood. His eyes burned hot as if on fire. How could Decca know about April? He certainly took care of her he stabbed her and buried her in the ground. Fabian's mind was in turmoil. The blood with the blade that pierced his abdomen pooled at the bottom before he knew it. Fabian, who seemed to be really dying at this rate, urgently begged Decca. D. Decca please listen to me. But Fabian's request only ignited his anger. Decca cried in a rage. Is it painful? Does it hurt? Do you now know how painful it must have been for April? Your cook. As soon as Decca criticized Fabian for a moment, Fabian's eyes changed, and in an instant, he pulled out the dagger behind his back and cut Decca's neck. It was a quick and precise procedure, unlike an injured person. PSSH, blood gushed from Decca's throat like a fountain. Decca stammered and tried to stop the blood, but his efforts were futile. Ha, ha. Decca laughed in despair. When he thought about it, it was a foregone conclusion that he would be caught off guard at such close range against Fabian, a prosecutor. Did I not see this coming? No, he would have known as April had warned him, there was no way that Fabian, who had tried to kill her, would not kill him just because it was him. And yet. He had hope. Thinking about the memories of you and me, I expected that you wouldn't be able to point a blade at me. I really saw through your gut. Decca's lips twitched at his own stupidity. How did this happen? Decca turned to the cold, numb face of Fabian, who was staring at him nonchalantly beneath the red pouring streaks of blood, and sneered to himself. April. You saw the same thing I did. The malice lurking in the heart of a best friend masquerading as a hero. What I have been protecting, what I have believed in, was not goodness. A flash passed by. All their friendships and memories of the twenty years they had spent together ever since they were young children when they began to have memories of walking together were shattered. At the end of his own scheduled life, Decca cursed Fabian with a gasping laugh and his last ounce of energy. You you are no longer a hero. Someone like you cannot be a hero. Someone as corrupt as you are. Finally, with those words, Decca was broken down. Decca's body, which had collapsed, poured out the rest of the blood, and there was no movement. Fabian brushed past the figure of Decca lying on the ground and pulled out the blade firmly tucked into his abdomen. Cook. Fortunately, it was not poisoned. Then he could fully recover with holy water in his hiding place. I can't just collapse like this, I can't just. Murmuring, Fabian waddled toward the hideout at hand. When he entered the hiding place in such a manner, all that welcomed him were the broken holy water bottles. Fabian rushed to find something, but every single thing soaked into the floor. Fabian trembled with anger and denial of reality, and he immediately turned his anger toward those he believed to be the originator of this disaster. Decca. However, Decca was already dead, so he could not hold him and reprimand him for his sins. Perhaps it was his mistake in believing in Decca. He should have realized that there was no one person he could trust. Even though April betrayed me, it was my mistake to get my hopes up for Decca. Everyone abandoned me. Why? No. 
All of this, all of this was because someone had distorted and warped their rapport. June Carantia. Fabian clenched his teeth. Still, there was still energy left to move more. If so. Fabian limped out of the safe house. A shadow hung especially long behind him as he stepped with each step, with the determination and persistence to crawl if his limbs would not move. Didn't you find Fabian? Seeing that it is difficult to find even with Sevi's ability, it seems that he has escaped from the capital. At least he doesn't seem to be in the capital. It's too tight to search the suburbs outside the capital, isn't it? That's the way it is well, it looks like he's given up on the Demon King battle. There's nothing he can actually do. I don't think he'll give up so easily. I stroke my chin. The movement scrolls disappeared once you used them, making it that much harder to come back if you ran off to a faraway place. Now that the Demon King gate is open, will Fabian honestly give up the opportunity? But he had lost everything, and it was surely near impossible for him to rise again. No matter what he did, he could not do it alone. But after the Demon King battle, it would be very difficult if he tried to take a chance to kill you. After the Demon King battle is over, I will put a large bounty on his head and track him down. Meyer clicked his tongue in frustration. He seemed horrified at the mere thought that I might be in danger. I felt the same way about dealing with Fabian. There was no need to keep the latter alive for long. First of all, though, it was important to come back alive in the battle against the Demon King no, it was more important that we had to decide on the last seven. With Tragula declining, the long-distance dealers were fixed at Axion and the Sevi. The only thing left was the tanker. The problem with Rober, Julieta, and Nova was that all three had their own strengths, and all three were comparably good tankers. Julieta was relatively small and lacked defense, but she could play the role of melee dealer because of her ability to heal independently and her inherently strong offensive ability. Moreover, she could hold her own for quite a long time because her somewhat lacking defense could be adequately covered by her own heals. The stats were uniformly good for Nova, who had improved his ability much more than the first round. He was particularly good at the skill of drawing monster aggro, which would have been useful to get to the Demon King and deal with the finer demons, even though aggro was not as necessary in the Demon King battle. Rober, above all, with the diversity of experience and proficiency cultivated over the years was outstanding. She was the most tanker-like person, if I thought about it, with superb defensive skills, living up to her title of Oak Citadel. How can I choose two of them? This was the last, and biggest challenge for me. It was really hard for me to decide this on my own. I asked for Meyer's opinion, but he also only clicked his tongue. In the midst of all this trouble, Rober brought Julieta and Nova to me. What's going on? I'm trying to ease our vice commander's anxiety. Oh did you read my mind? I smiled awkwardly. It was a disqualification for the vice commander to let a member of their unit visit them first. The fact that the roster hasn't been announced yet, even though it's almost finalized, is probably due to our shields. So we tried to be reasonable about it. Rober shrugged lightly. Then she pushed Nova and Julieta, who were standing behind her, forward and said. Take Nova and Julieta. Rober. I cried out in surprise at the unexpected remark. Nova and Julieta also looked at Rober with curious eyes to see if she could really do this. But Rober was calm. I thought about it too. I know because I tried to teach Julieta and Nova. Their abilities are almost the same as mine, and I dare say that the only advantages I have are experience and firmness. She knew exactly what I was thinking. While I was at a loss for words, Nova and Julieta hurriedly dissuaded Rober. But we still have a lot to learn from you, Rober. That's right. We're still lacking. A great warrior does not lie in their ability. Rober was firm. You guys will soon overtake me. There was a strong, unbroken sincerity in her words. Rober comforted the children's shoulders and looked at me and said. Usually an experienced shield man takes the helm in the dungeon, but in the last unit, June will take it anyway. The commander is here, too, but yes. I'll carry it by all means. Then there is no reason to choose me. Rober persuaded me again and again. She also seemed to have thought a lot about herself. 
Unfortunately, I am the only one of the three leading the core unit. So it would be much more efficient if I led the lead unit outside to deal with the demons. Oh, did I just utter the word efficiency? Oh dear. June has rubbed off on me. Then she chuckled. She pretended as if nothing had happened, but she couldn't really be alright. I asked anxiously. Are you okay? We'll treat our skills and hard work equally, but still, these are the last seven. They'll be praised as heroes in the future it's a position like that. Well, I'm not one to care about personal prosperity. Of course, I am not here only for world peace. I am here because the restoration of my tribe rests on my shoulders. Rober's gaze drifted away, as if reminiscent of her own tribe, which she had left behind. She was from the Oak tribe, a minority tribe remaining in the empire. But my tribe doesn't isn't like that. It's actually very small. So, I don't need the honor of the last seven. It's enough to guarantee the autonomy of my tribe. Our vice commander June won't say anything less than that, will she? Well, of course. I said, at Rober's awkward smile. No matter how much she says it's natural, she may be nervous, but to willingly trust me with the future of her tribe I was thrilled to feel how much Rober trusted me. Julietta then suddenly raised her hand, and made a shocking remark. I don't particularly care for my parents, nor do I have any attachment to the Klawa family name. I will be the adopted daughter of Rober, and I will play in the Demon King's castle with the surname of Castrum. Chapter 160 As much as no one expected such words to come out, everyone looked at Julieta with their mouths open. Perhaps a little shy of everyone's attention, Julieta continued calmly with a slightly recalled face. If I become a hero of the seven and receive the position of Grand Duchess, I can establish a duchy. Then the Oak tribe will have an autonomy that will never collapse. Rober, who came to her senses belatedly, jumped up and stopped Julieta. You don't have to do that, Julieta. It's enough for the vice commander to take care of me. I know, but I want to do that. Julieta also seemed to have spoken impulsively at first. However, as she spoke, she gradually became determined, and her eyes alternating between me and Rober shone clearly with a firm belief. The vice commander found me a new life, and Rober trained me. If I have someone to repay, it's two people. I was choked up over my neck. I didn't expect Julieta to think so. I shook my head and tried to speak calmly. All because you were so talented, Julieta. You've earned your life. But it was a talent that would have been buried forever if the vice commander had not taken it out. Julieta giggled. Then she spoke lightly as if she were playing a joke on Rober. I'll be loyal to the vice commander for the rest of my life, so Rober will be full of this. Rober must have been moved, so her eyes were filled. She turned away, raising her head obliquely to the sky, perhaps ashamed that she had shown tears. What's this? I feel like I've become a devoted parent. You're actually going to be a mother, aren't you? Congratulations, Rober. I clapped my hands and made fun of Rober. She stuck out her tongue and shook her head. I didn't expect to have such a big daughter at this age I thought I would be over forty if I had a child. Rober put her hand on her waist, breathed heavily, and exhaled. Then, with her big hands, she clasped Julieta's shoulders and shouted in a determined voice. I'll take you seriously like my daughter, Julieta. Yes. Julieta's eyes were filled with tears. Julieta bent her tearful eyes and smiled brightly. Nova, who had witnessed all of this with us, also added, sniffling emotionally. I'll treat the vice commander and Rober like my parents and be a good son forever. Are you kidding me? Pardon? Nova tilted his head in puzzlement. He's serious, isn't he? I shook my head, holding my forehead in my palm. Good son, good son. It became meaningless to tease Rober while congratulating her. Rober chuckled at the sight of my disgusted appearance. Then she suddenly cleared her face, looked at Nova and Julieta with serious faces, and said. I think the decisive moment is more effective because the two of you breathe better together than I do. The vice commander isn't choosing you guys just because I declined. It's because your abilities are genuine. Do you understand? Yes. 
Nova and Julieta's determined will was echoed. The initial awkwardness they showed when they first joined the Black Knights and were assigned to the special unit had vanished without a shadow, and now they stood tall and proud, shining with sincerity and firmness as experts. Thus, including the three members of the special unit, the seven expedition members who would enter the Demon King's castle dungeon were decided. The last seven. With these seven I intend to defeat the Demon King and win a happy ending. I tightened my will firmly. However, the final seven were not the end of the story. The Demon King dungeon gate was divided into the main gate and an additional gate. As soon as the expedition entered the main gate, the other gates were opened and the demons went out, but the damage caused by the first one was too great. It would be a total attack of the demon world. If it had not been Meyer, I would not have known either. In the game, all I had to do was catch the demon king, and I was the one who would enter the dungeon in the first round. When I first heard about this, a shiver ran down my spine. Had Meyer not held my hand, I would have never known forever just thinking about it makes my hair stand on end. After Meyer shared with me the exact location where the demons were extracted in the first round. I carefully adjusted the timing of the gate entry through constant meetings with Meyer to determine where to send the expedition first and which expedition to have on standby. After the report meeting, I met with the expedition leaders to identify those who were holding hands with Countess Nearest, and the other expedition members accepted the situation relatively easily thanks to premedication. Sometimes people doubted how I could know, but if the records from the time of the First Holy Demon War a thousand years ago were still in the Grand Duke's possession, then all was well. That was a lie, of course. But it was not possible to send someone to Nocantoria now. Since there was no way to confirm it, I incited people with lies, not caring at all. Finally, the day approached when we were to enter. Everyone killed a single sound as we neared death and destruction. In such a quiet silence we could hear the gradual opening of the gates. I backed away in horror as I listened to the world expand and the sound of magi leaking out. The expedition members, however, held their ground without the slightest retreat. Meanwhile, the Imperial Guard was evacuating people in and around the capital. Haste and haste they did, but there were still those who remained. We'll fight, too. My limbs are strong, so anything goes. While villagers near the capital were on their way to refuge, those who could bear any weapons remained to help the expedition members. They're not just any demons, but demons from the Demon King's castle. The public cannot deal with them, so please leave as you are. I'll at least carry supplies. This is the home of our lives. Perhaps we know shortcuts better here. They didn't back down by saying it over and over again, so the expedition member had no choice but to nod to do so. I stared and moistened my dry lips with my tongue. The anxiety and nervousness that what I prepared might go wrong, and the expectation that all of this will end. I glanced at the special unit standing there with nervous faces. A guardian's heart wanted to increase the chance of survival as much as possible, and the special unit especially wanted to raise the level a little more to deal with the demon king. But even if I had tried to regret it, it was too late. I had no choice but to do what I could now. I repeatedly told the special forces. You've leveled enough, but it's still the demon king. Don't let your guard down. I know, I know. Don't worry too much. Sevi raised his chin pretending to be fine. But he could not hide his trembling lips. At that time, Rober, who arrived late, raised her hand and waved to greet us. Oh, fortunately, it's not too late. Is sister still late in this situation? Axion grumbled. He was used to Rober's tardiness, and Meyer, Tragula, and August all looked as if they would be too. Rober laughed without saying a word, and at once asked the trio to hold out their hands. Hand. She put one bracelet after another on the arms of the trio. They were crude and poorly made, but they were pulled on with such firmness that they didn't seem to untie easily. Rober smiled contentedly and held her head back. Our oak tribe tie bracelets as a way to ward off bad luck for apprentices and children who are about to go to war. It's been so long since I've learned it that I'm a little lost. Hold on, sister. But we don't have anything. We have the sentiments of the elite unit. Exclaimed Axion. Rober snorted and scolded Axion. 
you didn't listen to me. It's for apprentices or children. If you want to be my child, I'll go ahead and make you one now. Oh, that's enough. With the bracelets that Rober wove, everything that tries to come in for warding will run away. What a bad mouth that only lives to talk. Rober clicked her tongue at the appearance of Axion, who smiled and shook her hand. Be careful, June. Anasta, who came out to see me off, held my hand and said. Jean, who had taken a step behind Anasta, murmured softly to her usual close friend Sevi. Come back alive. Trust me. If I defeat the Demon King, everyone will call me the Gale Destroyer, not the Spirit of the Wind. No. I don't think that's possible. However, I chose to quietly turn away because I couldn't break the Rising Spirit by trying to bluff, and it was the same for both the Black Knights except Sevi and Jean. Jean and Anasta decided to join the Red Wolf unit. I was able to relax, as it was still safer to stay with them, who I trusted than to volunteer here and there. Have a safe trip. I'll do my best to stop the demons. Tragula bowed his head politely. I looked around at the people who came to meet me and told them firmly. This is our last battle take care of yourself, everyone. At my words, Rober smiled and added, as if to believe only in her. For the peace of mankind. For the peace of mankind. Following Rober's lead, everyone loudly advocated the slogan. Then, making eye contact, everyone smiled. We didn't show any of our fear and anxiety but held it in a light smile. Then let's go to war. Meyer, who had just finished talking to the Emperor and getting ready, approached us. We decided to keep the departure ceremony short and abbreviated. There was no room for such a ceremony, and the Emperor's intention was that it would be meaningless since a new era would soon open anyway. As we were about to leave the Imperial Palace, suddenly a commotion began to rustle in the distance. Before Sevi understood what was going on, an expedition member was running urgently toward us. Meyer also rushed to him and asked. What's the fuss about? The demons. Demons are popping out. Chapter, 161. What? Already? Confusion flashed across the faces of the Black Knights. We haven't even entered the gate yet why did the gate already open? It was obvious that something had gone terribly wrong. But there was no time to question why. If the demons had escaped, we had to enter the dungeon as soon as possible and defeat the demon king. In the rush of the moment, not to mention who was first, the last seven kicked the ground toward the gate. Rober and Tragula also headed for their unit, while Anasta, Jean, and the Red Wolf unit ran to their positions. There was no time to lose. I could see the other expedition members frantically confronting the demons on either side of the Black Knight's rush. Everyone was confused by the unexpectedly broken silence. Their levels are higher than I thought. But we have to do it fast. In a little while, when the big demons come out, it will be even more unbearable. I'll help you. Each expedition team collaborated and the voices against evil passed by. I said after Meyer. The Demon King gate showing up early, and the demon slipping out when no one has entered it yet this time it is a little strange. Something has changed, that's for sure. We have to be more careful. The fact that there had never been a situation like this in a game made it even more unsettling. Meyer also grunted low at the different aspects of the first round. If the Demon King's Magi was even more gigantic than I expected and this happened. No. Don't jump to conclusions. The dice had already been thrown and we had to go with whatever was waiting ahead. Soon we stood in front of the main gate. The wide open main gate repeatedly distorted as if to tempt us. Just before entering the final dungeon, the Black Knights took a small breath in front of the gate. Even Axion and August, who had been so far unperturbed, seemed to tense up, their mouths stiffening. I said in a cheerful voice that also served to recall the jovial atmosphere. Now, once we've finished this, we'll be out of this nasty lie. That's nice to hear at such a time. Nova welcomed my words wholeheartedly. Axion quickly regained his normal composure and said playfully. There were a lot of magic experiments I wanted to study in the dungeon. Then Axion will live in the dungeon for the rest of his life. Sevi made a fuss. 
Axion glanced at Sevi as if he were cute and immediately ruffled his hair. You little rascal. Ah, uh, don't. The others smiled as they saw Sevi and Axion making a fuss. The moment the uneasiness that had been holding the expedition team down eased, Meyer blurted out. All at once, the voices that had been chattering earlier disappeared, and everyone's eyes turned to Meyer. Meyer looked at the expedition members and handed them his last wish. As I said, I follow June's directions in the dungeon. Yes. I will obey the tyrant's orders. Oh, seriously. I frowned at the sudden outburst of my title. Sevi, the person who surprised me, quickly went behind Nova and hid. Now he was not afraid to joke around even in front of Meyer. It seemed like only yesterday that when he first joined the team, he was paying attention to Meyer's face and every one word he said. Still, not bad. No, in fact, it was even better. Even if he wasn't, I was inwardly concerned about taking Sevi who had just turned 16 to the dungeon, but I really appreciated every time he evoked the atmosphere in this manner. Anyway let's go. I was the first one to step over the gate, shouting. Meyer and the rest of the Black Knights entered the gate, startled and out of breath. Anyway they all seemed to be people who would not see me alone in the dungeon for even one second. And so we entered the dungeon, where countless hordes of demons greeted us with a gleam in their eyes. It was the beginning of the final battle. Fire rain. August, please put a spell of recovery on Nova. Light of purification. Thank you. There's a hole in the back, Meyer. Please back it up. Okay. Sevi. Cover Julieta. Firm skin. Everyone was a little less focused as they continued to deal with the onrushing demons. I repeatedly scolded the expedition for maximum efficiency at the moment when we were perfectly aligned without a single second's error. If I could cast the attribute conversion spell on Meyer and make him manifest holy power, we could conquer even such small demons with relative ease, but it was not yet the right time. As the other expedition members lacked a little in level, they had to level up by pouring experience magic to the end. No matter if we kill the demon king, it would be meaningless if we all went home dead. Large demons will appear soon. Don't get too far away, stick together, and keep an eye out for the ground. Axion internally marveled. He had never been in a dungeon with June, but she acted like someone who knew about dungeons. The same was true this time in the demon king's dungeon. Not only did she go as far as she could as if she knew the way, but she also easily saw what kind of demons would appear when, how they would approach, and what kind of attacks they would make. I wondered why she wanted to give personal instructions on an antidote, it was for a time like this. He had no idea that there was a scorpion-type demon that attacked with poison in the demon king's castle. That was not all. Axion rolled his tongue when he saw the trio of the special unit. Every time he and the special forces conquered a dungeon, he was amazed at their abilities above their levels, but after they reached almost the same level as him, he was beyond amazement and in a state of wonder. While giving, the attackers dispersed to break the streak and attack the eyes. Wyverns mainly attack straight ahead when they are in the air, so look at their heads to avoid them, and after two attacks, they will descend to the ground, so attack at that moment for a moment. Spider demons have a weak spot under their jaws, but be careful not to get too close because they will spit out spider silk. The cobwebs are flammable and can burn well in fire, but they should be used appropriately because they are lighter and can be checked by wind magic, ensuring mobility for melee physical attackers. Countless diverse demons blocked the way ahead, but the trio of the special unit responded like flowing water. It was as if they knew the strategy for all the demons in the Demon King's castle. She's worked very hard on them she kept them so well trained that they exceeded the 60th level in any number of ways. Still, she gladly brought them in for their third year as a member of the Demon King's War. Well, what kind of person is June? When it comes to dungeon raids, she was really a person who evaluated only on the basis of abilities, drying up Axion himself, August, and even Meyer. If the trio had not met her high standards of competence, she would not have even taken them into consideration in the first place. Just as Axion marveled a little at the trio's ability, a black goblin jumped over Julieta and Nova and aimed for their rear. 
It was a sudden and unexpected situation that no one could have handled. June hurriedly shouted at the one whom the demon was after. Axion. No matter how skilled Axion was, he was not as reflective as physical strikers. Frustrated, Axion stepped back quickly and widened the distance. Then he hurriedly tried to cast a spell, but he didn't have enough time. Tack. At that moment, an arrow shot with a ping of the strings. The arrow narrowly grazed the goblin's arm just before the black goblin attacked Axion. That was enough. At the moment the goblin hesitated, Axion even finished casting. Blazing arrow. There was no way to survive and it was pierced by a fire arrow shot from a distance. The burning demon quickly became ash and scattered. The demon was safely disposed of, and Sevi, the party who had drawn the bow, exclaimed with a frown. You're always talking so well. I was surprised. The situation was very tense. Looking at it, it seemed that he chose the bow over the magic he had to cast. Although it was somewhat underpowered to pierce the goblin's arm, it was quick and accurate, as he had joined the Black Knights as an archer. Nova shouted belatedly. I'm sorry, Axion. It's all right, it's all right. It happens. Axion swept his heart away. He never thought he'd ring the bell of his own life so vainly. No matter how difficult it was to get people to go, it was still true, and loss of humanity was almost inevitable. Axion quietly admired and sent a word to Sevi. By the way, wow I was really surprised. Thank you, Sevi. I'll pay you back for my life. That's enough for your life, were you thinking about something else? Just concentrate. Sevi snapped and turned around. If others saw it, they wouldn't be able to tell who had older experience. What a shame. Axion chuckled and raised his glasses. He couldn't just let his mind go and be pushed back by his juniors. His eyes sparkled through the lenses of his glasses. After the brief incident, Axion flew around. His sudden surge of concentration made June smile with satisfaction, saying, as long as the results are good. And so, under June's direction, the Black Knights wasted no time, easily breaking into the Demon King's castle step by step. Only half of the way to the main building remained. Chapter, 162 The Black Goblin's sudden behavior took us by surprise, but we were still able to pass through without incident thanks to the quick action of Sevi. Perhaps it was because of the strict teaching of the trio so far, the trio did as well as they had learned. Not to mention the professional backup from Axion and August. Thanks to that we were able to collect experience from every corner, even the hidden demons. I marveled when Julieta wiped the blood of the demon that had turned on her face with the back of her hand. How does the vice commander know this? Later. I'll let you know when I get a chance. I casually laughed it off. The levels of all six of us, except Meyer, had risen effortlessly. It didn't go up easily because of his originally high level and large experience section. I properly drove my experience by looking at the level gauge bar of the expedition members. If it's 1% experience or 99% experience, the same level 65, the actual stats are the same, so it's beneficial to drive one person to make level 66 if possible. Of course, this method takes a long time. It makes the situation outside the dungeon that much more difficult, but there was nothing I could do to defeat the Demon King perfectly. I had to trust that the Black Knights and the other expedition members outside would endure well. That's how I took advantage of the little leeway I had to calculate the expedition members' levels, experience, and the timing of acquiring new skills, but something didn't match my expectations. It's strange. What is? Asked Meyer immediately. I mumbled, rubbing the tip of my chin. A colony of demons is missing. A colony? Meyer was surprised. I looked back at my memory of the ground and drew a map. Yes. Originally, we would have had to encounter spider-type demons again in the southeast cave we had just passed through. We didn't. As much as anyone knows that my memory is correct, Meyer's face also became serious. I wonder if the Demon King, realizing we were deliberately raising our experience level, bit the monster. Do you think he's gained that much control? I don't know. I think it's the same for the Demon King, who has to buy time. 
Meyer shook his head as if he didn't understand. The reason the Demon King deliberately opened the gate and connected the Demon World with the Earth was to regain his power. Just as shadows are created only when there is light, nothing can distinguish what is shadow and what is darkness in the darkness. The same was true of the Demon King. The Demon King indeed had huge magical powers, but ironically, he needed the energy of the human world as much as his magic to use his own. Without the energy to take over, it would be nothing more than a mere lump of magical power, and there was a danger that the Demon King would also be swallowed up by the magical power, if only somewhat. Therefore, the Demon King opened the gate and gave humans to the Demon World, and sent demons from the Demon World to take over. It was fortunate that it was more efficient for us to gain experience from demons than for the Demon King to gain energy from humans. At any rate, I hope it wasn't a big deal. I clicked my tongue at the unexpected situation. After clearing the dungeon stages one by one, we finally reached the center of the Demon King's castle dungeon, the main building where the Demon King was located. Creek. With a dull thud, the huge, much taller doors opened. The door, the size of a handful of hands, gradually opened to reveal the main building. A huge hall that looked like it had been carved out of a cliff. On top of the stone pillars that supported the walls were pieces of gargoyles that watched over them as if to keep an eye on them below. I moistened my hardened mouth at the sight that was not a bit different from the first round. And for the first time in all of this, the Black Knights stepped cautiously inward with each step, remaining vigilant as they lifted their weapons. Once fully cupped, the open door slammed automatically shut. Then a fire flared up in the wall stop. One after another, the stops were lit up along the walls. As such, gradually pupils became clearer and vision began to be discerned. At the end of the flames was the throne of the Demon King. A huge and menacing throne that looked as if it had been carved out of one side of a cliff. There the Demon King sat, motionless, like a sculpture. He was covered from head to toe in black, like a huge black wall. The Demon King slowly opened his eyes. Even his scara was black, so it looked like two red moons were floating in the night sky. The Demon King opened his eyes and laughed. Even his open mouth was black. It's you again, Nox. The Demon King's voice growled as it echoed in my head. As the structure resonated with the Magi's wavelength, not the wavelength of the air, every time I heard his voice, my skin became numb. Again. I felt a strange part of the Demon King's words, and I raised my eyebrows. What? Meyer was also perplexed by the incomprehensible statement. But the Demon King did not answer and stretched out. His crowning black, spiky horns threatened to reach the ceiling. That was how huge and majestic the Demon King was. The Demon King walked down from his throne step by step. His black wings hung to the floor like a cape. Thousands of years ago, the spirit of your ancestors who did not step back even before me in front of the expedition was truly admirable. So much so that it gives me the glory of choice in the subject I choose to keep my power hidden. Glory. You have a talent for making curses sound different. Meyer mumbled as he chewed. His golden eyes shone like those looking at an irreconcilable enemy. But the Demon King did not care. Yes, I knew you'd say that. You haven't changed much. You're pretending to know me very well. I do know you. I know you very well. The Demon King remained calm at Meyer's sarcastic remark. It's not our first time meeting, Meyer Knox. It was a completely unexpected answer. While I was immersed for a while, trying to figure out whether the words were true or metaphorical, the Demon King kept on speaking. I knew I made the right choice when I chose your bloodline. You came before me again out of necessity, and thanks to you, I have the opportunity to conquer the world once more like this. Then the Demon King chuckled. I got goosebumps all over the flesh from the loud waves of mana. The Demon King kept saying incomprehensible things, but the important thing now is not to uncover the truth. There was nothing good about having a long conversation with the Demon King. Otherwise, the conversation would have started to confuse other people, as if there was some sort of relationship between Meyer and the Demon King. Commander. I caught Meyer. Then he shook his head. 
Finally coming to his senses, Meyer kept his lips pursed and his reddened eyes shining. Why? I guess it's hard for your subordinates to hear. However, it seemed that he had no intention of following our intentions, and the demon king pulled his lips into a pinched smile. I could clearly see his black heart. Indeed. It's not easy to say. That my power is in your blood, and that you are the originator of all this calamity. He's decided to make a mess of things, hasn't he? I clicked my tongue low. Sure enough, the others were clearly upset. Originator of this calamity? What does he mean, power of the demon king in his blood? Not only did the trio and Axion look confused, but even the cautious August looked confused. The demon king was not an easy phrase to hear. Even though the Black Knights were loyal to Meyer, Meyer's possession of the demon king's power was another matter. So far, I have kept it secret from other expedition members. I thought it would be all right. I didn't know the Demon King was so talkative. It wasn't to this extent in the first round when Fabian came. We went into battle right away. Contrary to expectations, I clicked my tongue in a low voice in a situation that was going around. Meyer Knox, your birth allowed me to gradually gain strength and open the door to the magical world. And in a situation where I was being pursued and somewhat defeated by the humans, I was able to use the extra magi I had in you to turn back time. I caught a glimpse of Meyer. His face had gone white. It was as if all the blood in his body had evaporated in a fury. The pressure was like violence from an overwhelming force of arms that felt absolutely intimidating. But it was meaningless to the Demon King. The Demon King went on, convinced of his victory. And now you will be absorbed by me and a great force to conquer the human race. So, how can I not thank you for your precious devotion? I don't think anything has changed in terms of thinking things will go according to your plan. I took a step forward, shaking off the Demon King's words. For the sake of Meyer's mental health, which was not very solid even for free, I could not let the Demon King go off any further. And finally, the Demon King's gaze reached me. Even though I had eaten the dragon's pearl and increased my stats, my magic defense was not outstandingly high. Even the mere sight of the demon king's gaze on me gave me chills and made me jumpy. But having experienced it once, I could withstand it more easily now than the second time. I feigned composure and said to the demon king. You've had a hard time once. Will it work out as you plan this time, too? You. The demon king's red eyes frowned. It seemed that my appearance was casual. But still, I was one of the last seven members of the first round. The Demon King laughed, perhaps recognizing me belatedly. I remember. You really line up well, too. I can't believe a supportive wizard would stand on the throne of glory against the Demon King twice. Chapter, 163 I see what he's saying, he doesn't really think I'm important. It worked out rather well. The more careless the Demon King is, the bigger the impact should be when he is hit on the back of the head by my ability. I fell silent, anticipating the moment when I would give that arrogant being a shot. The Demon King pieced my words together in a wry smile, whether my smoke had been eaten, or whether he had not given me the possibility in the first place because he thought it was ridiculous for me not to be afraid. But in the end, you came to the first place to die. You were going to make Meyer Knox your new hero. But that's nonsense. For Meyer Knox is nothing but a surplus for me. He will not beat me and will be my sacrifice for my strength. The Demon King was sure. His conviction was not unfounded, for it would have been if I had not been there. At that moment, the Demon King lamented and sneered in a whispered voice. Marianne tried to turn back time, but it was all in vain. In the end, it's the same as the first it turned out to be good but I didn't have time to think long. Because the Demon King reached out to Meyer. Through his hand, the black magic spread like smoke and tried to hold Meyer. Attribute conversion. I shouted quickly. Meyer noticed and immediately awakened his magic. A pure white, holy light exploded, piercing my eyes, and the black smoke disappeared, burning with holy power. What? For the first time, the face of the Demon King, who had been relaxed even up to that moment when he fell to Fabian's sword in the first round, cracked. 
Meyer's every attack scattered helplessly, and he should have been eager to kill us in despair, unable to do anything about it. Meyer's sword, raised in the air, shone divinely like a glittering moon in the night sky. At this moment, he looked more befitting of a holy knight than the title of Black Knight. This can't be. The demon king was perplexed, but he immediately saw the cause of this unforeseen situation. His red eyes, which had been looking down at me contemptuously, arrogantly, and with a sense of composure, became distorted with impatience and anger. You were Marianne's anointing. Supportive wizard. I'm not sure if ST. Marianne would have chosen me. I mumbled and cast one support spell after another. Strength of muscles. Indomitable will. Quick feet. Rising power. Magic that increased attack and defense, agility, and the speed of magic recovery were applied to the expedition members in turn. Meyer stepped forward step by step, still holding his sword. At first, he moved slowly, as if gauging the distance, but gradually he began to pick up speed. I chose Meyer Knox. I stared at Meyer's back, his broad back, the hem of his fluttering black cloak. A black knight charged alone, without hesitation, toward the demon king. A legendary scene might look like this. If a bard had been here, they would have admired this moment alone for the rest of their life. The magnificent image of Meyer, as if straight out of an illustration in a history book, flickered across my retinas as if etched into my mind. The final support magic was perfect. I gritted my teeth and screamed. That's what the glory of choosing means, you son of a bitch. The moment I screamed violently, Meyer kicked the floor. Sky Island. Sevi, who came back to himself without delay, recited well-timed magic. Places, where one could step into the air, were popping up like stairs in time with Meyer's footsteps. As he strode through the air, Meyer quickly arrived right in front of the giant demon king. He lifted his sword, which emitted beads of holy power, above his head and shouted. Let's put an end to this weary war. You bastard. The demon king shouted angrily. Just before Meyer's sword rushed toward the demon king's neck, the huge demon king's body was momentarily covered in black smoke. Panicked, Meyer looked at me through clenched teeth. The swarm of black smoke became a large hand, scratching and leaping toward me. He seemed to have decided that it would be faster to kill me first than Meyer. I grasped the situation correctly and screamed in desperation. Nova. Julieta. Before my words had run out, Nova and Julieta sprang out and quickly shielded me. Cook. Fortunately, they were able to prevent the Demon King's attack, but it was not easy to meet the Demon King's power head-on, no matter how painted Nova and Julieta were with their support magic. While Julieta and Nova persisted, Axion cast check magic, and August quickly cast a blessing. As if in a daze, everyone moved in unison. Although Meyer's magic was a shocking thing, they would not have been brought in in the first place if they had been crazy enough to troll in vain at this point before the Demon King. Everyone quickly grasped their distracted concentration, as if they had not forgotten the cause that defeating the Demon King came first. Meyer aimed right behind the Demon King. However, as each attack by Meyer was dangerous, the Demon King also did not easily turn his back on him. Rise up, ye servants of darkness! A large hand was slammed down to the floor with a thud. And just as the hand came up again, white skeletons dug the earth out of the floor and raised their bodies like bamboo shoots after the rain. The number of them was tremendous. It was not enough to fill our huge pupils, and the skeletons climbed along the backs of the skeletons. Skeletons. Such a large number really, it's like a battle of the demon king. Axion tried hard to pretend to be relaxed. Sevi, who had a sense of competition for Axion, also responded by pretending to be calm, perhaps because he didn't want to show a frightened appearance alone. It seems all the demons I've killed so far from the dungeon have gathered here. The little one is pretentious. Axion chuckled. He fired a barrage of magic and rolled his tongue at the skeletons on the wall. But it seems to me that they have a grudge, not against you, but the vice commander. Ha! <laughs> I smiled awkwardly. Perhaps because the Demon King pointed at me, all the skeletons' aggro was focused on me. The skeletons' defenses were not that high, 
but their numbers were not exhausted. It seemed no exaggeration to say that all the demons that had died so far in the dungeon had come flooding in, just as Sevi had said. Meyer, separated from us, swung his sword at the streaming skeletons and shouted for the demon king, who was nowhere to be found. You run away with fear. Ha, how dare you provoke me. You bastard. The demon king's cry echoed through the high ceiling. There was no appearance of the demon king, but this much attention was enough. No matter how strong the demon king was, he was not a fountain of constantly gushing magic power. He also had to operate his magic in a restrictive way, and it was impossible to adjust every single time he summoned a large number of demons. The further away from the demon king, the less sensitive it becomes. The moment the demon king's attention was disturbed for a while, there should have been a section where the skeleton's movements stopped for a while. As expected, Sevi, who had sensitively grasped the demon's movements, hastily exclaimed. There's a gap in the east direction. That's enough to locate the demon king. I immediately gave August a signal. Priest August, please station curtain of light on the west side. Understood. August nodded and quickly chanted the skill. The curtain of light was a shield based on holy power, a technology originally intended to protect us. But for this moment, it would be a prison that would confine the demon king. Since the space was wide, August's holy power was drained out. Cold sweat formed on August's chin, which was not easily exhausted. I kept applying rising power and helped him regain his holy power. A hemispherical protective membrane, imbued with holy power, gradually closed the space between us and Meyer. While the protective curtain was being stretched, Julieta, Nova, and Axion still kept the onrushing skeletons in check. After much waiting, the protective coating was complete. Only Meyer, a large number of skeletons, and the Demon King remained inside the shield. There were some skeletons left outside the protective membrane, but nothing compared to the number of pure white bones inside the protective membrane. I screamed as hard as I could so that Meyer could hear me. Meyer. Now. Okay. Meyer's voice could be heard over the layers of skeletons. And immediately, more pure white, brilliant light began to flood out from among the white bones. The demon king cried out in impatience, but it was too late. Meyer's skill had already begun. Blade of Judgment. Meyer's extensive offensive skills were recited, which erupted explosively with magical power and scorched everything around them. It was the only way to inflict damage on the demon king, who was scattered like a mist, all at once. It would have been better to use the skill with a protective film on us, but it was more effective to explode in a limited space surrounded by the protective film if the same magic was used. It was a kind of pressure rice cooker principle. And if that protective film was made of holy power, it would be twice as effective. No matter how much of a demon king he is, he has never been in contact with level 80 holy power. The light that at first leaked through the cracks soon stained the protective coating white. It was a storm of holy power that seemed to break through even the protective film. Chapter, 164 One by one, the skeletons that were outside the protective coating began to crumble to the floor. The attack seemed to have been properly carried out on the demon king. Cough. August coughed up blood. The impact on the protective coating was also tremendous. It was very difficult just to withstand it so that the protective coating would not crack. Just a little more, August. I screamed just as I stepped onto the ground. Now, even if I wanted to help anymore, I couldn't. If August was in so much pain, I wondered what the inside would really be like. Meyer is okay, right? It's in a state of attribute transformation now, so it won't be affected by the holy power even if we exclude the attributes, it is still proto-massive energy, isn't it? Frustrated, I immediately opened the status window. Sure enough, Meyer's physical strength was quite worn out. Still, it was not a dangerous situation yet. I breathed a sigh of relief quietly. Crash. The protective coating that could not hold out broke. Shattered like shattered glass, the protective coating soon glowed and scattered into the air. Soon, the holy power trapped in the protective film hit us in a gust of wind. Ugh. Cool. We raised our arms and covered our eyes. 
As the wind died down, the situation inside the protective membrane gradually revealed itself. The skeletons, which filled the inside, collapsed to the floor or became powder and scattered without maintaining their shape. Meyer barely supported his sword and exhaled roughly over the tomb of white bones. I had never seen him so tired. In front of him, the oddly twisted demon king was struggling to pull up his magic somehow. T. A. A. The blow seemed to be quite deadly. The shape of the demon king rose jaggedly. Meyer stepped slowly toward the demon king. No matter how tired he was, this was a once-in-a-lifetime moment to dispose of an enemy. A vow to somehow kill the demon king oozed from Meyer's toes. Goodbye, demon king. Meyer raised his sword. Under the sword, which shone brightly with holy power, Meyer's golden eyes were tinged with joy. Today I will completely break the curse of my blood. Ha, ha ha do you think this is it? The demon king bluffed while not even maintaining his form properly. The red eyes of the dying demon king, who was repeatedly kicking like that, turned towards me beyond Meyer. Don't expect everything to go according to your plan, oh support wizard, blessed by St. Marianne. It's not that I didn't make any arrangements. I can't believe he has so much energy left in him even on the brink of death he is indeed the demon king. Julieta muttered in disgust. She seemed to think that the demon king was making a last stand. But knowing how the worst of the situation was playing out, I could not sit through the demon king's words. No way. I confirmed Meyer's medical condition. The transformation of attributes was still in place. There was no sign of magi biting into him, as the holy power was just covering him. If there were no variables, he would continue to defeat the demon king safely. Yes. If only there were no variables. Rain of fire. With a not-so-welcome voice, sparks suddenly flew in the air. The panicked expedition members looked at Axion, who looked even more puzzled and hastily exclaimed as he looked at the flaming sky. It wasn't me. I know. Fuck, Meyer. Kill the demon king. Knowing the situation right away, I shouted to Meyer, swearing harshly. But it was too late. I will be the last hero who defeated the demon king. Fabian suddenly appeared and with a cry of joy, thrust his sword out from behind the demon king. His sword pierced the place believed to be the chest of the demon king at once. How is he here? Nova exclaimed incomprehensibly. It was obvious. Only seven people could enter the dungeon, and none of the last seven had died. So there had to be no one except us. I bit my lower lip. I had a thick sense of deja vu. When Fabian defeated the demon king in the second round of the game in which he was the main character, Meyer appeared from somewhere. I didn't think too much about it at the time, thinking that it was the game's directorial permission. Don't tell me that the Demon King dungeon has a different number of people that can enter it. Or was there some exception? The game's setting is better connected to reality than I expected, and I should have thought enough about the possibility of other people intervening. But it is too late to look back now. Fabian had already entered the dungeon and thrust the final blow into the Demon King's chest. Meyer's eyes turned upside down as he missed the Demon King's final moments. Losing control in anger, he tried to swing his sword at Fabian. Fabian Ignis, you bastard. Meyer. Come this way. Spread your distance from him. I cried hastily. Meyer's sword paused. Meyer looked back at me as if he didn't understand. Meyer. Hurry. I continued to rush Meyer. In the game, Meyer defeated the Demon King in the same manner as Fabian, eventually being swallowed by Magi and becoming the second Demon King. Of course, that was because Meyer was the nucleus of the Demon King, so nothing would happen now. But to be so sure, I was struck with apprehension. An uneasy feeling that everything would flow like the game, just because people had changed. If it flows as I predicted now Meyer's physical strength is too poor. It is stable to recover for the time being and aim for the second round. Sure enough, as soon as Meyer stepped back to my prompting, a black magical vessel slipped out of the Demon King, pierced by Fabian's sword, like a blast. The Demon King erupted into a final laugh. Ha, ha, ha 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 ha. What the? 
Cook. Magi scattered from the demon king quickly covered Fabian. His nose, mouth, and eyes pulled the Magi in. He shook it off and struggled, but it never left him. Magi is a poison to humans. Fabian, who was forced to continue inhaling such magi, screamed in pain. Guaf. What is this? Nova mumbled in a daze. Meyer, too, was unable to enter the unexpected scene and could only watch the scene. The Demon King and I were the only two people who knew what was going to happen next. I gritted my teeth. It was an unexpected final game. Fabian, who had lost everything in Decca's betrayal, was driven only by stubbornness and hatred. He trudged through the overgrown forest. A trickle of blood ran down his steps and covered the ground. Fabian opened his blurry eyes. The end of the sky was so dark that it was impossible to distinguish night from day. The route from which all darkness was spewed out the place where the gate to the war against the demon king was opened was very close. He didn't know how much time had passed since he arrived here. Fabian quickened his pace. He had to hurry before June and her party entered the dungeon. There was a limit to how many people could enter the dungeon. If he entered the dungeon first, the Black Knights, who knew nothing, would unexpectedly omit one last person. If that one person was Meyer or June he couldn't stop laughing when head hot of their panic. Fabian chuckled even as he was dying. The malice of somehow thwarting June and Meyer was at Fabian's back. The world peace that would be protected at the end of it all has long since been dimmed and forgotten from memory. Hatred was a stronger motivating force than goodwill. Despite his serious injuries, Fabian was able to enter the gate before anyone else, without the slightest rest. It was next to impossible to survive in a dungeon alone, and that too in the Demon King's castle, with his injuries. But Fabian had an idea. He had the memory of the first round, and he remembered every single detail of how the Demon Castle worked. Therefore, until the Black Knights were established, he could hide from the demons. If my body will bear it. Fabian smiled as he moved his limbs, which were slowly losing feeling. What a shabby and insignificant end. He never thought about it in the first or second round. The moment Fabian entered the dungeon against the demon king with only his venom, an unknowable power began to surge up and his wounds began to heal. What's this? Fabian looked at his body in confusion. His limbs, which were heavy as if they had been attached with lead, were extremely light. Ha, ha ha ha. Fabian laughed softly. He didn't know why, but it was clear that the protection of Esti. Marianne had been granted to him. As expected, I'm the warrior to defeat the Demon King. If this happened, it was a different story. In the meantime, let's raise the level while dealing with the demons little by little. And then, at the last moment just before Meyer defeats the Demon King, I'm going to choke him out. The Demon King's experience will be mine, so it will be worth fighting Meyer, who has used up all his strength against the Demon King, and the honor of having defeated the Demon King will also be mine. Fabian's blue eyes were bent. The future ahead of him shone with victory and glory. Chapter, 165 Ha ha! Fabian, who had absorbed all the magi, gave a small laugh. Black magi leaked from his open mouth. Fabian's head, which had been facing the sky, slowly returned to its original position. Black pterygiums and his burning red eyes. His red hair was also dyed black, leaving only the last of it, and his horns, like those of the demon king, grew long on his head. It was Fabian, not Meyer, who became the host of the demon king in the second demon king. His humanity had been completely burned away by the Magi's venom, and he no longer looked human. Fabian smiled and murmured. I think I'm going to live a little longer. He stretched his stiff body and stretched his neck from side to side. Not everyone can become a second demon king. If you become the demon king just because you stabbed the demon king, then Fabian should have ended up becoming the demon king in the first round without having to go back in time from the beginning. Only the person whom the demon king planted a nucleus can become the second demon king. When he defeated the demon king in the first round, did the demon king plant a nucleus in Fabian? That was most likely the case. Two demon king nuclei. That much power of succession must have been absorbed more quickly, 
which would have caused the dungeon of the Demon King's castle to appear earlier than expected. I don't know why it flowed in a different direction from the game, but... Fabian, who became the second Demon King, raised his hand and burst into laughter. Ha ha ha. So this is the power of the Demon King. Apparently, the Demon King was currently asleep for a while, and Fabian seemed to maintain his ego. Perhaps he would seize the opportunity in Fabian and try to engulf him. Fabian, unaware of such ulterior motives of the Demon King even in his dreams, murmured with an enraptured expression as if intoxicated by the simmering power. I see. I figured it out already it was the Demon King who gave me the mobile scroll. Huh, it was the blessing of the Demon King that was given to me, not as tea. Marianne. It was said that the Demon King went into hiding for a while to save his power, but it would have been within his power to drop a single item floating around a demon world at any desired location. Perhaps he measured two of his own nuclei and tried to balance them. It would not have been a good thing for either of them to have rolled faster than the other. If Meyer accepted the Demon King's power out of desperation at the bondage he could not escape from the game, now Fabian took the power of the Demon King with open arms. Fabian lifted his sword. The undulating black flames wrapped around his sword. He spoke gruffly. I don't know how all seven of you ended up in the dungeon, but I don't care anymore. It only makes a difference if you die now or later. Fabian shouted and swung his sword. A mixture of fire magic and magi covered us. Ack. Nova and Julieta blocked it with their shields, but it was not easy. The black flame did not go out easily and jumped on their shields. Nova and Julieta gritted their teeth at the heat and venom. Damn. Axion, who couldn't bear to watch, immediately tried to distract Fabian by performing magic. Fireworks arrows filled the sky and rained down on Fabian. However, Fabian was resistant to fire because of the same fire attribute. Instead, he was so relaxed that he fought back with a smile on his face. Flame mage. Ha. That's ridiculous. In Fabian's hand, a film of black magi swallowed all the arrows and quickly became a large spear that flew toward Axion. Sevi hastily responded with wind magic, but it was not very effective. Ugh. Avoid. Everyone suffered a great deal of damage. It was surprising that they were holding out. Still, thanks to the others' efforts to buy time, Meyer's strength had recovered about half of what it had been. It would have been nice if he could have recovered all of it, but August was not in very good shape, and this was about all he could do. Meyer gripped his sword and said as he rode from his position. Let's settle this, Fabian. What was captured in his gaze at Fabian was another future for himself. His sword, with its attribute transformation undone, no longer shone noble and holy, but his will was firm and unwavering. I can't believe that you're so drunk on the power of the Demon King I even hate myself for admitting that you may have been selected as a hero. I will defeat you and break all the bonds of the cursed demon king. At Meyer's words, Fabian opened his eyes wide, and soon smiled in vain as if he were amazed. Ha, what's this? You remember the first round? You deceived me. Instead of answering back, Meyer fixed his sword and held it. Fabian giggled for a long time and smiled strangely, as if he didn't really want to hear an answer. Yes, no matter how hard I struggled, I couldn't beat you but it's different now. His eyes flashed. Then he suddenly swung his sword. The black magic became a huge wave and hit Meyer. I, who had been working so hard to protect this world, have gained such a strong power that it's almost comical. Quagwagwang. Although Meyer has magi, he is also essentially human. It was impossible to completely cancel out the magi. Meyer had pinned down his sword, but there was a limit to what he could withstand with his enormous magical power. If I could convert attributes with holy power, the situation would be different. Damn. I bit my lip. Attribute conversion was a high-level skill. Once I used the skill, the cooldown time was quite long before I could reuse it. I waited impatiently for the cool time to pass. Meyer clashed swords with Fabian. A sharp metallic sound echoed through my pupils with a ring. I'll pay you back for the humiliation of the other day, Meyer Knox. It's good to know that you were humiliated. 
Maya responded without backing down in the slightest, but it was clear that he was being pushed a little too far. From a physical point of view, it seemed that Fabian was stronger now than the Demon King. In order for the Demon King to use his magical weapons, he would need the energy of the human world, but it seemed that he could use his magical weapons much more easily because he was in a human body. With the power of the Demon King, Meyer Knox, you're nothing. Sevi, who was watching, stomped and shouted impatiently. His Excellency can't do it alone. I'll help him. But it's not a situation where we can get in. Damn it. I can't believe I have to watch this important situation helplessly. Axion spoke ill of it. As wizards, they were unable to interrupt the super proximity dispute between the entangled and warring prosecutors. At that moment, August staggered to his feet. Nova quickly went to help August. At the moment when Meyer was in danger, August did everything in his power to demonstrate his healing magic. Healing touch. The scream came from Fabian. Axion, realizing the situation, exclaimed happily. Yes, because curative magic is a holy power. It would be a cure for His Excellency, but it would be poison for the Demon King. But as if it was the last shot, August vomited blood once again. His internal injuries seemed to be severe. Nova, who had been supporting August, became contemplative. Priest. I'm fine. August shook his head, but everywhere I looked, it was the face of a dying man. Julieta bit her lips tightly. With determination, she said, clenching her mace tightly. I can fight with all my might, even if I'm weak, so I'll support you. No. Wait. I stopped Julieta. If she went there now, she would only get in the way. Fabian shouted impatiently, as August's support aroused his anger. Ha, useless. Do you think you can stop me with just this much? Of course. I stared at Fabian with my eyes flashing. That's enough time for me. Attribute conversion. As soon as the light exploded in my hands, Meyer's body began to glow with holy power again. Damn. June Carantia. Fabian let out a cry of anger. The space trembled with his magi mingled with anger, but I wasn't the least bit afraid. Because I believe in Meyer. Meyer held the sword. His golden eyes shone with hope and justice like floating bright stars. A sword so holy that it could be called a holy sword covered the sky and slashed at Fabian's body. Fabian tried to block it, but he could not avoid the entire storm of light. Kua. The white light penetrated the field of view. Has he done it? The storm gradually subsided, and Nova murmured, moistening her dry lips. However, to the shame of expectations, Fabian, who showed up, was fine without any flaws. Ha! Ha ha ha! Is this the power of your soul, Meyer Knox? That's ridiculous! Fabian laughed and mocked Meyer. Meyer has been fighting desperately since the Demon King battle. Meyer's face, which had burned all his energy, looked tired. Nevertheless, perhaps he would not give up until the end, he murmured again, raising his sword. If you think it's ridiculous, I'll try it one more time. Bluff. Fabian began to bring out his magic with a show of mirth as if laughing at Meyer. I'll show you my true strength. A tremendous amount of magical power began to gather in Fabian, unparalleled up to now. This much couldn't be prevented. The Black Knight's faces were stained with despair and a sense of defeat as they realized this fact. Yes. That's the face. Everyone should despair more. Because it still doesn't compare to my despair. June, the same goes for you. Only, I won't easily kill you cook. Fabian's face, which had been in high spirits for a long time, suddenly distorted. Something unusual seemed to be happening. Crack, crack. When I listened, I heard a small crack opening. His body is. The bright-eyed Sevi was the first to find the source of the crack and pointed at it. It was all black, so it could not be distinguished well, but when I looked closely, Magi was leaking out of the place where Sevi pointed. Chapter 166 Damn it, what the hell is this? Fabian cursed. He tried to get rid of the Magi from his body but to no avail. 
The human body could use magic without limit, but that did not mean that the human body could withstand the power of magic. The holy power applied in such a state must have been a great blow. Fabian's body, which had reached its limit, gradually broke down. There was no way Meyer was going to stand by and watch. As if nailed to the broken ice, he threw out his sword, which was coiled around with holy power. Perplexed by his breaking body, Fabian had no choice but to give his vital point to Meyer's sword helplessly without doing anything unlike before. Meyer's sword went through Fabian's chest. Quake. A scream so terrible that it made my pupils reverberate. The white, holy power clad sword began to flap and burn Fabian's black magi. Then, as if the magi were fleeing to avoid the holy power, more explosively leaked from Fabian's body. No. Not this vainly. How I got the power I have. Fabian shouted. Black blood and tears flowed from his crimson eyes. Meyer infused more magic into the sword that penetrated Fabian. Fabian's body, which had been broken, had now become smoke and began to scatter. Fabian's tremendous final cry could not even be properly concluded. Black dregs of magi scattered like ashes in the air. He who had been a warrior at one time, but who had succumbed to the magi and willingly became the second demon king, was completely dissipated along with the magi. Is it over? Axion murmured incredulously. Meyer also looked blankly at the sky. It was a shabby exit, not even leaving a corpse, compared to the endless torment we suffered. However, it was too early to relax now that everything was over. It was because the dungeon began to collapse. There was a huge roar and rocks fell one after another from the ceiling. The ground shook with the impact of the human-sized rocks falling. The dungeon, having lost the immense power of the Demon King, could not sustain the world as it was, and was destroyed like Fabian. Gate we have to find the gate. Julieta looked around and shouted in a hurry. At least Sevi, who could fly, hurriedly looked around. However, no trace of the gate was found no matter how hard he looked around. I can't see the gate what's going on. I've never seen anything like this before. Axion wrinkled his forehead. His eyes shook anxiously over the cracked glasses. Sevi asked impatiently whether the anxiety had spread. What if the gate doesn't open? Just like this we'll be trapped in a dungeon. I replied in a whisper. I was equally dismayed by the unexpected turn of events. I had never thought that we would be isolated in a dungeon because the gate would not open even though we had defeated the demon king and the second demon king. But there was no time to think. Because while I was doing so, the dungeon continued to collapse. Nova raised his shield to protect the expedition members from rocks falling overhead, but it was not the best way to endure it for a long time. We had to find a way out somehow. Nova muttered vainly, looking at the collapsing ceiling. Will we die like this? Still, we stopped the Demon King, so we accomplished one of our goals. At least world peace was protected, right? I don't think Axion is a good match for world peace. Even this positive thinking really makes me want to cry if I don't get my shit together. To Sevi's sarcasm, Axion shrugged his shoulders calmly and answered. But I didn't want to die like this, so I desperately analyzed why the gate wouldn't open. The gate opens only when the boss of the dungeon dies. The gate won't open because the boss isn't dead. But the demon king should not be alive. The dungeon collapses when the demon king dies. There was one hypothesis that haunted my brain that I had been thinking about often. No, no way. I shook my head in denial, but was it a coincidence? My gaze met Meyer's. As expected. Meyer laughed bitterly. It was a smile that seemed both dejected and refreshed. Meyer looked at the expedition members and said. I think you all got the idea from the Demon King's words I have the power of the Demon King in me. I don't care about that, Your Excellency. You are our superior and a hero to mankind. Replied Axion immediately. The quick-witted man also felt something uneasy, and his face turned white. At Axion's words, Meyer gave a big smile. He immediately stared at his palm and went on. The reason the gate doesn't open now is it's probably because I still have the Demon King's magical energy inside me. 
the dungeon accepts that the Demon King's power hasn't disappeared. Meyer. In a fit of pique, I cut off Meyer's next words. The words he was about to say were drawn in white as if he could grasp them in his hand. My fingertips went cold just thinking about it. I didn't want to believe it. Don't say outrageous things. You. I tried to calm down my trembling voice and speak as calmly as possible. But I couldn't help it as much as my voice was filled with tears. Meyer looked at me calmly. His golden eyes were silent. As if he had accepted everything. But you know this is the best way to be rational. But it's just a guess, isn't it? You can't risk your life for that. It's a credible guess. There's got to be another way. I'm sure. There was a low cry and a lot of anger. How could this happen? Why? How could this be the end of the man who threw himself most devotedly into saving the world? I couldn't accept it. But Meyer shook his head. We're running out of time, June. Then his hand took mine. I could feel his strong will riding on my firmly held hand. The faces of the expedition members, who had sensed the situation through the conversation between Meyer and me, contorted miserably. Sevi and Nova began to weep bitterly, and Julieta and Axion's faces were crowded with self-loathing at their own helplessness in such a situation. That's not right, Your Excellency. August gasped, barely breathing, and opened his mouth. Except for Meyer, August was the most seriously injured. It's not right or wrong. This is the only way. August, are you going to make me an incompetent superior who destroyed the whole expedition? August shut his mouth. Meyer, who looked through the other expedition members one by one, finally said, holding my shoulder, still unconvinced of the reality. If you get out of the dungeon June. I'll let you be emperor. If it wasn't for you, it would have been impossible. I made a promise to you. I'll leave your name in history books for a long time you will be praised all your life as the founder of the empire. What do you think? After hearing that, I am very happy and pleased. Did you think it would be like that? You are. I was so angry that I shook Meyer's hand off. I let out a cry that became like that of an animal. Meyer patted me on the back with a large hand to soothe me and whispered softly. Remember me instead. Please engrave my name next to you. I can be satisfied with that alone. I glanced at him with wet eyes and clenched my teeth. You'll regret it. I won't regret it. Meyer smiled broadly. A wrinkle-free smile that did not match the situation at all seemed the most relieved I had ever met him. Meeting you made me realize that happiness really does exist you were the only hope I had. Meyer's golden eyes shone like the north star in the night sky as he gazed at me. Despite the gravity of the situation, I was unintentionally mesmerized and gazed blankly into his twinkling eyes. I was fascinated. It was all thanks to him that I made it this far in one piece. He is my North Star. My guide. My purpose. My hero. My hero. Meyer smiled and sobbed as if he had read my own thoughts. His fingertips lovingly grazed my cheek. And then, the sword in Meyer's hand pierced his heart without hesitation. Suddenly, I screamed. I tried to grab Meyer's body, which was about to collapse, but I couldn't do it. That was how Meyer's body slumped to the floor. The red blood continued to flow through his heart as if to prove he was human. The pain was unbearable, despite the fact that it was so sudden and so expected. I could not breathe, as if my throat were choking. Meyer soon disappeared silently, not moving an inch. The Black Knight, who had destroyed countless demons with a single stroke, also took his life at once. It was as if taking his own life was also his purpose. That fact was too deeply embedded in my mind. Chapter, 167 The Gate Opened Meyer's death was not in vain, but why? The guilt of surviving at his sacrifice and the backlash against this unreasonable reality covered me. However, there was no time to dwell on ideas here. At times like this, I have to get my act together. The dungeon continued to collapse. I can't let Meyer's death go in vain. The first priority was to get out of the dungeon. I grabbed Sebi and said. 
Guys, we're running out of time. Let's get ready to go. Is he really his excellency is he dead? He has defeated the demon king, why? Sevi's face turned white. Sevi was usually terrified of the idea of someone else being sacrificed. That is why he was confused and unable to accept this situation easily. It was not only Sevi. Everyone saw Meyer's death right in front of their eyes but denied the fact. My heart sank heavily. I bit my lip, grabbed Sevi's shoulder, and shook it hard. Sevi, come to your senses. I was filled with Sevi's eyes, which were opened blankly. Only then did I realize that I was shedding tears. I looked back at the others, roughly wiping away tears. I'm sure I'm far from dignified by the tears that didn't stop, but I tried to sound as strict and cool as I could. Nova, can you take the commander? Of course. Nova nodded decisively. Leaving Meyer in the dungeon had never crossed his mind. Nova carried Meyer, who was much bigger than he was. I caught a glimpse of Meyer's face, pure white. A face that was considered tranquil. I couldn't help but see it, and I deliberately rushed the others. Axion, Julieta. Give August a hand. Yes. Axion and Julieta supported August on both sides. After the gate was opened, the dungeon collapsed faster than before. The continuous collapse now shook the ground as if there was an earthquake, and the gate became narrower. Let's get out of here. As soon as I spoke, the floor began to crack. I slipped because I couldn't keep my balance on the shaky floor, but Nova caught my hand just before I fell. Be careful. If Nova hadn't caught me, I might have fallen under the cracked floor. I felt a momentary thud in my chest. I wondered if the others were all right. Fortunately, Julieta and Axion had arrived safely near the gate with August. They turned nervously toward us, sending August, the injured man out of the swaying gate first. Get out first. I called out to them. I was afraid that something might go wrong because I was naive. At that moment, Julieta exclaimed. Vice Commander, watch your head. A human-sized rock was falling over my head. There was no room to avoid. Is this the end? At least I need to get Nova out. Green curtain. A wall of wind formed over our heads. The speed of the falling rocks slowed. I saw a figure standing over there, it was Sevi, squeezing his excess magical power. Thank you, Sevi. Hurry up. Sevi exclaimed, more clearly than before. Julieta, Sevi, and Nova. Perhaps it was worth the rigorous level up, but they all survived, even though they were all dressed as if they had been fully wounded. Yes, it was a good thing. I'm happy with this. I murmured to myself as I watched them walk through the gate one by one. One possibility that sprouted in my head from the moment Meyer was determined to sacrifice himself. It shook me with an impulse, a certainty, a realization that I had no reason not to. Vice Commander. Nova pulled my hand hard in front of the shrinking gate. I was proud that he could afford to take care of me while carrying Meyer. And so we rolled out of the gate for the last time. The gate, swinging behind me, closed completely. It was a fluttering moment. The magi that had packed the sky slowly began to disappear and the blue sky gradually revealed itself. Everyone was about to cheer the fact that we all made it out of the dungeon safely but quickly stopped talking when they found Meyer's body, which Nova had carefully put down. Axion mumbled miserably. If I died in the dungeon, I would have died His Excellency I've never thought of a future like this. His fallen red hair shook ungracefully. I approached Meyer. He looked as if he were asleep, except that he did not move a muscle. He seemed to have laid down all the responsibilities and duties he had on his shoulders. I tried to make time possible. There was not much room. I put my hand on his chest. The sword went through, and his heart emptied. The preparation was over. All that remained was action. I looked up and looked at the trio. Above the three of them, nodding in silent prayer, I saw the image of the first time we met two years ago. It brought back memories of giving Sevi a word of what if in the past. At that time, I told him that if I couldn't kill the demon king, the human world would be doomed, so I was going to do everything in my power to sacrifice myself. 
I never thought this would happen after killing the Demon King. I said with a wry smile. Sevi, I lied to you. I'm terribly sorry. I know all the trio have been through a lot and followed me without complaint most of all, thank you for surviving without serious injury. Vice Commander. Julieta looked at me with a strange expression. My words must have felt out of the blue. But I didn't have time to explain every single word. I had less and less time to use my skills. Soon I was talking to other people. August, thank you for always taking care of my mess. Axion, I had a lot of fun playing along with you. Sister, what are you talking about? It's like. I have a lot to say to the others, but I don't have much time. Please tell them. I tried to speak in a light tone, not so heavy. In fact, this was just right for my restraint. I hastily added the words that came to my mind. Oh, to Meyer, I told him he'd regret it. Please tell him that. Wait, June. Axion, who noticed the unusual situation, urgently tried to hold me. But it was too late. I smirked, evoking mana. I had no intention of dying from the beginning, it was a skill I didn't even have in mind. I never thought I would fall so much in love with Meyer. So much so that I would weigh the price of my life to save this man in a situation where the Demon King was defeated and peace was scheduled. But I couldn't bear to go on like this very much. I once told Meyer that if people had faith, we could survive wear and tear. But that wasn't it. All it took to live was hope maybe I have always dreamed of a future with you. Such hope that I was too secretive to know myself. I lost that hope, and I lost the will to live any longer. Perhaps, Meyer, you might argue that much. What is the point of a life that has been brought back to life after killing you? But you and I are different. I have memories of twenty or so years of mundane life, but you do not. So. You too can live a little longer in a world without dungeons. What would a world without anything to bind you be like? How free it would be. How blue is that sky that you protected, even if only for a moment. I was prepared for only one reason. That's right. This is just my self-satisfaction. You sacrificed your self-satisfaction to open the gate, so I'm letting you live in my self-satisfaction too. I breathed and shouted without the slightest hesitation. Soul scale. The magi that covered the sky slowly disappeared, and the demons began to scatter one by one. Everyone cheered and rejoiced at the obvious evidence of victory. The Black Knight defeated the Demon King. It's humanity's victory. The expedition teams, the aristocrats, the commoners, and regardless, all hugged and cried and laughed at those who fought against the Demon King alongside each other. Blood, sweat, and dust distorted their faces. They could not believe it at all, even though it was the moment they had been waiting for. The Black Knights also looked at the sky, full of emotion. It was truly something they had done. At that moment, Rober, who was standing by Anasta's side, exclaimed in surprise. Anasta? Yes. Your face right now you're Anasta, aren't you? Anasta's face hardened. She stuttered and touched her face, and soon shone her face on the metal cane she was holding. She was back to the familiar face of April. Chapter, 168 June was far from being a bluff. She probably meant what she said about it being no big deal. In fact, while confronting the demons, the transformation magic did not dissolve. But why, of all moments, at this point when the magi disappeared? Anasta shook her head in foreboding. It wouldn't be a big deal. How hard it must have been to fight the demon king. After defeating the demon king, she ran out of magic and the spell was broken. But once it was not easy to get rid of her chills. Anasta's eyes immediately turned red and tears streamed down her face. Rober, who was unaware of the situation, was bewildered and flinched when Anasta suddenly began to cry. She tried to calm Anasta somehow. Anasta? No, why are you crying, apart from your new face? Did you think I was going to give you a hard time? Anasta shook her head. She tried to vent her anxiety. But the only thing that flowed out through the open mouth was an earnest prayer to St. Marianne. June please esteem. Marianne. 
Meyer Knox was willing to die in a dungeon if he could kill the Demon King. But when did it happen? Ever since he met June, he began to dream of a peaceful future after killing the Demon King. A peaceful world without demons, a life where he could fall in love with her, and even get married if possible. But he knew that was not an opportunity that was given to him. If that was the case, then. At the very least, he wanted to give June the future she wanted. A future of peace and honor where she would not only be in the history books, but would be treated as one of the last seven. It was heartbreaking and empty to not have confidence in that future, but. At least she, his hero, would live. That was enough for Meyer. Meyer's eyelids slowly lifted. His pupils contracted for a moment as the sun's rays pierced his eyes, but soon his golden eyes came into clear focus. Blue sky. The drooping trees. The feel of the earth on his hands. Meyer's cottony, flabby body woke up weakly to the vivid momentum of life. Your Excellency. It was a familiar voice, Axion. Meyer twisted around to face Axion, who looked at him incredulously. Around him, he could see the people who had been with him in the Demon King's palace. No way. Meyer said, his face twisting. Are you dead, too? That's not it. Axion swallowed the gloom. Yeah, it didn't seem like a hell of a place to go after death. So I'm alive. August, did he save me? But he still didn't understand. August at the time of killing Fabian didn't have the power or the ability to do that. August could save the dead, but he could not save the dead altogether. On the other hand, he certainly killed himself he never thought he could live. Ha, huh, I don't know what happened, but I guess I wasn't meant to die there. His heart was filled with joy rather than solving questions. The future with June. Happiness by her side. It was natural for him to be happy because what he had given up was once again in his hands. Meyer looked around, smiling in a way that was unlike him. By the way, everyone, what's wrong with your expression when I'm alive? What about June? Where is June? Meyer sought out the one he expected to be the first to rejoice in his return. He guessed she was angry with him for choosing to die over her objections still, when he saw that everyone eventually made it out this way, it looked like the gate had been closed properly. As Meyer looked for June, Axion's face twisted even more. Tears soon sprang to his face, which had always been calm, no matter how difficult the situation. Meyer asked, bewildered by this completely unexpected reaction. Why? What's wrong? What happened to June? Did she get hurt when she got out? His heart dropped as he spoke. Axion and the rest of the expedition stared at Meyer's side with somber faces. Meyer finally turned and looked at his side. There was June, lying still. Her black black knight's uniform was stained from the battle, but her face was as still as her words. June. Meyer rushed to grab June by the shoulders. Her body shook at Meyer's touch without any resistance. Feeling horrified with goosebumps on his skin, Meyer involuntarily gasped and pulled his hand out of June's. He felt guilty that he felt that way from June. Meyer smiled awkwardly and asked the people around him. She's tired and sleeping right now. WLA, she can. Because it was a hard battle. Then you should say yes. Why is everyone reacting like that? You scared me. Meyer smiled despondently and rebuked the others. Vice Commander. When everyone was silent, Julieta opened her mouth in a whisper. She was filled with low despair. She saved His Excellency. The gate was opened when His Excellency died. We got out safely and the Vice Commander used her magic. Meyer's face was distorted. He couldn't believe what Julieta said. She's a supportive wizard. It's ridiculous that she can save a person. Hidden I think there was hidden magic. No one knew about the soul scale, because June never mentioned it. But all magic comes at that price. You can't perform miracles beyond mana. Therefore, you could guess what the price of magic to save people was without having to listen. Sevi muttered in a hoarse voice. A long time ago. She must have been thinking about it since the days when the special unit was established. That maybe this is what would happen. 
Shortly after the memorial service for the Green Brigade, Sevi recalled what June had said to him. She said to me. Even if it looked like she was going to die, she was thinking of everyone. That she wasn't really going to die. But now he knew what that meant. That it was a lie. Sevi curled up his skinny body and moved it in a sobbing manner. The vice commander lied. Nova embraced Sevi. Nova's face was also a mess of tears. Meyer looked at the others blankly. He finally understood what the somber cries that filled their faces were for, but he could not accept it at all. It was obvious that they were joking with him. Meyer turned his gaze toward June, who was beside him. Her drooping eyelashes swayed in the wind, and her open lips almost seemed as if they would breathe out. June, get up. Don't mess with me. Meyer shook June. Her thin body shook helplessly at Meyer's touch. Her thin hands fell with a thud. His hand, which she always held firmly whenever he shook, no longer held him. Don't be ridiculous. We killed the demon king and peace came. But you're not there. I didn't want to open my eyes like this. June Carantia, what on earth are you thinking? You'll regret it. Ha! At the last moment, Meyer, who recalled the conversation he had with June, burst into laughter. Ha! The burst of laughter soon became a cry. Meyer hugged June hurriedly. If he didn't hold her in his hands like this, he thought she'd disappear any minute. Her listless body in his arms kept reminding him of the reality that she was dead. Tears streamed down Meyer's cheeks, his tears dribbled down June's face. Unlike in legendary stories, tears did not work any miracles. June's voice was ringing in his ears. That's what June said when she came to visit him in the dungeon alone. He did not deny the words. She liked Meyer. He acknowledged that fact. But on the other hand, no matter how much she liked him, he didn't think she liked him as much as he liked her. He thought that June would live happily until the end, even if Meyer himself died. Therefore, he did not want to believe this reality that she gave her life for him. Liar. It was all a lie. Chapter, 169 The soul scale is a resurrection spell that summons the souls of the dead in exchange for one's own soul. Since the soul is the master, it was impossible to play tricks such as using someone else as a substitute such as with holy devotion. If that trick was possible, it would be overbalanced. I smirked. But why am I thinking this nonsense now? I used the soul scale, so surely I should have died. But no matter how much I thought about it, I didn't feel dead. I woke up quietly and sat up. For the first time in my life, I was welcomed by a space I had never seen before. A huge hall that shone transparently as if it were made of carved gemstones. I couldn't remember why I was here, or anything after using the soul scale. Is it the underworld it's too holy to be true? I looked at the situation calmly. I was transmigrated into a game and lived through the second round, and there was no surprise that I came into the world after I died. I sat up and looked around. I thought I was seeing the landscape for the first time, but I also felt a sense of déjà vu somehow, as if I had seen it once before. The main building of the Demon King's Castle Unlike the Demon King's Castle, which was made of black, shiny obsidian, this place was made of gemstones that reflected transparently. Except for that, they looked exactly alike, as if they were two sides of a mirror. The atmosphere was so heavenly that I could not recognize it at a glance. But a slightly older sense of déjà vu pinched me. No, I think I've seen it before oh. I remembered it belatedly. When Holy Demon War started, the background screen of the opening scene, in which Saint Marianne was talking to herself, looked exactly like this. At that time, someone called out to me. You woke up. Hero of another world. It wasn't so much that I heard voices, but more that some wavelength was transmitted to me. I turned my back toward the place where I heard the sound. A pure white, luminous presence suddenly sprang up in the empty space and looked at me. Saint Marianne. Yes. You recognize me. Saint Marianne smiled softly as she said this. If the demon king was a dark being with despair in his heart, she was a pure white being with a halo behind her. Thank you for saving this world, hero. 
St. Marianne bowed towards me. Her hair cascaded forward like a veil of white foam from a waterfall. I shook my hand in a hurry in embarrassment. I haven't done much a hero, I didn't do anything to be called that. No, I'm sorry and worried about dropping you into this world without any explanation, but you've done better than I expected. Thanks to you, peace has come to the continent. So it's natural for me to thank you. Wait don't tell me, wasn't it a coincidence that I came here? I asked, perplexed. St. Marianne blinked lazily. Her blue eyes, clear ones in her white face that shone so brightly I couldn't even see the shadows, stared at me. It might be a long story, but will you listen to it? As long as it's alright for me to hear. You are overflowing with qualifications. St. Marianne waved her hand. Tables and chairs rose from the floor under her beckons. St. Marianne said as she sat in a chair. The game you played was the world's potential. Then I didn't come into the game, a world that existed in the first place was turned into a game well, that's what you mean. Yes, that's right. St. Marianne nodded slowly. The Holy Demon War was a kind of selection process that was the job of the god of the world you lived in. Trying to discover who had the qualities of a hero it was the last hope in this world. Before I knew it, there was the package of Holy Demon War that I had played on the table. She swept the package with her birch branch-like hands. When the package became a beautiful particle of light, it solidified into a round sphere in the air. It was the Earth. This game it was the aggregate of the most possible future. We ran tens or hundreds of millions of simulations with your help to see how we could defeat the Demon King. Because, unlike the game, we only had one chance in this world. The earth began to glow sporadically. Soon the round light dissipated. If the game was actually a reflection of this world. I asked what I was curious about. I understand. But did the main character of the game have to be Fabian? I defeated the demon king together with Meyer. When I mentioned Fabian, a vague smile came to St. Marianne's lips. The results you produced were something I never would have thought possible. And Fabian Ignis was he was certainly the one who came closest to being a hero. She sighed softly. Her breath sank like a thick fog. Meyer Knox was selected for the role of defeating the Demon King in the first round, and it was Fabian who was easily eliminated. Pardon. But. I furrowed my brow. Not the second round but the first round. Fabian was definitely chosen in the first round. St. Marianne smiled quietly as if she were looking into my feelings. Her subsequent words made my head curl like ripples spreading in the still water. In this world that you know is the second round, it's the third round. The Demon King, who was defeated a thousand years ago in the Holy Demon War, planted a nucleus in the Knox family, stockpiled his strength, and sought the opportunity to continue to make a comeback. Then the time came. The dungeon was opened, and the humans formed an expeditionary force to try to stop the Demon King. At the end, Meyer Knox and the Black Knights were chosen as the last expedition. There was no stronger man, no more powerful demon. He was the hope of mankind. But it was in vain. All attacks of Meyer Knox were ineffective against the Demon King, who absorbed Meyer Knox, his core, and became even more powerful. Thus, the human race was annihilated and the human world was contaminated to the point of being like the demon world and fell into the demon king's hands. Saint Marianne, unable to interfere directly with the human world, had no choice but to sit back and watch. However, both the demon king and Esti. Marianne were kept in balance by the presence of humans. Ironically, once the humans were gone, the inhibitions holding her back disappeared. Now able to interfere with the world, she changed the world's timeline. However, her authority did not allow her to turn time too far back. Her limit was a few years before the opening of the Demon King Gate. When she turned back time, the humans also came back to life. So she could no longer interfere again. Just turning the time back would not do anything. It was just stepping on the same steps as the first round. Moreover, the Demon King, the counterpart of St. Marianne, would have a memory of time being turned. 
This time, she was going to try to protect herself from turning back time twice by leaving a few humans behind to maintain her interference. That was a problem. This was the only chance. But all Saint Marianne could do was give human talent to the human race. Even that had its limits in terms of what each human could accept. It was possible to foresee the future and warn humans, but only for an extremely short, fleeting moment. No further intervention was possible. It was not possible to prevent the demon king simply by informing them of a fragmented future. But. The story would be different if it was not her world, but an existence in another world. So she asked the god of the other world to give her information about her world. The god of the other world processed the information in a way most accessible to humans. That was exactly what the game Holy Demon War was about. You need a main character in the game. Who should it be? Specify the most likely person you see. Saint Marianne pondered for a moment when asked by the god of the world. But it didn't take long. Let's go with Fabian Ignis. Fabian, who competed with Meyer in the first round until the last moment, would be a worthy protagonist. He was not perfect, but he was the most likely one, as the god of the other world said. Thus, the arc of Saint Marianne's wish was passed on to the people of the other world. Saint Marianne saw numerous possibilities. Countless possibilities she had never thought of were smoldering among the people of the other world. Among them, there was a person who cleared the game with a character that everyone thought was impossible to the point of obsession. That was the possibility that June, Saint. Marianne discovered beyond the dimension. But before I can bring you into this world, you die in an accident, of all things. That's right. Memories started popping up. Up to that point, I had lived by the belief that the specs of a game character were the size of my affections, but the moment I saw June, I blossomed as I was. The fact that June was a supportive wizard who was as good as a dummy was no longer important. I raised June with great enthusiasm. A support wizard can do it too. The belief that the production team would never create a completely useless class let me have better items and equipment than the main character Fabian. Of course, I was not the only one who raised June. Besides me, there were often perverted players who raised June. The fact that June was the only supportive wizard made everyone raise her with the feeling isn't she a hidden character. However, they all had no choice but to remove her at the boss battle gate, where the difficulty level skyrocketed. I was the only one who took June to the gate before the boss. I even felt a strange sense of pride that there would be no player who liked June as much as I did. How difficult a character June was to use was also evident in the numerous letters of attack. If the characters were not resigned to death, they could usually see the first ending at level 60. And the second ending at level 70. However, in the midst of that, there were many labor class players. In Holy Demon War, when you reach the max level, you learn a special skill called the ultimate skill, and the list of ultimate skill was written in the attack form. Naturally, June's ultimate column was empty. No one had raised June to level 99. It was me who did. Chapter, 170 What a joy it was when June got to level 99 and learned the ultimate skill. Taking June, who was a supportive wizard, to level 99 was different in difficulty than taking the other characters to level 99, but once June learned the ultimate skill, it all felt like a reward. June's ultimate skill was the soul scale. In short, it was a skill that allowed her to sacrifice herself to keep dead characters alive. It was surprising that supportive wizard June could have a healing type ultimate skill that not even the priest character had. It was also a little disappointing that I would never use it, as June's life was the price to pay. However, in a game where resurrection itself was impossible, June's ultimate technique might receive a very high rating. I was quite satisfied when I thought of it that way. June may be re-evaluated with this ultimate skill. It's not bad if you raise her, at least. I was swelled up by a dream. Of course, it was only my own idea. After June's skill was known, June was even more beaten. Did you see June's ultimate skill? There's someone who reached the highest level with June. Spare your time. What kind of priest skill is support? Isn't this a lie? I don't think it's a fraud because the person who posted it is the famous Junchin. 
that person who cleared the Demon King in the second round with June in it? You have to admit that's about as good as it gets, even if it is a concept. In order to try that out, making June full level, the main character will die several times. If you use that, you'll be out lolololol. The problem is that the ultimate technique is a skill, not an item. In Holy War, skills can only be used in the battle window, so you have to include June in the party members. In that case, it's better to just put on another priest with good healing power. On the day I heard the harsh criticism of June, I drank with my game friend. The drink went down smoothly and well. I didn't drink and scream straight into my esophagus. No, June is not that useless. Hey, to get the ultimate technique, you have to grow up to level 99. Does it make sense to kill a kid who you raised like that by using that to save another one? Are you going to use that skill? No, I can never use it. I lingered over my friend's reasoned reply without a shred of empathy. I had nothing to say, so I drank. One drink turned into a bottle, and one bottle turned into two in a matter of seconds. Thus, on the way home from the drinking party, something unexpected suddenly happened. It was a car rushing toward the sidewalk where we were staggering. The car was not stationary, perhaps because they were driving drunk, and my friend, with their back to the car, did not notice the car's approach. At that moment, my head, which was fuzzy from alcohol, swelled up with just the thought of having to save my friend who was the victim of my drunkenness. As much as my heart wanted to throw myself to the side with my friend in my arms, my body, which was soaked in alcohol, did not move as I wanted. Damn it. It was best to push my friend to the side as far as possible. And. Kayak. My friend's cry filled my ears. My body on the floor didn't budge, and my head was hazy. Oh, I must have been hit by a car. Maybe because I was drunk, the pain came late. I wanted to scream in pain, but no sound came out of my mouth. My friend held my name. The sirens were mingled with the swaying scenery. It's noisy. The sound spread and made it even more chaotic. In the midst of such confusion, I heard a clear voice as if someone had whispered in my ear. Soul scale. Everything remembered, everything understood. How I was possessed. Why did I have an ultimate skill that didn't fit my level at the time I was possessed? My cheeks were damp. I raised my head and asked ST. Marianne. June saved me. ST. Marianne nodded slowly. When you died, I was very perplexed. Because I don't have the power to save people. ST. Marianne's hand swept off the table once again. Two figures appeared on the table, like marble dolls. One was Sti. Marianne, and the other was wearing a long robe, so I didn't know who it was. That's why I asked the god of your world. However, there was also a prohibition on him. Ah, the one wearing a robe was the god of the earth. I thought it would be Jesus or Buddha. Soon the god of the earth began to speak. St. Marianne begged earnestly, but the earth god shook his head resolutely. It was like watching a puppet show. I was not even aware that they were talking about me. I was just an onlooker, receiving the information as it came to me in a blur. Your words made me realize. It was impossible, but there is someone in my world who was capable of bringing you to life. Another person on the table was formed. They looked more familiar than anyone else in this world, but the expression they were making was unfamiliar. I looked at the little figure with dark eyes. Ironically, it was you who made her known to me. The real June Carantia observed her surroundings carefully, like a kitten looking at things. She was immediately startled and shrugged her shoulders and leaned back. It was as if someone had raised their hand to her. It was just a projection by Saint Marianne, but as I knew about her family relationships, I felt a twinge in one corner of my chest. At first I did not know about her existence. Because just because it's me doesn't mean I know about all human possibilities. You have to watch carefully to peek under the quiet surface to know. One or two ultimate skills filled in the form. June's ultimate technique that no one had put in. It was me who filled it. Thanks to you I have discovered the potential of June Carantia. And most of my power is sealed, but I still have the power to raise talents. 
ST. Marianne's figure approached June's crouching figure. June was surprised by the appearance of ST. Marianne. I saw ST. Marianne explaining something to June. June was conflicted for a moment, but nodded quickly. ST. Marianne's hand touched June's forehead as she stretched forward, bending at the waist in a compassionate manner. A blessing fell like a drop of water on her forehead, and soon she was covered with a bright light. Then June used her magic. Soul scale. Soon June's body collapsed to the floor. I stared at her fallen form as if she had been nailed to the floor. I finally understood how June, who was at the twentieth level at the time of my possession, had the skill of weighing souls. How how could that be? I mumbled. I loved Meyer Knox and sacrificed for him. But why June? To protect this world? Just because such a family is also family, and she was worried about them dying in a world of destruction? But who understands? Everyone just despised her as a supportive wizard. I was frustrated and shouted loudly. It was a sacrifice that even I wouldn't have known if I hadn't died and met Saint Marianne. Once I realized this, I could not contain my anger. St. Marianne stared at me. It wasn't until my anger had died down for a long time that she slowly spoke. The original June was thankful for you. Me? What did I do? You're the first person to acknowledge her. I blinked lazily. The voice coming out of St. Marianne's mouth sounded like June. And you're the only one who saw a support wizard's value. No, I didn't mean that much I just. She said she would gladly sacrifice herself for you. I put my face in my hand. It wasn't the world that June was trying to save, it wasn't her family. It was me. June was sacrificing for me. No matter how much I liked June, it was just an affection for the character. I think it was proof that she hadn't received that much affection, so I had no choice but to shed tears of regret, guilt and pity for June for a long time. Are you calm now? Yes, thank you. I sobbed and wiped my tears. Even in my dead state, tears, a runny nose, and a hoarse voice were still present when I cried. St. Marianne added with a slight smile. But don't worry too much. June is doing well. Pardon. June used soul scale, and you survived. Now I can bring her to this world, but it was only the soul. Don't tell me. Yes. Your soul entered the body of dead June and the god of your world, who was saddened by June's willingness to sacrifice for the world, took her soul and placed it in your body just before her soul went to the yoke of reincarnation. Chapter, 171 It was something he could do with his power. St. Marianne gave a little cry. June's figure soon changed to my original face. I was sitting on a hospital bed. Mom and Dad hugged my figure tightly. My friend who had been drinking with me came running as if they had heard the news late. Every time they sat on the floor after drinking, they became an adult and said what it was, and when they made eye contact with me, they cried like a child. Everyone thinks you have amnesia. But they're grateful enough for you to have been brought back to life. That's a relief. I swept my face with my hands several times. My fingertips were stained damp, but a smile of relief spread through the corners of my mouth. So far, I've tried my hardest to ignore it in order to survive and somehow rush to see the true ending but. I would be lying if I didn't care about the parents I left behind. They loved me as much as I loved them, and they will love June too. June is a good girl and will be a good daughter to her parents. It would be much better than if their daughter had died first. I realized this and asked Esti. Marianne. Can you say something to June? I'll try. St. Marianne nodded. With a small sigh, I expressed one thought after another that popped up in my head. Thank you for saving me. Thanks to your ability as a supportive wizard, we defeated the Demon King and I'll be living here as June too. You too can live there as long as you want. I'll leave it up to you now. I smiled with a much more relieved heart. When I asked St. Marianne for the general inside story, I finally understood the meaningful words left by the Demon King. 
like Meyer Knox again, or that it was not their first meeting. I sighed softly and wept. In first round. No, I mean the second round. You can say it in your own way. St. Marianne said. I remembered the second round for her, but the first round for me. I buried it in my memory as if it were a long time ago, but when I tried to think of it, I could remember it vividly like it was yesterday. As we proceeded with the first round inwardly, I was worried that what if I didn't remember the first round the second time around. Fabian and Meyer were the only ones who had memories of the first round in the game. Apart from the peculiarity of my being a possessor, it was also possible to lose all these memories over the second round. I couldn't sleep well at night thinking about it. So I did everything in my power to see the end of the first round as much as possible. I even tried to kill Meyer it all failed. I pretended to be calm, but I woke up in the second round after defeating the Demon King and cried so much that I was relieved that I had a memory. I was able to remember all that even though I went back is it because of your protection. Yes, that's right. Of course there is the inevitable. The inevitable. Meyer Knox is the nucleus of the Demon King, so he is not affected by the regression, but Fabian and you are not. I tried to preserve the memory of you and Fabian because I was expecting you two to work together to defeat the Demon King. Then. Yes. There was a little gap in Fabian, and the Demon King noticed it and planted another nucleus. Unlike the one he planted in Grand Duke Knox, it was very weak, but it was it was enough to transform Fabian. It was as I had guessed. That would have made Fabian, who stabbed the Demon King, the Demon King. But he wasn't as strong as Meyer, so he probably crumbled faster than I thought. It was no coincidence that Fabian came to visit you in the first round. I gave him a revelation to choose the dungeon you are in. Because that level of ability remained. No wonder. I thought the regression and memories were somewhat insufficient grounds for Fabian to be convinced that he was the chosen one. I think he had met St. Marianne in person enough to be sure. In doing so, though, he was buried in a false belief. But the second round, no matter how much I tried to make a revelation, it was impossible. The nucleus of the Demon King blocked my revelation, and my interference was denied. So from the second round, Fabian fell into a path of self-destruction. The revelation of Esti. Marianne, which was heard, was not heard, and the thought was not solved. The greater the anomaly to begin with, the greater the disappointment when it was not reached. I wish I had known in advance that Fabian was not the hero and that I was the crux of all this. Then I would have found a better way than I have now. I couldn't help but mumble, knowing that I was late, even though I was sorry. You could have told me about this situation in the beginning. You are an otherworldly soul, so there are limits to what I can interfere with. I can say this with you now because your soul straddles the circle of samsara just before it moves into it. Oh, my. Then so be it. It couldn't have been that easy to solve. Thanks to the kind Saint Marianne, everything that had been bothering me had been resolved. I sighed and leaned back against the back of my chair. But, well it's refreshing to get to know the truth before you die. Is this what the Holy Buddha is all about Meyer was always on my mind, but there was nothing I could do about it now that I was dead. Shall I ask Esti? Marianne to pass on a will to Meyer? I have already asked her to give June a message, and while we're at it, I can get another person. When I was about to take my chance, St. Marianne smiled softly and said. You're not dead yet. But now you say I am just before I move to the circle of reincarnation. I have already used the ultimate technique. At that moment, my body began to glow white. Puzzled by the sudden situation, I flapped my arms and legs, but felt nothing. It was as if I had lost my limbs. Beyond the piercing light in my eyes, St. Marianne added with a vague smile. Just before you completely died, I held you for a while. Anyway, you'll be back soon now the time is slowly running out. What are you talking about? You said you couldn't save a person with your abilities. I couldn't understand it, and I vented my doubts, but no sound came out of my mouth. It was as if the light had already eroded to the tip of my tongue. St. Marianne whispered to me in front of me as I faded away. Once again, thank you for protecting this world. 
Meyer sat still for a moment, holding June in his arms, as if his soul had been stolen. Grief hung over his shoulders. His whole life had been a waste. In his heart, he wanted to lie with June by her side. Wouldn't it be so lonely and desolate for her to walk through death alone? He wanted to go along with her and be her companion, but June's will was not so, so he was in conflict without being able to do so. He could not take away his life, which June gave her life to save, because he just did not have the right to take it away with his own hands. He wanted someone else to kill him. He wanted this life of terrible pain to end. Maya tried to rub his rough cheek against June's cheek, but he was scared that June would wear out and replaced it with a forehead-to-forehead -forehead contact. If he could breathe in to save June, he would have opened his lungs and given them to her. Axion, who couldn't bear to see Meyer like this, sank down and called out to him in a lowered voice. Now we have to return, Your Excellency. The expedition members will come to meet you soon we must send the Vice Commander June in all. Send. Who? June. Why? Meyer tightened his grip on June. No one could take June away from him. At that moment, a light suddenly struck from the sky. The light gradually grew larger and whiter and whiter. They closed their eyes and opened them to see a pure white being with hair hanging down like a veil, looking down at them in the air. Blue eyes and white eyelashes hung down like frost. A holy and intimidating presence that seemed out of this world, a figure they have seen many times through sculpted statues. The black knights looked up at her with their mouths wide open. Saint Marianne. O valiant warrior who defeated the demon king. I stand here to honor your merit. St. Marianne spread her arms and stared at Meyer. Meyer's eyes, clouded by St. Marianne's words, came into focus. This was probably the only opportunity he had been given. Meyer hurriedly crawled up to St. Marianne on his knees, bowing his head and shouting. June, please save June. Saint Marianne. Please. His head, which had never bowed in his life, touched the floor. It was an uncharacteristically desperate and servile appearance, unlike the most powerful man in the world, who would kill the demon king and become the emperor of the empire. All the other expedition members who were letting go were alert to Meyer's actions, and everyone else went on their knees and bent their heads. Please, St. Marianne. Please save the vice commander. Raise your heads, warriors. You who have saved the world need not be so polite to me. When St. Marianne pointed her hand upward, their heads raised as if someone had lifted them. I want to do your favor, but alas, it's not in my capacity. St. Marianne shook her head in confusion. I am the god of this world but I have lost my power to keep the demon king in check and am not omniscient anymore. All that remains is the power to give power to humans. Chapter, 172 But! Meyer exclaimed in despair. Not even St. Marianne could keep June alive all hope was gone. St. Marianne stared at Meyer and continued to speak quietly. So, I will raise the merit of defeating the Demon King and give you the ultimate skill early. The ultimate! Maya repeated the word ultimate skill in a whispered voice. The power of a god, obtained when one had reached the limits of the human condition and had reached the state of a demigod. It was probably the same ability that made June save him and disappear. St. Marianne spoke with a thin smile on her face as Maya repeated the words in a daze. Yes. It can give you absolute power that can split the earth or break the heavens and the earth. Meyer knocks, because your potential is that strong. Absolute power that was all Meyer could hear. The possibility that he, like June, could be given the ability to bring people to life. That made Meyer happy. Meyer hastily exclaimed. Then please give me the power to save people. Just one person, just one time. The power to save people is that strong. June Carantia also had a similar ultimate but had to pay the price. She didn't have to tell him what June paid for. Meyer Knox's heart was cut like a knife. St. Marianne continued her words matter-of-factly. Meyer Knox, you must also bet something in return for saving a person. 
then at least my soul. If only she could open her eyes and smile again, Meyer could offer anything. If his soul was not enough and he had to offer everything in the world, he would have gladly become the second demon king. St. Marianne quietly admonished Meyer, who hastily exclaimed without looking back and forth. Think about it, Meyer Knox, you have one more thing left to give besides your soul. St. Marianne's fine fingertips pointed to Meyer Knox's hair. Still blackened hair. Only then did Meyer realize something else he could offer instead of his soul. Then. Meyer opened his lips. His plea, close to whispering, reached St. Marianne. St. Marianne, who heard him, nodded and asked again. Your wish, I heard it well. Do you have any regrets? I don't. Meyer answered emphatically. It was the only hope that had risen in the midst of despair. He had no regrets for breathing life into the sleeping June. Meyer's golden eyes flared up. He looked at Asti. Marianne with an intensity that did not allow him to take a step back, if by any chance Asti. Marianne was biting her words. That's right. You have such determination I will give you the ultimate strength. St. Marianne reached out her hand. Light shot out from the hand that rested on Meyer's head, and soon Meyer's figure was enveloped in light. Feeling a burning ability, Meyer Knox embraced June in the bright light. Let's live together, June. Together, in a new world. St. Marianne and the Demon King were two sides of the same coin to sustain the world. Because they were both powerful beings, they were forbidden to interfere in the human world. The fact that the Demon King needed the power of the human world to use his magical powers, and that is T. Marianne only had the authority to give talents to humans were all part of that prohibition. St. Marianne was content with her role and took care of the humans, but unlike her, the Demon King swallowed the tiger's eyes to take over and wanted to hold power on his own. Don't do it, Yana. Marianne, you are too soft. What is it to have divine power? In the demon realm, being an accessory that supports this world, only passing through eternity. The demon king did not even pretend to hear Asti. Marianne's retraction. The demon king soon invaded the human world, and as such the first holy demon war took place. St. Marianne again admonished the demon king, who was defeated by the hero Giovanni. Yana, give up now. Keep the human world at peace. I can't do that. The fully wounded demon king answered Asti. Marianne over the water with a self-mockery. The demon king's black, rake-like fingertips turned to the surface, but the surface of the water simply grabbed and smeared Marianne's face. Look at this, Marianne. Look at the recent situation where you and I have been unable to cross one another's waters and finally exchange a few words. Are you happy with this situation? I can't. I don't care what the rules of the world are that keep you and me apart what's so important about humans. The demon king was furious. His red eyes shook with an unfamiliar thought. If that's the case, I'd rather. He, who had not changed his mind even after Marianne's conciliations, quietly sharpened his sword for a thousand years. The nucleus of the demon king planted in Grand Duke Knox became powerful enough to turn back time during the passage of a thousand years. Ironically, this gave Saint Marianne the power to turn back time at the opposite point of the demon king. As a result, it was possible to call in June and stop the demon king's plot, and in the end, everything was bitten. Maybe the demon king also knew this would happen. You were so stubborn are you satisfied? St. Marianne smiled a small smile. Meyer offered his magical power as a price and disappeared to the last remaining magical instrument in the world. And then. For the sake of the balance of the world, she too would be gone. Just as her body began to slowly dissipate. Like a firefly leaving one or two, St. Marianne quietly watched as the hem of her own skirt and the tips of her own hair disappeared or by or. Once she disappeared, it would no longer be possible to distribute magical talents to people. The magical blessing that had been bestowed upon the succession would not disappear immediately, but it would fade in the blood and gradually disappear. The end would remain a story in legend. But St. 
Marianne did not worry too much about the future of humanity, because when the time came, humans would also be able to stand on their own. They would do well. Wait for me, Yana. I'll be right there. St. Marianne smiled faintly with her eyes looking down, recalling the dark face that fluttered over the water. The light pierced my eyes. I squinted and quickly blinked. I finally woke up and saw Meyer Knox looking down at me against the setting sun. Joy and exultation flooded his eyes. It was the most beautiful landscape I had caught sight of since the moment I was born. To the point where my eyes stung. Meyer smiled at me and whispered softly. Welcome, my hero. I'm back. I cleared my hoarse throat and went on painfully. It was a low voice that didn't sound like mine. I don't know the exact circumstances, but I was sure that is he. Marianne had done something. I sat up in Meyer's arms and looked at him. Don't be angry that I died on my own. Angry? Even that's a luxury. Didn't you come back to me like this? That's enough. Meyer hugged me, unable to twitch his face to tears, as if he was so thrilled that I had risen. His hair hung with a silver sheen over my head. It was proof that the magi was gone. I reached out and touched his hair. It was originally this color. It was unfamiliar to me, but it also suited him well. As I stared at his head, Meyer grumbled awkwardly. If you like black hair, I'll make sure it stays dyed. It's fine. I like it because it looks like a set. I reached out and twisted my hair and his with the tip of my hand. Between the long gray locks, Meyer's hair shone like glittering gold in the sand. I wondered what point the words like a set hit in Meyer, his eyes lit up with a flash of heat. His hand covered the back of my head, and gradually the distance between our eyes began to shrink. Oh, wait a minute. It's something like. Drunk with the atmosphere, I had forgotten for a while that we were not alone here. I hurriedly tried to look sideways, but I couldn't budge at how firmly Meyer held my face. I defeated the demon king, June. Meyer rubbed his forehead on my forehead and whispered softly. The tip of his nose touched the tip of my nose. Considering how we looked in the eyes of the other expedition members, it seemed I had to push Meyer, but then I thought about it, we defeated the demon king, and we even died once each other and came back to life. Well, I was not sure what to do. Meyer stared at me and said again. So don't tell me to wait any longer. Yeah, it's time to tell the others. The ridiculous memorandum must also be fulfilled. Just as I was about to lose my reason a little under Meyer's genuine gaze, August coughed and broke in. Ahem, ahem, Your Excellency. I understand how you feel, but I think you should get your act together. Meyer didn't even listen. I thought he would care more about a dog barking behind him. But the opponent was August. He continued calmly, indifferent to Meyer's indifference. Seti says people are getting close if you two want to continue this public love affair, I don't care. Chapter, 173. T that's not yet. I came to my senses belatedly at the words public love affair, and pushed Meyer hard. He was a human being who would not have been pushed if he had remained in his original strength, but he was pushed like a fallen leaf by my hand. Meyer, who had honestly let me go, shouted loudly in frustration. What do you mean not yet? Why not? You said we could date after defeating the Demon King. The stability of the Empire comes first. I said sternly. That's right. It's still too early to relax. In fact, the perception of the surrounding area was not a particular problem. After defeating the Demon King, all that remained were administrative and political problems. It would have been more helpful for political stability if we had announced our dating sooner. But the biggest problem was that if we went straight into a romance, the reaction to the strictness of the relationship so far might be that the two of us would be close for 365 days a year alone. That's why I put Meyer on hold in the first place. That was not good enough for me, even though I still had a mountain of unresolved work to do. I have to take inertia and elasticity and get the accumulated work done while it's getting tough once anyway. I couldn't trust myself and that much more I couldn't trust Meyer, I assured myself. There's a lot to worry about and a lot to do to build a new empire. Dating after that. 
Meyer seemed to have a lot of things to refute my one-sided decision, but I didn't listen and turned my head. Then I smiled broadly and said to the other expedition members. Now, everyone. Please keep what you just saw confidential to the outside world for the moment. Perhaps I was being too brazen, the expressions of the trio, Axion, and August looking at me were unusual. Sevi asked poutingly, opening his swollen eyes in a triangle and looking up at me. Is that all you have to say for the first time since you died? She's the vice commander. Nova added with a sigh. Julieta also began to cry. Resentment dribbled down her eyes. You didn't even think about how nervous we were. I didn't expect the day to come when I sympathize with your feelings in my life. No, even August. They all attacked me with their mouths. I limped along and made excuses for my bombshell. No, I'm alive. You were dead. You lied to me. You're a liar. Sevi stomped his foot gallantly. He felt terribly angry and mad. Maybe more than Meyer. I sneaked a glance at Sevi and soothed him gently. Sevi, are you mad at me? Hmm. Because we didn't have much time to talk. Humph. I won't believe you anymore, Vice Commander. Sevi folded his arms and turned away sulking. The crime against Sevi was great. I died like that, and his childhood was damaged a lot. I, the sinner, was at a loss to calm him down. I'm sorry, so as soon as I get to the capital, I'll ask the Emperor to change your name. Gail Dest or what was it? Anyway, that. Gail Destoyer. Sevi, who had been silent for a long time, replied coyly. I was grateful for the sign of forgiveness that he had given me, so I hugged the three musketeers, including Sevi. Excuse me, Vice Commander then my title is. Nova, who had been watching my face, cautiously started to say something, but unfortunately, the words were buried and lost in the sound of the pack that came from Sevi, whom I embraced. It wasn't long before a crowd of people rushed toward us. At the very front of the line was Anasta, who had returned to April. I didn't break the transformation spell on her until the very end, but it seemed to automatically break when I died. I thought you were dead. As soon as Anasta saw me, she jumped off her horse, ran over and smoothed my face, and burst into tears. I patted her on the back, hugging Anasta who dug into my arms. I'm sorry. Were you surprised? As long as you didn't die. Seriously, how much do I? Anasta was in tears. Her blue eyes were watery as if she had cried for some time after coming this far. Behind Anasta, the trio glanced at each other. They seemed to be looking at when it would be good to say that I really died in fro. I frowned and gave a quick look to keep their mouths shut. Everyone was supposed to be busy, but for no reason, they were just confused. Anasta asked naturally. The transformation spell has been broken what do I do now? Continue to live as Anasta, or go back to April. Either way, I was going to support her opinion. Anasta shook her head slowly, wiping away tears. Just before I came here, I heard that Deca was dead. Maybe he was trying to see the end of Fabian. Anasta had no doubt that Deca and herself were responsible for Fabian's betrayal. They were the first to consider Fabian a hero, so of course, they had to solve the problem themselves to bring him out of it. Perhaps that is why. A bitter yet somehow refreshing smile appeared on her face when she heard the news of her old colleague's death. The difference between Deca and Fabian is not that big, so Fabian must be dead somewhere, too. So you don't have to change your face and avoid him anymore. I was envious of the word that Fabian did not die, but crawled to the Demon King's castle dungeon and finally became the Demon King. But even if Anasta heard it, the evaluation of Fabian, which has already hit rock bottom, will only fall further into the mud. Of course, it was none of my business what Fabian's reputation would be, but it could lead to a dislike of Anasta herself, who believed and followed such a person, even for a time. Knowing just as much as anyone else about psychology, I kept my mouth shut. Perhaps understanding my feelings, the others also refrained from talking about the specifics of what had happened in the demon world. Anasta added with a soft laugh. So I don't think I need to do any more transformation magic. But I will continue to live as Anasta. 
if Anasta's determination is like that. I nodded. After that, she would continue to live as Anasta. The name I had given her and the name she had chosen for herself. A step behind, Rober, Tragula, and the Red Wolf unit arrived. They didn't look good either. Stained with dust and blood, I could feel the traces of fierce battle. Upon discovering us, Rober's face contorted. A demon had caught her, and her left eye was long torn. The Great Raggedon. Rober cried out for her god and embraced the trio. The trio's faces turned pale with muscle strength that was incomparable to mine. W wait a minute, Rober. St. Marianne's face just glistened once again. Laughing at the children's exaggeration, she loosened her arms then, she tapped the children's shoulders with the palm of her hand and shook her head. As expected, I trusted your skills. I didn't expect everyone to come back alive like this. That sounds like the reaction of someone who didn't think we were going to come out of this alive. Sevi grumbled as he stroked his neck. Finally, Rober, who saw Sevi's face belatedly, asked in surprise. Sevi. What's wrong with your eyes? Did you cry? I didn't cry. Sevi exclaimed loudly. No matter how many flippers he held out, it was written on his face that he cried out loudly, so Rober couldn't believe it. Rober smiled widely and lightly patted Sevi on the back. You can cry on such a good day. Everyone is unscathed. Sister, I'm not unscathed. Axion, who was listening, added a word. It wasn't wrong. Since August had not been able to do healing magic after the second half of the Demon King's War, everyone has been limping or unable to do something. Rather, Meyer and I, who survived, were the most unscathed. Rober snorted at Axion as if he were making an unnecessary exaggeration. All wizards have thorns in their mouths if you don't tell them otherwise. If you have that level of energy, you're as unscathed as you can get. As long as there was healing magic, all wounds that were not so bad would be treated, so everyone could loosen up somewhat on their injuries. It was painful, though. We were genuinely happy to see each other alive, as both inside and outside the dungeon were decisive battlegrounds. Julieta lifted her wrist with a shy smile. It must be thanks to Rober's protection. Juliet's arm had a thread bracelet hanging narrowly. Dusk and bloodstained I could feel how hard it was. It's a relief that all seven of you are alive. Tragula, who had hesitated for a while, still said it. He seemed to wonder for a while whether he, who had been strangely vacillating even within the Black Knights, was allowed to say such a thing. Meyer was the first to respond to Tragula. You must have had a hard time, too. And wasn't it Meyer who didn't take kindly to Tragula? I was surprised because I didn't know he would say that, but I wasn't the only one surprised. Began whispered to me. Could it be that His Excellency died and came back to life? Why is he doing things that he usually doesn't? Chapter, 174 He really died and came back to life I don't think that's a change of person. Before returning, he was bound by, but after defeating the Demon King, he became somewhat detached. The same was true of Tragula, who heard the answer. Nothing happened. His low voice, which answered with a quick bow, still looked dazed. It was an awkward atmosphere. Ahem. So when everyone was celebrating their safe return, I coughed a little and evoked the atmosphere. It was necessary to conclude thoroughly and surely. With everyone focused, I solemnly declared the victory of mankind. The Demon King died at the hands of the Black Knight Meyer Knox. The Demon King who has terrorized mankind for the past thousand years no longer exists. From now on, the Demon World will never again threaten mankind. The expedition members who accompanied me to the battle against the Demon King, and the Black Knights who were guarding the capital. Despite the fact that everyone was surely familiar with the contents of this speech, as soon as my assurances were gone, all those in the positions cheered. Finally, and now. It was the moment of true liberation for which I had waited so long. Victory Day. There could have been festivities day and night for three days in the excitement, but everyone had exhausted their strength to the bottom and had no time to do anything. All the expedition members who returned to the Imperial Palace collapsed and buried themselves in their beds to relieve their fatigue. 
There were those who could not rest even in such a situation, and they were the very priests. The demons retreated and the demon king disappeared, but a mountain of wounded remained. As soon as they recovered even a little, they went from place to place to treat the wounded, but even though they were busy, everyone had a smile on their lips. After a day's rest like that, everyone was fine. The expedition members, who were well resilient and monstrous, wandered about in search of a drinking table as soon as they woke up, and the emperor, who had come to know more about the habits of such expeditions than anyone else over the past seventeen years, had already been preparing a bar for the heroes of the reversal since daybreak. Most of the banquets were clearly seen rehashing the things used at the previous and performance report banquets, but I thought, well, what the heck. Because now the fact that the place was laid out was more important than the details of the place. At the banquet for the performance report, everyone was dressed for the banquet, but now at the victory banquet, everyone was dressed in armor and wizard's clothes, as if they were expedition members. As if reminiscing about the last moments as an expedition. Hey, I won't even look at this full-length sheet metal armor for a while. And then as soon as you go home, you're going to polish it so it's shiny. How do you know so well? I've been with you for years. Their giggles and happy voices filled the banquet hall. Everyone seemed uniformly refreshed. Of course, that didn't mean we could just enjoy the banquet without thinking about it. It was because a change of regime was at hand. They had been trying hard to look good to the Black Knights in the past, and now they were even more desperate. Oh, thank you for defeating the Demon King, Vice Commander. No, Your Excellency the Grand Duke. I did what I had to do for humanity. I shook my glass, heeding their eulogies. The taste of alcohol after death was especially special. I wondered if they were offering alcohol on the ritual table for this taste. I said, staring at the amber-colored alcohol. By the way, calling me Grand Duke is a bit big. It's just a matter of time anyway. I think you will be the Grand Duke soon. I haven't been awarded a title yet. The question of timing is important. The middle-aged expedition leader, who was somehow eager to buy my amusement at my dry response, stomped on the ground. Seeing her laugh awkwardly, I downed my drink. At that moment, as soon as my cup was empty, a young, crisp man quickly poured me a drink. My glass was so cheap and natural that I was embarrassed to stop him from doing it. The man laughed shyly, clutching his liquor bottle. I smiled awkwardly and lifted my glass lightly. Thank you for the drink. No, I am happy to serve the vice commander's drink. I smiled at that, but it was so blatant that even I, unaware of what such behavior implies, noticed it. There were so many things. As expected, I can't stand it here. I left my position quickly, leaving only one word. I'm suddenly reminded of something to do. Then, bye. W. Wait, Vice Commander. It was fortunate that Meyer didn't see this because he was meeting the Emperor just in time. Meyer gets rather jealous, so that might make the banquet hall look like a dungeon. Maybe they all knew Meyer was gone and they all jumped on me like leeches like this. I didn't disclose my relationship with Meyer, but it seemed as if everyone noticed by implication. Indeed, he made that mess at the trial of Countess Nearest. Thinking about it that way, I also thought that the spirit of the expeditionary crew, who were able to drink alcohol, was great. I struggled to move forward, beating out those who tried to say a word. Everyone in the banquet hall talked about the last seven members of the Black Knights. Some people reasoned about Meyer's sudden change of hair color. I think he must have used too much energy in the Demon King battle and his hair has gone completely white. I think it's more like silver than white that's certainly the same old-fashioned way he was in the days of the previous Grand Duke. Since the Black Knights did not disclose the exact reason, everyone wrote novels. Of course, reality was more than fiction, and fortunately no one thought Meyer's hair color was magi. Tired of people approaching me, I looked around with the feeling that if I stayed with the other Black Knights, the approaching would be a little less frequent. In the distance, I could see the Red Wolf unit surrounding Sevi and the special unit. Looking particularly amicable and noisy, I approached with a quick foot, with the intention of sneaking in. Sevi's voice, which was not heard well in the distance because of other people's voices, could be heard clearly as I got closer. While even in front of the Demon King, she swore and argued. 
The vice commander is quite capable of it. That's what I'm saying. And then she said, I'm not sure if it's tea. Marianne would have chosen me, I chose Meyer Knox. Wow that's the spirit of the vice commander of the Black Knights. Hmm, still no good over there. I put my body back where it was going. Behind me, I could hear Sevi talking about a saga in front of the Red Wolf unit and the rest of the crowd. I saved Axion. Really? How? We were in the dungeon and Axion got surprise attacked by a demon. Wow, what a shame. I shouldn't let him say that he's the commander of our Red Wolf unit. Began giggled and raised the board. I shook my head and slowly moved away from it. So, where is Axion, the protagonist of those words? As soon as I looked around, I saw him sitting in a circle far away, among the wizards, immersed in the study of magic as always. I could not help but laugh at the sight of the discussion while laying out side dishes on the floor of the banquet hall. They're just joking around with food. Oh, I can't believe you could use that kind of magic. The theme of the seminar was August's protective shield in the dungeon and exploding Meyer's holy power. I need to do a lot of research besides increasing mana to make it more efficient than the existing mana. Since it is impossible to level up from now on, I think it would be desirable for us wizards to pursue greater efficiency in order to survive on a limited level and with limited magical power. I didn't want to be involved in any other way. Eventually, I took a sneak out onto the balcony. Oh, August. I blinked in surprise. I didn't expect him to be in the banquet hall, always absent from the banquet and offering prayers. I didn't expect you to be here. I didn't think I'd be here either. August murmured so bluntly, gazing silently over the balcony window, into the noisy banquet hall. He wept silently with downcast eyes. It doesn't feel real to be in the prayer room. I think that's why they're all gathered in the banquet hall. I laughed a little. Everyone acted more boisterously than usual, perhaps because they wanted to feel that their tediously tenacious battle with the demons was finally over and that they had indeed survived. I was glad to see August on the fold. I sneakily brought up a question I had been putting off. Right, August. There's one thing I'm curious about. How His Excellency saved Sister. How did you know? That's perfect. Surprised, I rolled my tongue with admiration. Wow, it seems like you really use the interest method in these situations. You have to polish something, whether it's holy or moral. If you dare to ask me, it would be about things that you cannot ask His Excellency. August added as if it were obvious. He sighed softly and told me gradually about the situation after my death. Chapter, 175 I silently listened to August's words. And I learned something that I never would have known had I not listened. I had no idea that Meyer had given magical power as a price to save me. The scale would have pointed to the horizontal only if I had raised my soul as consideration, but since the size of Meyer's original magical power was enormous, it seemed that he was able to weigh the scales with his magical power alone. Meyer is so strong that there is no one to take him on without magical power, but who would wish for their power to weaken? It would have been a shame about that tremendous magical power. I just sighed. Thank you for letting me know, August. The commander always keeps this kind of thing a secret from me. It's no problem. August shook his head. He was as aloof as the man who knew I'd ask this question in the first place. Come to think of it, August must have met St. Marianne I asked carefully, looking at August's appearance. August also devoted himself to St. Marianne but weren't you sad that there was no reward for you? Those who worship God in anticipation of reward are not qualified as priests. He was more determined than I thought. August gathered his hands so solemnly that I felt embarrassed. Just the fact that I was able to meet Esti. Marianne in person and witness a miracle is inspiring to me. August's gaze swung under his short lashes that had landed. That was not even a slight exaggeration, he was 200% serious. Even after a long time together, I rarely got used to such a fanatic aspect. A little freaked out, I laughed awkwardly. Priest August. Where are you? I heard strange voices in the banquet hall. It sounded like a group of healers. August gave a small sigh, 
as if to say that his spare time was over for a while. Then he bowed to me to leave. Then I'll leave. Yes. Have a nice evening. He left for a while and I was left alone on the balcony. This isn't bad either. I winded quietly alone, listening to the voices and orchestral sounds of the banquet hall leaking through the glass door, and the sound of grass and insects over the balcony as my friends. How long had it been that long? Not too long, I heard a voice searching for me. June. Where are you? I'm here. I answered half-heartedly. It wasn't that loud, but as soon as I said it, Meyer noticed where I was and ran like wildfire. August left and the deserted balcony slept tight into Meyer's huge size again. Meyer's face showed his sinking feelings. I thought I told you to tell me when you were going somewhere. I'm in the banquet hall. But I was surprised. Meyer's chest went up and down a lot. I wondered if it was such a surprise, but it was hard for me to say anything because my death caused the anxiety of separation. I'm not leaving now. I know. Even as he said this, his hand was shaking lightly as he held mine. I hugged Meyer. I could hear his rough breathing and his heart beating particularly loudly. That's what I keep thinking. What do you keep thinking? What if you use the ultimate weapon again? While Meyer's ultimate weapon could not be used again as it permanently removed mana, I revived and restored my soul, so I had another chance. I won't use it, I won't use it. I don't want to sacrifice myself twice. Never use it. No matter who dies. Meyer looked scared and anxious. I calmed him down by slowly patting his back. He dug into my arms like a huge, ravenous beast that thought it was young. In the meantime, I staggered to my feet and leaned my hips against the balcony railing, and he, helpless, immediately went to his knees and clung to my waist. As if he were pleading with me. In the darkness, Meyer's silver hair shone in the light. I swept his hair gently. His hair, like silver threads, fell apart through my fingers. Meyer, who loved the way I touched his hair, looked up at me, blinking slowly. His golden eyes rose with heat like bronze on fire. June. Meyer's voice calling me was hoarse. What he was craving was clear on his face without daring to ask. How could such a large man just look dangerous and pitiful? I can see that the love was firmly stuck in his eyes. I think I will have to stay by his side for a while after Meyer becomes emperor. When push comes to shove, the Grand Duke has to save the people he leaves in his stead. I sighed softly and bowed my head over his face. Vince, steward of the Grand Duchy of Nocantoria. I greet the hero. What do you mean a hero? Relax, Vince. I waved my hand. About a month after defeating the Demon King. Vince came up to the capital in person, as we were too busy working on the cleanup of the Demon King and the new empire that was to be built afterward to go directly to Nocantoria Castle. Vince's eyes were shaken with emotion and joy. Vince pressed his tears with a handkerchief and murmured. You're a hero. Not only did you defeat the Demon King, but you also brought His Excellency. I've heard the story. I caught a glimpse of Meyer, who naturally sat beside me. Although he kept it a secret from most of his surroundings, Meyer seems to have told Vince the truth as he was Meyer's only guardian. Meyer turned his head in spite of himself. I told you to bring his excellency in somehow, but that did not mean that the vice commander would be sacrificed. How surprised this old man was to hear the story. Ha! Huh. I smiled shyly. I didn't particularly think of it as a sacrifice. Besides, I had forgotten all about Vince's words at the time I used the soul scale, so hearing his baptism of praise made my ass tremble. Vince's gaze went to Meyer's silver-tinted hair. He continued his story with frustrated, angry vigor. Thus, even though he looks just like the Grand Duke of the previous generation when I think of the fact that his eminence, the legitimate lineage, was tormented by such rumors, I am filled with anger. Vince. Meyer said a few words as if the topic about his father wasn't too sweet. Vince was so surprised by that that he covered his mouth. Egu, I'm old, I'm a fool. I'd spewed a lot of nonsense. I would have been waiting for you anyway. Vince immediately interrupted and clapped his hands. As soon as he did so, 
he took a boy to the drawing room. It was Eugene, the brother I sent to Nocantoria. Well, then, I'll let you talk. I'll be out for a while. Vince came out with the servants, and only the timid Eugene remained in the drawing room. Eugene was sitting side by side on the couch, much larger than when I had last seen him. But he was not a familiar face. I had seen him once at the time of the first round, and he had glanced at Meyer while he was fidgeting in front of me. He couldn't even look at him openly and just looked at his knee area. It was more difficult not to notice his blatant fear. Meyer leaned back on the back of the couch, half raised his body, and said. Shall I go out, too? It doesn't matter if you stay. I said I was fine with it. I didn't mean to talk about secrets, and considering the words Nova had passed on to me, I thought it would be easier to talk if Meyer was there. Since Fabian had lured me, almost a month had passed in defeating the Demon King's castle dungeon, and then another month had passed. I had an honest meeting to see how much Eugene had changed in two short months. Still, you never know what people are like. Sure enough, Eugene was very quiet during that time, no matter what Vince did. Eugene hesitated and said first. I'm glad you came back safely, sister. I'm glad you're safe, too. I'm sorry I got caught up in my work. No, if I hadn't been on board with the idea of making an expeditionary team from the beginning, mother and father wouldn't have been taken advantage of so much. Eugene muttered. I laughed softly. If Eugene had not been kidnapped, they would have been persuaded by money. Well, that doesn't matter because it worked out. Calling Eugene wasn't to pick up what happened then and get an apology. For what it's worth, he was a twelve-year-old brother. There is a difference of almost fourteen years. Eugene's advancement was one of the things that had to be dealt with beforehand before I received the Grand Dukedom. That is why he was called all the way from Nocantoria. But is Eugene really remorseful and crippled at heart, or does he want to look good as a Grand Duke, or is he just trying to kiss up to Meyer he continued his words. I I misunderstood sister, so I made a mistake with sister's colleague. I don't know if you've heard of it, but I'm sorry. Really? I'm sorry. I didn't know anything because I only listened to mom and dad. Working in the Grand Duke's castle only then did I realize how hard it must have been for you, sister I'm so sorry. Eugene bowed his head repeatedly. I could see him not knowing what to do. Twelve is young, but not so young at the same time. You should develop your own judgment, not just listen to your parents. I said so with my mouth, but the truth is that it was not easy for a child to grow up well on his own, as his parents were saying things at home. Even if twelve years old is not just a young age in this world, as someone who has memories of this whole world, I just couldn't give Eugene a single shot to take responsibility for his own statements alone. With a small sigh, I brought up what I had thought earlier. Eugene, you have two options. Chapter, 176 Eugene blinked. I held up my right index finger and continued calmly. One is to be insulated from my parents and live as my brother, the Grand Duke. The word insulation left Eugene's face brooding. For a twelve-year-old child, the word insulation would be like a shock to the sky, but it couldn't be helped. Because I didn't want to get involved with any of those parents. His parents had remained in the dungeons of the Imperial Palace since they helped Fabian. It was a pity that even during the war against the demons, they survived far away thanks to the proper meals as my parents. They must be very excited to hear that I will soon be a Grand Duke. The attempt to sell me out to Fabian is probably long since forgotten in my memory. That's how thick-skinned they were. The fact that I didn't kill them and lose them was a final courtesy to June. But that didn't mean I had any intention of being great by providing for those parents. I said, linking my middle finger after my index finger. The other is to follow your parents and never use my name again. Because I will disassociate myself from Carantia. Naturally, there will be no supper after I become Grand Duke. Eugene became even more serious. The education he would have received if he had been a Grand Duke, and his incorporation into the aristocratic world. No matter how much his parents rode on the other side of the scale, it would not be easy for him to give up all of his gains. I could fully understand why Eugene was struggling. It was too tremendous an opportunity to point the finger at him as filial or worldly. 
And since the person who handed over all of it and set the terms was not a stranger, but his half-sister, he should have had relatively few pangs of conscience. Eugene, who had been struggling for some time, finally opened his mouth, wriggling his fingers. I know my parents did bad things to you, sister but they took very good care of me. I can't abandon them. Eugene's decision was unexpected. I opened my eyes round, and then nodded. Yes, if that's your choice. I didn't catch Eugene twice. Eugene also didn't seem to want to change his decision just because I caught him. Follow Vince. I'll give you a place to stay in the capital for a while. I'm so sorry, sister. Did he realize that this is our last time? Eugene left the drawing room, adding lastly. Eugene left and Vince came back into the drawing room. I spoke to Vince. Then as I said before. Understood. After Vince, only Meyer and I were left in the drawing room again. I sighed deeply and leaned my head against the back of the sofa. Does it bother you? It would be a lie if it didn't bother me. I smiled bitterly. If I stayed the course of my life, my father and stepmother would surely bring Eugene to the forefront again to visit me. It wasn't something young Eugene could stop just because he didn't like it. Therefore, there was a limit to attaching surveillance so that the father and stepmother did not think in vain. Besides, I didn't want to waste human resources. So I chose to use the very mental magician Pedica to manipulate the memories of my parents and Eugene. Forget the fact that they have a child, and that he has a sister. Then forget that I exist, so that my stepmother, father, and Eugene can live together. Their brainwashing will probably never be broken. To break their brainwashing, they need a healing mage with more holy power than that magical attack power. No matter how low Pedica was due to magical attack power, he was level 50. Only a very few people started higher than that, including August and April. I mumbled to myself. I don't know. Is this the right choice or not? Apparently, I was even more concerned because they were not my family. I have some serious concerns of my own, but Meyer smiled at me as he did. Then he easily added that it was not his business. You always make the right choice. Except when you use the ultimate weapon to save me. How long are you going to keep bringing that up? Until I grow old and die. That way, you won't think uselessly. I'm not going to do it. I shook my head with a sigh. It felt like he was determined to tell me not to use the ultimate weapon once a day. Still, I felt much better after quarreling with Meyer. Oh, I'm tired of this kind of course. I fell flat on Meyer's thigh. His hard, thick legs fluctuated greatly. Surprised, Meyer jumped up from his seat and shouted. And no shame. Ouch. In a daze, I just stuck my head on the sofa. I rubbed my head and pouted my lips as I looked up at Meyer standing tall in front of me. What are you ashamed of? I think it's less embarrassing than looking for me while shouting at the banquet. Meyer's face flamed up. His mouth pouted several times, trying to say something, but repeatedly closing. In the end, without saying anything, he trudged to the other side of where I was sitting. Then I'll lie down. Sitting on the other side, Meyer tapped his left thigh with the palm of his hand. No, right thigh or left thigh. I didn't understand, but it was a little too much to question Meyer when he was so stubbornly silent. I surreptitiously lay down using Meyer's left thigh as a pillow. Meyer sighed. His sigh was so loud that my bangs shook. Why? Is my head heavy? It shouldn't be heavier. I wish it were heavier. It would be perfect if it were sturdier. If it's so light, why were you so surprised earlier? Meyer's mouth closed again. Okay. I just won't ask. I mumbled and popped my body around. It was an indication that I did not want to talk to Meyer. Then Meyer touched me below the ear next to my temple, where I was lying with my back to him. His long, stiff fingers brushed down my hair. My hair was unkempt from my three days in the dungeon and stretched out all over the place, but his hands were as silky and careful as if they might scratch it. It was a delicate gesture. I began to feel sleepy to be patted by him. I blinked slowly. As I fell asleep like that, Meyer asked implicitly. 
By the way if you cut ties with Carantia, will you change your last name? I was vaguely thinking, but when Meyer said it, I felt more certain. I replied with a nod. It wouldn't matter. There was no reason why I should not have to change it. I felt the way I felt when I saw Tragula and Julieta and Anasta. There is no need to be bound by the name or last name given by others. It is more important to live the life you want to live, with the name you like. I stood up and sat at an angle to Meyer. Meyer looked at me with a brooding look. I spoke in a confident tone. Please choose my last name. Me? Can I do that? Meyer asked back, puzzled. It wasn't a sign of dislike. Rather, he seemed very excited, as if he had no such honor. I tried to hold back my laughter and accept it. Of course. You'll use it with me later. When you get married, you share your last name. I shrugged my shoulders. When you get married, you have the right to inherit the title, and you share your last name. For example, when June Carantia and Meyer Knox marry, they become June Carantia Knox and Meyer Knox Carantia. There are exceptions because only surnames with titles are shared. Because at least we both have titles. No, because we would have one. Of course, I at least knew that I had talked myself out of it all of a sudden. I can't believe we would go beyond dating and suddenly get married. I wondered if Meyer's fragile sensitivity would accept this relationship that had developed all at once. Sure enough, Meyer's face turned red beyond compare to when I had just laid down on his thigh as a pillow. But I am not the same person I used to be. I know now that Meyer doesn't look like that when he is angry, but when he loves me but can't find the words right away. Instead of asking Meyer when he would marry me, he was troubled for a while. After such a long time, he cried out in a quiet whisper. Lytiisha. Lytiisha. What does it mean? It's just like you. Meyer smiled indifferently. He seemed to like the meaning of his name very much. I squinted at him. It doesn't mean tyrant or anything, does it? Absolutely not. Meyer held back his laughter and shook his head. Well, I can't help but believe it. I like the tone more than anything else. June Karensha, June Lightyisha. I took turns rolling names on the tip of my tongue. June Lightyisha all right, I like it. I smiled broadly and nodded. Meyer was also relieved, sweeping his chest. I'm glad you like it. So what does it mean? I'm afraid to tell you. Meyer scratched his chin. He is not one to joke around with other people's names, but I had to make sure to ask him before leaving it as a document because that man's true intentions were a joke. The second tyranny situation was absolutely specious. Like a lie, what he felt awkward just now, Meyer expressed his meaning with a rather proud air. Joy, rapture, beauty, abundance, fertility these are words I've collected from the most precious and valuable things in this world. Isn't it too excessive? It was farther than I thought, so I asked back in a good way. Meyer shook his head firmly. You're overflowing with that name. Chapter, 177 Anyway, he's a man who can't make an objective assessment of me because he's blinded by love. But all I got was meaningless empty flattery when I dismissed his words. I would have liked the name anyway, I just nodded his words. Okay, come to think of it, abundance and fertility I think that's a pretty good meaning as the lord of the Grand Duchy. I have something to say about that. I tilted my head. But Meyer hesitated, unable to speak easily. His heavy mouth seemed to be unusually heavier today. I have the castle of Nocantoria. Do you want to make Nocantoria the capital city? It's a little remote, but I don't think it's a bad option considering the symbolism. No, I don't mean that. Isn't that right? After hesitating for a long time, he suddenly brought up a story that I knew, so I thought it was because of that. Totally unpredicted, I looked at Meyer with blurry eyes. When I gave him a look I had absolutely no idea what to expect, Meyer gave me a hollow look. He had kept his mouth shut many times, but after a while he let his true feelings peek out. I'm saying, I'm not going to be emperor. What? If you don't become an emperor, who will? Now, his majesty. But there's no successor anyway. 
That's not what I'm saying. Meyer shook his head. He seemed genuinely frustrated. He suddenly grabbed my hands with both hands and said resolutely. Be the emperor. Pardon. I jumped with a start. If I had been drinking something, I would have spit it out. Meyer asked back, frowning his handsome brows. Why are you reacting like that? Did I not also tell you in the dungeon you were to be emperor? No, that's because you were dying then. I shouted out loud because I was amazed. But Meyer was unperturbed and proud. Have you ever received back what I gave you once? I mean, that's not the case. Besides, Meyer, you're there going to protest. All the other expedition members agreed. Even the emperor. No, when the hell? Weren't we always together after defeating the demon king? Due to Meyer's separation anxiety, we were almost always attached, but when in the world did he craft a back hole? In the process of reflecting on my memory, I was belatedly able to recall that Meyer sat out for a while with the emperor in the banquet hall. Perhaps they must have exchanged words then. It was a bit of a surprise. Did you even ask me first? After telling everyone around, where is the last thing you proposed to me? I grumbled dissatisfied. You could have told me first. There are eyes around. Let's discuss it a little bit. I learned from you. You have to do your job first. You talk like you've never been the first person to work. Ha <laughs> ha. You're the second most upsetting person to do things first. Having nothing to say, he just laughed it off. I let out a sigh. I don't know anything about running a fief. Me, being such an emperor that's ridiculous. The expedition was well organized. That's another thing. There's a status window most of the time I touched on the expedition was related to combat and strategy. I took care of the supply, the background checks, the internal affairs. Whether or not he knew my concern, Meyer said carelessly. Don't worry too much. The people below will take good care of you I wonder how much worse you are than I am. I care about the source of infinite trust that I'm good at whatever I do, but. What if I ruin the country while I'm at it? I bit my lip, anxious and frustrated by the unexpected disaster, and Meyer squeezed my lips with his thumb. If it bothers you, you should learn imperialism from the emperor now. Don't worry about it too much, because you can just extend the emperor's term. Will you play while I'm so focused on studying? Meyer laughed emphatically. He looked truly free, unlike the man who had previously moved to duty and conviction, and a corner of my heart burned, even in the face of being forcibly sold out for the position of emperor. Meyer spoke as a matter of course. Putting aside achievements in the War of the Demon King, it's better for someone like you to be emperor than me. What kind of person am I? A person who does their best in what is given, who is always fair and attentive. Meyer's eyes were serious. I can't believe he can praise me right in front of me without hesitation. It was hard to adapt to it no matter how many times I listened to it. If you say so, you are also. If I become emperor, I will be so preoccupied with you that I will pretend to be ignorant of political affairs. Why is he making such a bold statement? I sighed softly, as I was amazed. Whether I did or not, Meyer proudly continued. If that happens, you will eventually replace the government. If you want to build a new empire, you have a lot of things to worry about, so you put off dating. Look, there's a hidden meaning in those words. If it's something you're going to do, wouldn't it be better for you to be the emperor? Okay. Okay. I accepted the throne as if I had given up. No one would think that the honorable and enviable position of the emperor of the empire would be passed from place to place like this I let out a sigh. So when I said yes after much consideration, a smile spread on Meyer's face. In fact, I don't think I had a choice to think about it, but. At that moment, Meyer added belatedly, as if by mistake. Oh, come to think of it, I forgot for a moment that I had a favor to ask of you. You force me to be emperor and ask me for a favor. Do you have a conscience? Perhaps I saved Meyer without conscience when I revived him. Let's hear it first. Leaning my arm against the back of the sofa, I leaned my chin and waited anxiously for Meyer's words. Meyer, with a stiff face, spoke seriously of all the anguish of the world as a young man. 
I'm saying this because you're thinking of marrying me we'll get married as soon as we can. I wondered what it was. I smirked at him. Why are you in such a hurry? Were you so unhappy that I said no to open relationships until the empire stabilized as soon as I came to life? That's natural. Meyer's nodding face was brazen. He frowned and muttered, as if to think horribly. And if you become emperor, the wicked and demanding will try to wash you away. Although not like that, I don't like that arrogant look now. Are you worried about that? By any stretch of imagination, I laughed softly. But unlike me who doesn't take things very seriously, Meyer's face was as serious as ever. Nervous, he clasped my hand. His hands gripped beyond measure. If he had really exerted himself, my hand would have been crushed, but I wonder how much he is restraining himself now to avoid doing so. One corner of my heart itched to see that desperate effort to somehow hold me down completely. I whispered softly as I stroked his silver hair with the hand that wasn't held by Meyer. You're the only one I've ever died for. Can't you be sure of that alone? When Meyer looked as if he wasn't sure he was sure, he had a look on his face that made the sky collapse for a moment, as if he thought I was going to die again. He quickly calmed his face and slowly shook his head. That certainty is enough for once. Then trust me. I swept his hair behind his ears and clasped his cheek. His slow flickering eyelashes tickled my palms. This obedience that the Black Knight Meyer Knox sometimes shows has ignited my heart. I moistened my parched mouth, and changed the subject for no reason. By the way then I'll have to stay in the capital to learn imperialism and you'll have to go back to Nocantoria. Can you handle a long-distance couple's life? If I had become a great duke, not an emperor, I was going to get a place near Meyer's future as much as I could. The Nocantoria castle and capital are not just a day or two away, so it would be like a weekend couple, no, a month-long couple. I wondered if Meyer could stand it. What are you talking about? Why would I go back? From now on I will rule my territory. But you're still a grand duke. It's not a year or two that I've been away from the estate, and Vince has managed it well so far, so it's okay. Meyer replied brazenly. No, of course, he can take a little break after living in a dungeon for almost seventeen years. But he's going to be rubbing Vince the wrong way for a long time, and... As expected, I'm still a little nervous about leaving the empire in Meyer's hands. Meyer smiled with his eyes wide open as if he were reading my feelings. Look, you can't leave me with the Empire, can you? I'm saying, I can't beat him. At the condescending appearance of Meyer, I shook my head with my tongue hanging out. Well I could at least manage to run the Empire, even though I had defeated the Demon King as well. It would not be easy, but I had no choice but to exert myself in the most positive way possible. I solemnly declared. Okay, then I'll be the emperor I'll have your name engraved next to me. It's an honor. Meyer exaggerated, and soon got off the sofa and got on his knees in front of me. There was a reverence as if he were serving as a knight. Meyer pulled my hand and kissed the back of my hand, whispering earnestly and eagerly. May this empire you rule be affluent forever. The name Lightyisha, which Meyer gave me, had many meanings. The biggest meaning among them was that we wanted this empire to be affluent forever. It was the future, the origin, that I also wished for. I joined hands with Meyer and added. Let's think about the wedding together. Decorate the ceremony with your favorite flowers and fill the reception with my favorite songs. That's very nice. Meyer chuckled. The person who had been awkward about smiling at first now chuckled. Seeing him like that filled my heart somehow. I cupped his cheeks and quickly lowered my head, bringing my lips to his. His silence, which came with the sound of an intake of breath, was quickly followed by a heated one. The true ending in the game is that the hero who defeated the Demon King ends up becoming Emperor, but the reality is not so easy. I have more than one or two things to worry about I will probably have to start studying to become an Emperor today. That's just the reality. A story of the future that never ends and continues from one moment to the next. That's why it's eternal, my and our true ending. Two years after defeating the Demon King, one of the heroes of the Salvation Army, Jun Lightyisha Knox, ascended the throne. 
Originally, it was customary for the expedition leader of the last expedition to ascend to the emperor, but all existing members of the expedition unanimously agreed to her accession. And Grand Duke Meyer Knox, the leader of the Black Knights and her husband, became the shield of the empire as the state secretary and received the name of Lytiisha. The other five heroes who participated in the Holy Demon War swore allegiance to her and became swords protecting the Lydiaean imperial family. The new empire that everyone was looking forward to. It was the beginning of the Lydiaean dynasty. Chapter 178 Marianne and Yana had existed together since the time humans first became intelligent in this world. They did not know how they were born. They could only speculate that perhaps the strong winds of humans crying out for God had created them. Born in this way, they were not omniscient enough to be gods, and as human beings, they lived their eternal lives with abilities that were impossible in their category. A life that just existed. They depended on each other and abandoned each other, but they, too, had their limitations. In such unchanging daily life, it was Marianne who was the first to feel frustrated. She was fed up with the pure white space that only sparkled. Unable to stand her life, which was always just piling up, she began to become more and more sensitive, and her emotional ups and downs began to increase. Yana, Marianne's only conversation partner, noticed the change in her. After wondering for a while what to do, Yana immediately thought of a good and strange move and persuaded Marianne. Marianne hesitated. For some reason, it seemed impossible for her to go out alone to take over without Yana, with whom she had spent so many eons of her life. Yana shook his head. He was also frustrated with one thing, but it was more painful for Marianne to suffer. It was not possible to go to the human world from the demon world where Yana was staying anyway. This was because the demon world where Yana's castle was located and the sacred world where Marianne's castle was located were at odds with each other. With the sacred world always watching the human world, but the demon world turning its back on the human world. Yana's words made Marianne's white face, which had never dreamed before, go blank. Yana pushed her back, and for the first time Marianne gathered her courage to take over. However close the sacred world was to the human world, there was still resistance among the hierarchy. It was hard work, but Marianne's heart pounded loudly in anticipation of the newly unfolding world. Unlike the stark white of the sacred world, the human world was a mishmash of diverse colors that confused her. Marianne set out on a journey into the landscape that stretched across the human world. While looking around the human world with such fascination, Marianne happened to meet a human being. God. The human, mistaking Marianne for a god, blubbered and prayed before her in a five-way struggle. Marianne panicked and tried to wake the human, but the human begged her to do her a favor. Give me strength. I must avenge my tribe as chief. Her cry of truth shook Marianne to the core. Marianne thought she could do it if she let go of her power a little. And so Marianne passed her magic power to the human. The human was overjoyed as they began to receive the power to make fire. Thank you, St. Marianne. Marianne gave her magic power to the humans, so she thought that much magic would disappear, but to her surprise, the magic flared up again. Then. Marianne had since then given humans various talents. Humans followed her and called her Saint Marianne. With the awe of the humans, Marianne was intoxicated with joy, as if she had become a god. But on the other side of the world, there was a problem she was unaware of. Every time Marianne passed her magical power to a human, something was changing in Yana, who, as her counterpoint, formed the balance of the world. The birth of demons. Every time Marianne gave power to a human and that power filled up again, a demon was created in the demon world. The stronger the power Marianne gave, the stronger the demons were created. Yana, the master of the demon world, had completely concealed this fact. Marianne was experiencing the joy of life, feeling rewarded for the first time. Such a fullness that he could never fulfill. Yana expanded his world little by little and hid the demons. In this way, the demon world gradually became wider and wider. After so many years alone, Yana finally went mad. By the time Marianne found out, it was too late. In order to eliminate the demons, Marianne had to retrieve all the magical power she had given to the humans. 
However, the magical power she pulled away had already been passed down from generation to generation among humans. A situation that required the elimination of a large part of the human population. Marianne, who could not bear to do so, was distressed by the disaster caused by her preliminary judgment. Yana began to invade the human world with demons. It was the outbreak of the First Holy Demon War. The magical power given by Marianne spread to human beings and only weakened their concentration, making it impossible to deal with the demons composed of magical power. Another ability was needed for humans. Since it was no longer possible to lower the magical power directly, Marianne chose to express the hidden talents of humans. The humans managed to deal with the demons, but... In the end, all of this, including Yana's transformation, was Marianne's fault and sin. Marianne's body scattered in the flashing light and her spirit reached the bond of the soul. Despite their near-godlike abilities, they too could not depart from the ways of the world. However, their spiritual bodies were so powerful that reincarnation was impossible, and they would probably gradually disappear and become the foundation for this world. Marianne's eyes saw Yana crumbling one step in the distance. Yana also saw her, his black lips pursed into a pout. Marianne leisurely walked toward Yana. Then she reached out her hand. Just before her fingertips scattered and disappeared, she was finally able to embrace Yana. They embraced to the very end. Not an eternal life spent in separation, but a moment spent in an embrace, even if only for a moment. That satisfied them. Afraid of my saying that I would become emperor, Meyer ran straight to the emperor. He seemed to think that I would change my mind by any chance and seemed to have the intention of making it a fait accompli. Of course, as far as he was concerned, I regretted it as soon as I spoke up. Earlier, I was swept away by the atmosphere and said I would become an emperor, but when I thought about what would happen after that, my eyes went dark. But there's nothing I can do I can't let Meyer roll over the world when it's a world we saved. I sighed and paced slowly. Even though Meyer had told everyone around him, I didn't really like it considering the way he usually spoke. He probably only talked about the exact circumstances with the emperor, and must have told the others at random. As expected, as soon as I explained the whole story, the Black Knights reacted as if they had never heard of it before. Are you really going to be emperor, vice commander? Sevi was startled. Rober was also tongue-tied. So His Excellency is still the Grand Duke. I know that His Excellency is a dungeon attacker without another price in mind, but I don't know if I should say that he's quite modest. I guessed it from the very beginning when he gave her the title of tyrant. Axion, who soon figured out the situation, chuckled. Maybe because Meyer was not there, everyone talked more comfortably. Julieta added with a deep sigh. Come to think of it, someone give such titles to their second-in-command. Black Knight and Tyrant. No matter how you look at it, the latter has something to do with it. I knew that the vice commander was a great person from the time when she was able to control His Excellency the Black Knight with her fingertips. Began shrugged his shoulders. August, who was one step away, sighed and said. Well, considering your relationship, it doesn't matter which one becomes emperor. What? Are those two dating? What, you still didn't know that? Ginny's question, which she asked back with surprise, was rather met with a flurry of funny stares. Not only Tragula, who was not really into the conversation, but also even the red and blue unit commander. Who was not only close to the end of the line but had only conquered the dragon dungeon once with June two years before, looked at Ginia as if he did not understand her. His Excellency is very clingy, don't you know that? It's not just for a day or two that His Excellency sticks to her. He's not a clingy person in the first place. Began shook his head impatiently. Jinnia cried out falsely. I thought he was being clingy because the vice commander is a capable person. Hey, I'm here right now. Sit yourself down and talk like that. I raised my hand to express my existence. I didn't know the end of it when I listened carefully to how far they were talking. What's wrong? I didn't say anything weird about the vice commander, or any weird lies to my conscience. Axion solemnly lowered his eyes and raised his hand as if to swear. Looking at his shamelessness, I thought he would be very good at politics. 
Anyway, within the Black Knights, everyone relatively calmly accepted the fact that I would become emperor. And the nobles. Ha ha ha, frankly, in our aristocratic situation, it's much better for Lord Carantia, no, Lord Lightyisha, to be crowned emperor than Grand Duke Knox. Chapter, 179. For them, the difference between Meyer and me was divided by whether they could communicate or not. By all accounts, the former was much more willing to deal with. Certainly. Who could breathe a word of air in front of a man whose mere existence was filled with the intimidation of the most powerful man in the world if he had to fight the daring battle of being the first emperor with the prestigious name of hero? That's why they probably welcomed my ascension to the throne with open arms, as I looked so sweet. A man who was talking murmured as he touched his chin. Come to think of it June Lightyisha said what kind of man she liked. Aha, wake up from your dream. Grand Duke Knox that he even handed over the throne, do you think she'll take a concubine? An old woman older than a man gave him a hard time. The other person next to him also responded. And it's Grand Duke Knox. Who's his opponent? Right. Don't you remember that before the Second Holy War, during the trial of Countess Nearest, His Excellency the Grand Duke rampaged on the issue of the hearing of Lord Lightyisha? No, it's not like anyone is going to do anything right now it's just something to keep in mind. The man who spoke out awkwardly blurted out the end of his words. Then another person who was listening to the story suddenly asked. By the way, wasn't it said that Lord Lightyisha is lovers with Lord Axion the Flame Mage? When was that a story? It's been a long time since they broke up. Really? What's the reason? What was it again I think it was because Lord Axion only talked about magic. Oh, I heard that, too. She hadn't been going out with the same expedition since, but Grand Duke Knox would actively engage with her. Well, then the type who talks too much may not be her cup of tea. She'd have to pick the quieter type. I, you still haven't given up on it, man. As such, the crowd of nobles passed through the corridor with a giggle, unaware that their dialogue was being overheard by the person in question. When I passed the corridor, I didn't expect to hear conversations about me. But when I think about it, I couldn't help it because there was no one who didn't talk about me in the capital. I sighed deeply when I saw the process of fabricating rumors with my own eyes. I didn't really explain why we broke up it's not even known that I dumped him. I felt a little sorry for Axion. Furthermore, not wanting to be mistaken for the incoming emperor's ex-lover, I pushed Axion forward as a false lover, but now Axion had become the incoming emperor's ex-lover I felt twice as sorry when I thought about it. If Axion came to fall in love later, I would have to be proactive in explaining it. I made up my mind again. By the way, everyone's making it a fait accompli for Meyer and me to get married. Although it had not yet been officially disclosed, it was so blatantly polar that it was not surprising that everyone knew. What was rather surprising was that Meyer would even think of allowing a concubine, knowing that they'd become a royal concubine. Only one person took up the idea of concubine with impunity, and the others had difficulty believing that Meyer would sit still. But the glancing look in the eyes of the others indicated that they, too, had every intention of pushing their children and nephews into the harem as soon as the opportunity presented itself. I understand why Meyer insisted on getting married first. If, on the contrary, Meyer became emperor and they want Meyer to have a concubine. As soon as I thought about it, I felt a shiver and the back of my neck was numb. I decided to hurry up my marriage to Meyer with a heart of regret. I was in trouble if I delayed my marriage to Meyer and unnecessarily inflated the hopes of the nobles. More precisely, the problem was that their vain hope might ignite Meyer's jealousy. I would be the one to clean up afterward. He was a man who was jealous even just for the sake of being jealous, and who had a very narrow view of the men around me. It was far to think about. I sighed once more. It was a deep sigh as if the floor had disappeared many times. Really? Yes, let's get married as soon as possible. Maya was happy and pleased with my kind-hearted and dry language which was more akin to cleaning up business formalities than being an ambassador of human ethics and taking up the fruition of love. He obtained my permission to marry, but he seemed to think inwardly that I would put it off. It was not a wrong guess, because it really would have been if I had not listened to the aristocrat who was talking about the concubines. 
Meyer floated around with a look of excitement on his face that didn't calm down at all. A mountain seemed to shake when he did that with his big body. I wonder if it's that good. So cute. I watched happily as he leaned back on the couch and roared like a big bear. When can we get married the fastest? First of all, there needs to be a ceremony to award titles. I mumbled as I recalled the itinerary. My becoming emperor has caused quite a bit of complications with the schedule. Originally there was to be a coronation ceremony for Meyer as emperor, followed by a title ceremony. It seemed that the title ceremony had to be done first because the emperor's coronation was pushed out a while later without a promise. The fact that everyone now referred to me and the other non-aristocratic expedition members as lords was only a term of respect, as it was impossible to call the heroes appropriately, and they did not receive any particular title. Meyer nodded his head as if he had forgotten all about the title ceremony until that moment. Come to think of it, we'll have to adjust the timing of the ceremony. H.M., since you haven't reached the imperial throne yet. Ugh. I bit my tongue in confusion. And Meyer asked suspiciously. What is that reaction? Nothing then do we have to wait until then? Of course, it's the law for everyone to wait for you to ascend the throne. Meyer blinked as if he could not understand. Come to think of it, it was customary for the new emperor to give titles in this case. In the sense of putting new wine in a new bottle. In retrospect it was also a contribution to the nation's founding that helped build the empire. I didn't know how many years it would take for me to rise to the throne, but it was not something to talk about. I shook my head. Do not even question the law in such matters. If you think about it, my becoming emperor is also far from the law. It feels like receiving an award right away. Besides, now that we had defeated the demon king and everyone was covered in red, I seemed relatively incapable of rationally calculating the gains and losses, but that would change again in time. I'm sure they'll be left feeling sorry, that they could have more, and that they could not be deprived of more. The throne would be safely passed down to me as there is currently no successor to the emperor, but the titles and territories of others were different. I don't want the nobles to rebel because they think they will be deprived of what is theirs. It's better to get it sorted now than to go back home so bothered for no reason at all. Of course, Meyer seemed to think differently, and he shook his head in puzzlement. But. If we hold the title ceremony while we respond like this, the wedding will be even faster, right? After all, Meyer's continued opposition to the title ceremony seemed to be due to the idea that the wedding would be delayed. He nodded as if he had made a quick decision after a few moments of pondering with his brows gathered. Okay. Then we'll have the title ceremony in a week, and we'll have the wedding right away. Right away. That fast? I asked back in astonishment. I said let's proceed quickly, but I almost never thought of the title ceremony at the same time. When I was puzzled, Meyer stared at me as if it were natural. You're the one who asked me to marry you as soon as possible. No, I said that, but after a week, it's a bit. It's not like you fry beans in lightning. As I mumbled the end of my sentence, Meyer added hastily, embarrassed. Why yeah, it'll take a while to get ready. Then how about two weeks later? One week, two weeks. I'll prepare it perfectly. You don't have to worry. Meyer seemed to strongly misinterpret that he could not be trusted to be ready for marriage in two weeks. Marriage preparation is not the issue, my emotional preparation is the issue. He spewed his impassioned rhetoric about the perfect wedding to prepare for in two weeks for a while, and when I didn't respond, his silver-gray eyebrows drooped. Perhaps it was the clear presence of his eyebrows that made his change of expression especially clear to my heart. And the warily glancing sideways was a clear sign that he was trying to figure out what to do if I said we should put off the marriage. This human being must have made that expression on purpose. He must have learned that I am susceptible to expressions like that. I couldn't hold out any longer, so I turned my eyes and waved for no reason. Okay, fine. It wasn't until my confirmation fell that Meyer smiled broadly. Seeing him enjoying himself like that, I was glad I hadn't told him to put it off any longer. Why yes. We were going to get married as soon as possible anyway. I expected it to be in about three months, but when I thought about it, it didn't look much different two weeks from now either. 
At least it's less sudden than dungeons on the planet. On second thought, it didn't seem a bad idea to do it when we were gathered anyway, since everyone would have to disperse to their own territories after being appointed a title and receiving a sealed land. There would be nothing that could be paid out as a congratulatory gift shortly after receiving the land anyway. The nobles would be free to put in their congratulations. It was an effective conclusion, comforting myself, I tried to suppress my anxiety about the wedding two weeks later. Chapter, 180 I agreed to hold the wedding ceremony along with the title ceremony with my own mouth, but after a few days, I was still perplexed. Two weeks later I can't believe I'm getting married in ten days, dot. Apart from the lack of reality, things were going steadily in the meantime. I, in particular, was dizzyingly busy with the issue of the title ceremony. The territory to be given to the heroes, the distribution of the titles, and so on. Fortunately, the work was easier than I had expected, given the extent to which I had laid out the big picture in advance. I even discussed it with the expedition leaders during the final debriefing. Normally, Meyer would have done this, but now that I had to assume the imperial throne, I had to step in and handle the matter. While I was so busy, Meyer was taking care of all the wedding preparations. Then, sometimes, whenever he needed my opinion, he came right away and asked right away. Do you prefer the celebration to be held outdoors or indoors? Wouldn't it be comfortable indoors? Is there anything romantic you'd like to do at the wedding? After all, I should propose to you properly, right? No, it's fine. It's really okay. I mean it. I couldn't believe he would propose to me when I was so busy. I waved my hand violently, not putting much meaning to it. It wasn't just the proposal. I was the one who was not romantic about weddings from the beginning. In my original world, marriage was a distant thing, and since I came to this world, I had no room to dream about things like marriage because I was so absorbed in defeating the demon king. Sure enough, Meyer murmured, kicking his tongue. But I'm a little disappointed. If you're really sad, take care of yourself at our golden wedding anniversary. How can I wait fifty years? Meyer pouted his lips and grumbled, and soon changed his expression as if he had a good idea. Okay, once you become emperor, on our wedding anniversary, let's take care of the things we couldn't do this time let's celebrate our tenth anniversary. That'll do. His words were a little strange. I don't think I'm just going to celebrate my wedding every year. I squinted at Meyer. He was planning our future wedding anniversary with unprecedented enthusiasm. I didn't want to pour cold water on his passion, but I had to make sure that Meyer was not alone in his anniversary plans. I asked, with a doubt. You're not saying that you're going to take care of it like a wedding, are you? Why not? I will honor the monumental day. You marry me. Why is he so confident? I shouted, roughly putting the list of checks on the table. If the emperor spends their budget like that, it's a waste of state money. Don't worry. I won't touch the treasury. The property of Grand House Knox is enough. Meyer replied as he wandered around. His face looked thick as if he expected praise, as if he had no doubt I would be impressed with him if he said so. While I was too dumbfounded to say anything, Meyer held his tongue. I think I was in such a hurry that I couldn't even print the wedding anniversary commemorative coins. There's a lot to be desired. Commemorative coins, we were supposed to take a coin to commemorate the end of the Second Holy Demon War. Besides, I'm not the emperor yet. Our marriage is neither a national marriage nor an afterthought, but commemorative coins. I'm sure you'll be the next emperor, but it's a national marriage. It was fortunate that the commemorative stamps could be issued somehow. Wait. You issued commemorative stamps. It was relatively easy to prepare stamps. That's not what I'm saying. More and more piles, I poked my forehead out and groaned. When I handed over the full book of wedding proceedings, it seemed to have been very well spent. But what I thought was a mountain of a pile was just the tip of the iceberg. I wanted to stage the great journey of you and me as a play for the grand theaters this time it's also a pity that it's too much of a rush. Because I can't do it unless it's perfect. Then Meyer added with a grin. What do you think? Is this enough to prepare for the wedding? As the next emperor's husband, I will continue to be frugal, so don't worry. 
I felt like something bigger would happen if I refuted him, so I had no choice but to nod helplessly. My future, which was dragged by the leash of a large dog running forward, was drawn in front of me. A few days later, Mary arrived at the capital. The palace also gave me a new maid, but everyone seriously looked at me because I was going to be the next emperor. The problem was that it was extremely inconvenient. I was afraid that they would turn pale and shiver when I left a little bit of dinner because my stomach was growling. Or if I got a deep scent of flowers as soon as my head was throbbing due to continuous work and I frowned without realizing it, and being guilty of plastering. They had to back up my work, but it was rather annoying when I had a lot of things to worry about because I was considerate of them. So I grumbled softly to Meyer, who remembered the words and called her. Mary greeted politely. I will shorten your supreme position, Lord Lightyisha. The title Lord Lightyisha was not familiar to me even after hearing it several times. Especially when people who used to know called me that. However, when I thought about it, the same was true of the designation of the Vice Commander of the Black Knights. After all, I figured I would get used to it someday after listening to it often enough. The problem is that I didn't know when that would be. When I get used to being called Lord Lightyisha, I'll probably already be referred to as Your Majesty. It was a very likely story. I answered Mary's greeting modestly with a slight smile. It's still a long way to go. It's also a concession from His Excellency. No, I think it was a foregone conclusion. If it had not been for Lord Lightyisha, it would have been impossible to defeat the Demon King without so much damage. Thank you as a member of this world. Once again, I smiled awkwardly and waved my hands at Mary's words of thanks, bowing politely. His Excellency the Grand Duke has given me the order that from now on I am to be loyal to Lord Lightyisha. From now on, my master is Lord Lightyisha. Mary knelt before me and bowed her head. So far, she had secretly passed on my conditions and information to Meyer, but she promised not to do so in the future. Well, I wondered if I really need to do this, but if I become an emperor in the future, Mary and I would be comfortable organizing these things neatly. Admitting Mary's ability, I gladly accepted her. All right, Mary. Then I will give the first order of business. I'm so busy preparing for the title ceremony and the wedding that I don't want to give one iota of attention to anything else. I see. I'll work hard to create an environment where you can be completely immersed in your work. Mary spoke with confidence. It was certainly reassuring to see her here. No one, except Meyer, knew more about my preferences than she did, as I had trusted her with everything in general at Nocantoria Castle. I could then devote myself to my work with an even more relaxed mind. But the work was endless, so it became a situation of just doing the work with ease well, I still thought this was somewhere. I feel like I need to give up and get used to a life of working this much. Maybe I will never be able to rest for the rest of my life. I had the feeling that what Meyer was giving me was not power and honor, but labor. But I decided to stop thinking about it because thinking about it deeply would only deepen my discord and distrust of the groom-to-be. I thought it would be good for me, too. I had little idea how the wedding was going to flow, as I left the dress, the formal wear, and everything else entirely up to Meyer. In fact, I didn't even have that much time to worry about it. Two weeks was a short time to prepare for a wedding, but it was also a short time to prepare for a title ceremony. It seemed that Meyer didn't sleep and was busy preparing for the wedding, but I didn't have enough stamina, so I had no choice but to use my time sparingly by concentrating even when my eyes were open. I blamed someone else for my own karma. I just had to trust Meyer and leave it to him. Still, it was certainly easier this way. I skimmed through a few of the dresses that Meyer had carefully selected out of many dresses. Then, in the process of temporarily sealing the dresses, I ended up trying them on a few times. Chapter, 181 You're skinnier than you were when I took your last measurement, Lord Lightyisha. I think you went through a lot. Verone, the imperial tailor who took care of my wedding attire, approached me with concern. She stuck to my figure, as Verone had been in charge of my wardrobe for the second and third time since the first results briefing. If you don't eat more. Meyer, who was watching me on the other side, grunted and clicked his tongue. I replied while raising my arm so that Verone could open the pin at my waist. I don't think it's a matter of food. 
I'm still eating enough. Stocking up on calories for energy even if I didn't have an appetite had been a habit since my expedition days. Recently, I ate more carefully because my head wouldn't work if I ran out of glucose. Meyer said, clicking his tongue disapprovingly. Tell me if there are people who talk about your decision and bother you. What are you going to say? I have to deal with them properly. Even if my title is tyrant, I don't want to use it before I ascend to the throne. I listened to Meyer's words in one ear and out the other. Meyer sighed as if I were frustrated, but I couldn't listen to Meyer. Meyer sighed and cried. Anyway, you tend to buy work wait a minute, the skirt is not good enough. Let's try to catch it more abundantly. Yes. This much? HM a little longer. Hold the waistline up by a finger. Veroni followed Meyer's orders to the letter. In the meantime, I glanced through the list of documents Mary held. After finishing the pin in her mouth, Veroni urged the newcomer next to her. Rookie, our pin. What? Yes. At that moment, the new tailor was bewildered and hurriedly handed a pin. Veroni opened her eyes in a triangular shape and polished the newcomer. Get a hold of yourself. I kept standing as if I couldn't believe it every time Meyer said a word, and I ended up hearing one word. Indeed. How could that black knight be so sensitive about a centimeter in skirt length? It would be hard to believe it even with both eyes. Of course, Veroni and the other tailor, who were well aware of Meyer's tiresome nature due to past performance reports, just silently followed Meyer's orders. And so, after the last gab of dresses, one of the most important ones, I sat down side by side with Meyer and sighed. I'm glad you and I are both silver and gray. Why? Otherwise, I would have had a bunch of gray hairs that would have stood out like a sore thumb. Meyer chuckled at my flattery and poured tea into my teacup. Hair covered with mana doesn't fade anyway. That's what I'm saying. The moment I shrugged my shoulders and reached out to the teacup, an administrator rushed to find me. Lord Lightyisha. We found overlapping territories. Oh, my. It was a matter I had no choice but to attend. I took my hand off the teacup and laughed bitterly. I don't have time for a cup of tea. Let's drink as much as we want after everything is over. Then let's make it your favorite drink, not tea. Meyer also swallowed a note of regret as much as he understood the situation. How did my Meyer become so considerate? Proudly, I stroked Meyer's cheek and whispered. I look forward to our joint drink. I'll try my best. Meyer nodded passionately. If he's willing to work so hard in person, he must bring some pretty nice drinks. One more reason to expect a wedding. I clucked my tongue. The hectic schedule continued after that. After so much time, the long-awaited title ceremony and my wedding day were just around the corner. Grand Banquet Hall of the Imperial Palace. The expeditions and the famous nobility gathered. At the time of the title ceremony, to avoid confusion, the members of the expeditions who were to receive their own titles were informed in advance. They had been active at the time of the last battle of this holy demon war, and they had actively closed the dungeon. The faces of the expedition members receiving titles were greatly anticipated. Those who would not receive titles would also receive appropriate rewards and examples, so they could not feel bad. A joyful atmosphere filled the banquet hall with everyone happy. The Black Knights also all entered the banquet hall with their uniforms on. This day had finally come, hadn't it? I thought it would never come. I sighed as I recalled the two weeks of hard work. Even that was a blessing that it was not me who would be giving down the titles. Anasta asked anxiously. Vice Commander, are you alive? Sure. I'm here because I'm alive. Can you make it to the wedding? Do you want me to use healing magic? Amazingly, August has already used it once. I replied with a vague smile. I was not physically fatigued, but only mentally fatigued, which was not helped by August's curative magic. And the main culprit of my mental fatigue was these very gazes that were glancing down at me. I thought I had gotten used to these kinds of gazes since I became the vice commander of the Black Knights the Reserve Grand Duke and the Reserve Emperor had different dimensions of attention. Meyer looked at me with concern. You can go and rest if you're tired. 
if push comes to shove, we can even postpone the wedding. That's a terrible idea. I've been waiting for today. I shook my head in surprise. It's an opportunity to get it over with and be free, what postponing? If we postpone the wedding, we won't just be left with the wedding. Perhaps mistaking my reluctance as a rebuttal of my expectation of the wedding that much, Meyer coughed with a little joyous expression. At that moment, the emperor entered the banquet hall with the sound of a trumpet announcing his arrival. The fur cloak that hung over his aged shoulders looked heavier than ever today. No wonder, the emperor's plan was to give Meyer the throne by now and enjoy his retirement from recreation and care. Unexpected imperial education had prolonged his imperial term. When he came down from the throne, he would be treated and respected by the emperor, so I wanted to give it to him as soon as possible anyway, and I wanted to rest. But it was not Meyer, who was a grand duke, who took the throne, but me, a commoner. And as a result, the emperor had no choice but to keep his seat. The emperor sat on the throne, and the emperor's representative solemnly cleared his throat. The spokesman said when everyone was quiet. Thanks to the outstanding fighting spirit of the heroes of the turnaround, we have defeated the demon king and brought peace to the empire for the first time in seventeen years. As was the case at the beginning of the empire, titles will be given by the heroes who defeated the demon king according to the custom of our ancestors. Those who have been called up will now be the flame mage, Axion Flama. While everyone was cheering with their fingers crossed, Axion rode out majestically with his chest wide open. I, too, applauded enthusiastically as I congratulated those receiving their titles. Axion and the other five who participated in the Demon King's War received the title of Grand Duke. Since Meyer had been a Grand Duke from the beginning, it made no sense for him to receive an additional Grand Duke's title, and instead, he was provided with a territory with substantial plains and mines. Of course, it was I who took care of the territory and the distribution of compensation. Myers is mine, after all. It was an emergency pocket of gold that I, as emperor, could legally operate. It was August, Sevi, and then Julieta's turn. From a distance, I could see Julieta's parents, full of anticipation. It should have been a futile expectation. But I didn't dare to tell them. They would soon find out in person. God's mace, Julieta Castrum. Why is Julieta a Castrum? That girl is a Klawa. That's outrageous. There's something wrong. They couldn't believe it and made a fuss. But it was a trivial attempt. They were soon taken away by the Imperial Guard. In fact, they could have been kept out of the banquet hall from the start. But, respecting Julieta's wish that it would be better to see them in person than to hear their stories, I simply left it as it was. Julieta looked back at Rober with a satisfied smile on her face. Rober also turned to her with a smile. People who appeared to be members of Nova's family were also present at the ceremony. As commoners, they were not eligible to attend the ceremony, but they were exceptionally attentive. I could not find any resemblance to Nova's sister, who he said looked like me, in any way. Nova's sister had broad shoulders and a thick frame, as was typical of Nova's lineage, but she, too, must have demonstrated her ability if she held an axe. What a bummer, what a bummer. The habit of bringing in good personnel at the first sign of trouble was about to be triggered again. I didn't have to fight the demons anymore, so it was all over. I had abandoned my unfulfilled desire to. Tragula and Rober, the elite and unit leaders of the Black Knights, were given the title of Marquis. I wondered if they considered a countship at most. They looked bewildered by the higher title than expected. Golden Falcon, Tragula Cornu. I give you the title of Marquis along with the region of Cornu. However, the Cornu region would have meant more to Tragula than the Marquisate. This was because the Cornu region included the Count Dom of Neris. Externally, it was supposed to be a name to intervene and care about the business of Countess Neris. Perhaps realizing this fact, a shaken emotion welled up in the light green eyes of Tragula, who was anointed by the Emperor. Chapter 182 Counts, Viscounts, Barons, baronets, knights everyone was given a title. Ironically, I was the only one who would become emperor. But it's what I wanted in the first place, so. Meyer and the emperor still suggested that I should have a nominal title until I became emperor, 
but I was the one who refused. For the time being, the Lord Lightyisha was enough. Thus ended the long title ceremony. As I watched the titles and compensations that I had allotted be placed in everyone's bosom, I could feel that the two weeks of hard work had not been in vain. Now, following the title ceremony, we will proceed with the wedding of the heroic Lord June Lightyisha and Grand Duke Meyer Knox. Ladies and gentlemen, please observe in your seats in silence. As soon as the title ceremony was over, the event was held one after another. As expected, it looks like one plus one foot. Of course, the effort put into those things would be more than one plus one, but. While everyone was buzzing around, I slipped out of my seat with Meyer to change into my formal attire and headed to the preparation room next to the banquet hall. I saw Julieta and April gesturing for me to go lightly. When the wedding came, my heart thumped. It was more exciting than in the Demon King's castle. I rubbed my sweaty, damp palms on my uniform. Well, Meyer would still make it work on his own. If it comes around again, it won't be a big deal. Frankly, I worried this way because I had no idea what kind of disaster Meyer's excessive motivation could have caused. Of course, I'm sure Meyer knows better than I, who has never been to a single wedding in this world. Yeah, at least it's better than I did. In addition, Vince also visited and played a part, as it was the Grand Duke of Knox's business. If he had thought something was completely different, he would have stopped me or told me what he thought. That made me feel much safer. Travel was not about expressing dissatisfaction with a plan that you had never enlisted in. It was an unwritten rule to ensure the trip went off without a hitch. It was no different because it was a wedding. I vowed to fully comply with the wedding I was ready for, just because I had no hand in the wedding preparations. So that's what I thought until I tried on the formal attire. What is this? It's a wedding dress, Lord Lightyisha. Verona replied flatly. No, it's not at all like the last dress I had on. Except for it being a white dress, there's nothing the same about it. Who knew eyes as knotholes? It was absurd and I countered. This wasn't the one I tried on. It is. I just covered it with a little more cloth and decorated it glamorously for the wedding. It's our masterpiece. All this talk about using more cloth and gems, so that means it's not the same design, after all. But when I saw the satisfied smile on Verone's face, I couldn't complain. If not for this opportunity, I could feel her spirit as if she was going to try to use silk as much as she wanted with jewelry so glamorously at any time. At that time, the main culprit appeared that allowed Verone to express her creative desire to her heart's content. As expected. It is worthy of your dignity. In keeping with the wedding customs of the world, where both men and women wore bright white wedding attire, Meyer also wore pure white. The commoners also wore the whitest clothes they owned on their wedding day, with the intention of honoring St. Marianne and receiving her blessing. The white ceremonial robes with silver embroidery placed on it harmonized with Meyer's silver hair, making him look like a moon god. Meyer's clothing was also gorgeous, but it was nothing compared to my dress. My dress was not just white, it was decorated layer by layer with silver, precious jewels, and lace, and it sparkled with every movement. It doesn't end there. The hem of the skirt drags backward about two meters on the floor. The weight of the cloth was also extraordinary. Since I was a member of the expedition, I could move around in it, but if I had been an average person, there would have had to be two people to grab the hem of my skirt. Why do you look like that? You don't like it? It's the dress you chose. It's about the same format, but it's a completely different dress. Beyond the sly drag of the skirt hem what am I going to do with all these cloth? A cloth precious enough to be exchanged for a thousand gold was sweeping the floor like a mop. Even though I wanted to pat down the hem of my dress, I feared the lace and jewelry would fall off. Meyer, by contrast, was unconcerned. That is how the emperor's ceremonial cloak was originally made. Nowadays, he doesn't have the strength to pull on the cloak by himself, so he sometimes has an assistant to help him. I'm not the emperor yet. I'm sure they're going to say something. No one thinks so. Meyer chuckled as he said this. When the voices rose, he was ready to twist the people one by one. Meyer looked at me with satisfaction as he put on his ceremonial dress and said to Veroni. 
I like it. I'm very satisfied. You must have suffered from the short schedule, but I'll pay you more than I said. No, it was an honor for me to be able to make Lord Lightyisha's wedding dress. Verone also bowed her head with a proud face. And she didn't forget to add her own PR. Time was running out this time, but if you leave the scolding coronation gown to me, it will be more than perfect. Yes, I'll take it into consideration. They're going to hit the drums, the jangu, and the top. I squinted and bit. Why do you get to decide when it's my formal attire? Because that's my side. That's what the emperor's companion does. Meyer spoke proudly, thrusting his broad, firm chest forward. As I was grumbling like that, a servant who heard about the condition of the banquet hall spoke carefully. The banquet hall is ready. Lord Lightyisha, Grand Duke of Knox, you have to go now. See you after the wedding, really. After the wedding, I wonder if you'll listen to me. Meyer smiled and swung his hand at me at the bell. He put a white veil on my head that resembled a ST. Marianne's as if waiting. Meyer reached out to me. I took his hand without hesitation. We walked hand in hand down the hallway. The endless golden carpet looked like our glittering future was about to unfold. We passed through the silent corridor and arrived at the banquet hall. The closed doors slowly opened to reveal the banquet hall, which was all dark. Why were the lights off? As soon as I thought so, the candles on the sundries began to catch fire one after another from the far end of the banquet hall. It was a production that I had seen before. It's a production of the Demon King's Castle. Did it look cool? No, no matter how cool it looked, wasn't there trauma. Axion was the only talented person who could adjust the firepower to burn candles in such good timing. I don't know who created this project, but I couldn't help but roll my tongue at its blithe insensitivity. My dark vision was frighteningly brightened, and countless decorations of shimmering frost were created. It was Jean's ice magic. Jean's magic could coagulate the vapor in the void, but it could not make the frost it created float in the air. However, Sevi's wind magic supported the frost decorations and made them float in a fluffy manner. The nobles, who had never seen magic before, squealed at the level 60 wizard skills, which continued without a break. And the expedition members, who had examined how amazing the state of the art was, stared blankly at the ceiling. I can't believe that wizards with titles are in charge of wedding special effects the height of extravagance. And it didn't end there. Everyone in the Black Knights, dressed in matching grey ceremonial uniforms instead of the black uniforms of the Black Knights, stood in two longitudinal rows, like a line of honor guard, with each person's weapon thrust diagonally at the other. When Meyer and I entered the banquet hall, we stood up our weapons in order, starting with ours, without a stitch of difference. In memory of the heroes of mankind. May the future of the world shine forever. Everyone shouted in chorus. The band began to play the wedding march. I and Meyer walked past the Black Knights one by one. Everyone welcomed us with smiles and the Black Knight unit even had tears in their eyes. We could really feel that everyone was congratulating us. What awaited us at the end of the line was August, the officiate. He welcomed us with a joyful face, saying, You are finally freed from this epidemic advance guard. Yes, I think August suffered a lot because of us. The wedding will commence. August opened his mouth solemnly. As I listened to his continued officiating, I felt a real sense that Meyer and I were truly getting married. The officiant's congratulatory words led to a transfer of virtues between the couple. Love and respect each other. Never quarrel between husband and wife. Do you understand? Absolutely. Not. August's words were especially encouraging. He seemed to notice that if we fought, he would have to be summoned and mediate. Then you'll share the joint wine. A chamberlain approached us with a golden tray and a golden alcohol. August poured honey wine into the chalice. I reached out for the chalice. The honey wine, which was golden, was mainly used as joint wine, but the addition of rose petals in the honey liquor gave it a deep tang and a sensual rose aroma that stung my nose. It would be a shame to only moisten my mouth with this. I put my lips to the wine as I clucked my tongue. Alcohol, which I had not had in a long time, 
rushed down my throat. Then I handed it to Meyer. Meyer's golden eyes remained fixed on me as he drank the holy brew. As I faced his eager eyes, my lips, now moistened with sake, began to dry. And so the joint service ended. August solemnly ended the wedding. They now firmly swear to Esti. Marianne that they are now husband and wife. Everyone cheered and threw the flowers they were holding into the sky. Fresh red flowers fell like rain on the wedding hall, which was decorated in white, and the waltz tune that Meyer and I danced to for the first time echoed through the air. His favorite flowers. My favorite songs. It was a perfect wedding that could not have been more satisfying, though somewhat excessive. Chapter 183 Sevi murmured, pouting his lips as he watched June and Meyer share their joint liquor. It's unfair. What is? Nova, who was next to Sevi, asked, leaning slightly. She said she'd wait for me to grow up. The vice commander is a liar. Sure, she said she'd think about it when she saw you getting taller, but she didn't say she'd wait. That's it. She didn't even give me the chance. Sevi looked at June's neat profile, which flickered behind a translucent veil of fluttering white with eyes of frustration. He was a comrade in arms with whom he had suffered and struggled for three years without missing a single day. There was no way that Nova did not know the heart of such an old friend. Nova shrugged his shoulders with a wry smile. But even if the vice commander waited for you, we still have a problem. What problem? Sevi asked back in a dull tone. Nova pointed to Meyer, who loomed like a great silver shield in front of June, who shone brighter than anyone else. Would His Excellency take it easy and give up the vice commander? Are you confident you could fight His Excellency and win? No. The mouth of Sevi had been tightly shut. He may get taller, but he cannot raise the already fixed level. The day would never come when Sevi could beat Meyer even if he goes his whole life. Sevi shook his head vigorously as if to shake off his melancholy and said. B but I no longer kneel at His Excellency in title anymore either. We're both Grand Dukes. Both Grand Dukes, Grand Duke Knox had been a Grand Duke for more than 1,000 years and has built a fortune and a career that are worlds apart from Sevi, who just became a Grand Duke, but Nova did not dare talk about that. Instead, he simply said a few words quietly. Why don't you say that again in front of Your Excellency? Are you going to kill me? A surprised Sevi glanced at Nova. Then he threatened with a small fist shake. Just tell him. Do you think I'm gonna die alone? Nova, I'm going to tell him that you confessed to the vice commander. Why are you dragging me in? Nova, who had a bright face, hurriedly looked at Meyer. Meyer had ghostly hearing, but fortunately, he didn't seem to be able to hear what they were saying at all, since he was smiling at the thought of marrying June. Julieta, who was listening nearby as the two argued, held her tongue as if she couldn't stop them. August raised his hand, and Julieta hastily pinched their hips and whispered. Shoo, be quiet. The wedding is ending. Oh, there's no need to pinch me. I'm forced to listen to your dumb conversation, and I have to pinch you to make myself feel better. They now firmly swear to Esti. Marianne that they are now husband and wife. Oh, it's over. As soon as August's words were finished, the three special troops simultaneously threw the red flowers they were holding with the others into the sky. Clusters of flowers fluttered in the air and colored the night. Congratulations on your marriage. I wish you the best. Have a good life. As everyone cheered, the special unit celebrated the marriage of June and Meyer, respectively. Their faces, which had been so noisy earlier, all had smiles on them. After the wedding was over and I had changed into a dress that was a bit more comfortable to move in than the wedding attire that dragged on the floor, I stopped by the wedding party. As I entered the reception, everyone congratulated me more freely than before. Congratulations on your wedding, Vice Commander. The dress was so beautiful. Thank you. The first to approach me and congratulate me was the trio. When I saw them running toward me in their grey ceremonial robes, I thought of our first performance report. If His Excellency has something bad to say, tell it to us. Understood. Sevi, who had finally received his title with the title of Gale Destroyer, consoled me with deliberate boldness as he clenched his fists. 
Incidentally, as an adult past puberty, I went through three confirmations just in case. Will you really regret it, do you have any other title, do you really have to do it? But Sevi insisted that he must do it. For me, it was the best thing I could do. Hearing Sevi's words, Meyer laughed full of energy. Perhaps he did not expect Sevi to say it so openly, or perhaps he looked somewhat puzzled as if he had been hit once. It was only natural. If a hamster suddenly came and scolded you if you did something wrong, I would have been taken aback. I finally stifled a laugh and asked Sevi. What would you do if I told you guys? The mouth of the Sevi was tightly shut. Then I rolled my eyes and peeped at Meyer standing behind me. Meyer just stared down at Sevi, the size of his waist, with a sardonic look on his face and said nothing. After making eye contact with Meyer for exactly three seconds, Sevi changed his words with a servile smile and a palm of his hand. Well on second thought, I don't think His Excellency will ever be mean to you. You must be scared. I smiled mockingly. But Sevi had the cheek to refute. No, I'm just trying to get a reality check. If you hit a rock with an egg, it's such a waste of eggs. Meyer ended up bursting out laughing at Sevi's sly reply. In the past, if it was Meyer, he would have frowned like a dead rat, but now he jokes he's all grown up. I patted Sevi on the shoulder because I was proud of Sevi. At that moment, Meyer suddenly looked at Nova and asked. So, Nova Pelham, did you ever confess to June? Has he ever confessed? I took my time to remember. I remember that when I was speaking forcefully on the periphery to clear up the misconception that Meyer and I had been lovers, Nova told me not to worry because he would be there himself if it came down to it. But to call this a confession was a bit iffy. While I was struggling with this, Nova jumped up with a blank look on his face. Don't tell me you heard that earlier. Of course I did. Nova and Sevi's faces turned somber as they saw Meyer answer as if it were a matter of course. A small voice could be heard murmuring, after all, His Excellency is not a human being. If not, Meyer grinned, expressing this viciously. I see you don't still have unfinished business, do you? Everywhere I looked, the figure was threatening. What the hell are you talking to them about? I slapped Meyer on the back. What the hell are you doing to the kids? But. But what? Don't say outrageous things. What are you going to do if you say such nonsense and cause problems in the love front of our children? Maya was frustrated, but kept his mouth shut honestly. Nova and Sevi's faces were downcast as if the complexion and pressure Meyer had given them even in that short time was no joke. While they were thus dwelling, one or two of the elite members of the Black Knights gathered. Wow, the dress is truly one of the greatest of all time. Probably for the next thousand years, there will not be a wedding dress that will be as good as this one. Axiom made a big fuss. The agreeable glances of those in the vicinity were disturbing in that he was merely exaggerating. I asked him as if I didn't think so. I thought it would be expensive, but I don't know the price of a formal dress is this dress that expensive. It's not a question of being expensive. It's a thousand to all right, all right. Axion waved his hand as he looked at Meyer's complexion. It also seemed that Meyer had shut Axion's mouth with a dirty look. I'll ask him separately later since it seems he won't tell me here with Meyer. I glanced at Axion. But Axion just shook his head with his eyes closed with a solemn expression. Don't look at me like that, Vice Commander. His Excellency is trying to kill me. What about me? You're throwing eyes at a person at the reception on the day of the wedding. Meyer replied with a face full of frustration. What would others see of me if they heard? I slapped Meyer's arm. Of course, my hand hurt more. Don't talk nonsense. If you keep bothering me one by one, I'll show you what throwing eyes is. Meyer's mouth was tight. Rober, watching him, chuckled. The Black Knight is no match for the tyrant. I'm sure you've seen this kind of figure in our lifetime. I couldn't imagine it before. Isn't that right, sister? I think so. Maybe this is exactly what I left one eye on in my last battle to see. The elite troops teased Meyer, as if they had been waiting only for this day. It was as if the distance that had previously confined them to the framework of commander and troopers had unknowingly disappeared, 
and they had been so friendly. It was a good thing we were all gathered at the fold. I asked what was on my mind. Come to think of it, what are you all going to do about the fiefs? Isn't it hard to manage the territory since most of you are commoners, except for Julieta? Would you like to study with me? Because giving titles and fiefdoms is giving, and directly governing is another matter. I deployed the water demon strategy, looking for someone to study with me. Chapter, 184 However, it was not easy for everyone to sneak a look. I've already got a person in charge of the estate. I don't have to study. Axion replied condescendingly. He's smart anyway. I doubted if he was lying to save himself from this position. Who is it? Began. He's a bit of an administrator. I don't think I agreed. As soon as Axion spoke, Began that had been missing a step to the side puffed out in frustration. But Axion didn't care and smiled and waved his hand. Ha ha ha, joking too. Jinia will be in charge of security in my territory. And. In short, you mean that you will mobilize all the Red Wolf troops as labor for the development of your territory. Jinia sighed and added. When the Red Wolf troops' reaction was unusual, Axion finally turned around in confusion. Why do you all look so unhappy? I'm paying you a lot of money. It's not about the money, it's about having to keep going after the captain. Still, you've gotten used to it. Getting used to it is such a terrible thing. Began shuddered with a strange sound. Well, I can't help it with Axion, who has the manpower to be useful. I have no choice but to give up. Then let's aim for the trio who don't have their own troops. When I looked back at the trio with a smile, Nova and Sevi quickly turned their heads and avoided eye contact. Wow, no loyalty. As expected, Julieta is the only one to believe in. I looked at Julieta when I was happy, but she just smiled awkwardly. I've got Rober. Everyone doesn't want to study, traitors. I murmured angrily. Meyer, who was listening quietly, carefully looked at me and added. You and they have different curricula anyway, so you can't take classes together. That's not the point. It's just that I don't want to study alone. I grumbled angrily at Meyer's response to the context blindness. Then I looked back at the children earnestly. Can't you study with me since everyone doesn't need a wedding gift? Ha ha. Ha 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 what do you want? They wouldn't say they would study even if they died. Giving up, I sighed deeply with my hands upon my hips. Then Julieta opened her mouth as if she had suddenly remembered something. However, as if she had made a mistake late, she blurted out the end of the sentence. Oh, yes, Vice Commander. Later on oh, no. What is it? I don't want to tell you on such a good day. There was anxiety and embarrassment on Julieta's face. But it didn't matter at all, I waved my hand out. No, it's okay. If I had to say, I was the type of person who didn't care much about packing seaweed soup in a lunchbox to an exam room. It wasn't until I repeatedly said it was okay that Julieta said carefully. Can you lend me that mental wizard later? I'm afraid my parents are going to be a bit of a nuisance. However, it was a bit of a disaster to deal with it physically, Julieta added with a slight smile. Agreeing fully with her mind, I nodded a little louder. Thus the banquet, which I don't know if it was a wedding reception or a title ceremony launch, proceeded until late in the evening. The other members of the expedition were also happy to think over their knighthoods and territories again and again. Nova introduced me to his family. They were so much alike that you did not have to ask where Nova's firmness came from. They bowed their heads and said that they were worried that Nova might have caused trouble. I roused them and told them how well Nova had done in the battle against the Demon King. Then, surreptitiously poking Nova in the side, I whispered. You said she looked like me, your sister. Not that you look alike on the outside. Nova smiled shyly. After a few moments of wondering where to begin, Nova became cautious. My sister is the matriarch of my family. When my father limped, she took responsibility for everything by herself. My sister piggybacked me and raised me too. That way, after my head grew a little bit, I knew I had to do something for the family. That was exactly what it was like to join the Black Knights. 
Nova smiled as he revived the moment. It's a gamble, honestly, isn't it? An expeditionary force is at first, she asked me if I was going to die or if I was crazy. You were there to take the entrance exam. After all, the day before I was to go to the exam to join the Black Knights, she gave me weapons and equipment as if she had given up. I had to take a sword as well, or I would fail the exam. Nova suddenly chuckled. I waited quietly for Nova to speak. I later found out that it had been bought for me with money from my sister's wedding fund. In the first place, my family didn't have enough money to buy the weapons in the first place. Nova's gaze became nostalgic as he looked at his sister who was talking with Julieta. The water in Nova's eyes smeared a little and quickly disappeared. It's hard, but she doesn't rely on those around her, she doesn't say a word about being weak. Still, she reaches out every time for her brother who is lagging behind, just like you. I think your sister is more amazing than me. I blurted out in admiration. It wasn't just words in my mouth, but I meant it. Nova changed the subject, touching his neck in embarrassment, feeling refreshed that he had confided the story he had been pushing to the back of his mind. Ha, huh, I'm already going to pay back the borrowed wedding money a hundred, no, thousand times over. Only the vice commander's wedding will be difficult, but we will still hold the wedding ceremony in a plausible manner. If it is not enough to pay back ten thousand times, tell me as well. Because I have to pay her the honorarium for sending the Black Knights an excellent shield. I laughed loudly and hit Nova's firm chest. Nova also smiled, unsure, and put his own big fist on mine. As the two of us continued our conversation, Meyer's eyes narrowed again as he talked with Axion and August from afar. Anyway, he's very sensitive. But since it was a happy day, I decided to let Meyer's rhythm match that of the new groom. I gave an exaggerated shrug. Ugh, the commander's eyes are utter axe eyes, axe eyes. Ha ha. I think we've reached the edge of the proximity gauge. Well, we did talk for a long time. I'm used to that now. Nova laughed as if he understood. Just then Nova's family called Nova. It was God's timing. Well then, I'll be on my way. As soon as Nova gave a brief silent bow and vacated his position, Sevi interrupted with a flourish. What were you talking about? About Nova's family. He said his sister had a hard time. Aha. Sevi nodded his head. Come to think of it, the biggest worry in the special unit was Sevi. Nova has a family, and Julieta has Rober. It was impossible not to be concerned about Sevi being alone in a grand duchy at such a young age. Sevi stared at Nova and his family and muttered to himself. Nova is lucky to have a family. Yes. Still, it's a relief. Anasta and Jean will go with you. At least I wasn't the only one who had such concerns. Anasta was worried about Jean and Sevi, who were still young, and requested that Jean and herself be assigned to a territory that belonged to the Grand Duchy of Sevi. It seemed that she would probably be there all the time, watching and helping. Sevi mumbled something to himself for no apparent reason. You don't have to treat me like a child. We're not treating you like a child, we help each other. Anasta and Jean can count on you to be there for them. Humph. Sevi snorted, but he didn't seem to mind. While Sevi wanted to be treated like an adult, it was not easy for adults to welcome the idea of actually being away from home alone and left in an unfamiliar place. Especially if he had been with the Black Knights for several years. Besides, there was no guarantee that no one would try to take advantage of Sevi due to becoming a Grand Duke at such a young age. For this reason, I was very pleased with Anasta's proposal. Sevi asked suspiciously with a mumbling voice. Didn't the vice commander make her do it? Me? To Anasta? Anasta is blind to the vice commander. Sevi was certainly right. I don't know whether the root of this was devotion or loyalty, but Anasta had some blind faith in me. My guess is that she could not forgive herself for believing that Fabian was a hero's timber. This reaction manifested itself as blind obedience to me. But Sevi's matters had nothing to do with me. I shook my head. Not at all. If Anasta hadn't said she'd go with you, I wouldn't stick Anasta to you, but I'd force you to stay in the castle until you became an adult. 
then I should thank Anasta. No, you don't want to study that much. The vice commander made the dungeon study inherently rigorous. Sevi chuckled. So it's my karmic reward after all. I sighed as if I had no choice. At that moment, Sevi lowered his voice as much as he could, looking at the faces of the people around him, and whispered. By the way, Vice Commander, His Excellency was checking to see how much holy water is left, but I think you should know. Thank you, Sevi. It really helped me to guess what was going to happen. I made up my mind to let Sevi's credit go high and let him be free from his studies. Chapter, 185 The reception was over. Tired of talking and dealing with people during the reception, I made an effort to remove the necklace around my neck. If it were original, the maids would have done it for me, but today was the first day of the wedding. Meyer and I were alone in the new room. I tried many times, but could not get it to go as I wished. I gave up immediately and plopped down on the sofa. My heart wanted to get rid of it, but I couldn't bring myself to do it, considering the price. Meyer came up to me, lifted my hair, and took off the necklace. His big, thick fingertips grazed the back of my neck. Meyer's whispering tongue tickled my side. You should have told me in advance. I'm a little embarrassed. Why are you embarrassed about taking off your necklace? It was kind of like an omen to take off my clothes. But I just couldn't say it that way, my throat was blocked. I'm worried about Sevi saying that he was checking the number of holy water. What on earth is there to drink holy water on your wedding night? If I'm going to drink holy water, I'm going to drink it, and what the hell am I going to do with it? I swallowed my spit. It wasn't that I never thought about the first night. I've prepared my own mind it was a good idea to take measures just in case. I think it's too much, but as expected, there's no need to worry. A tension I was not aware of until the reception tightened around my neck. He wandered on my bare skin, wondering if he realized the reason why I was ashamed, and Meyer's hand, which took off my necklace, hesitated what to do after that. I moistened my dry lips with my tongue. My nerves were on edge as I concentrated on his hand on my back. Did he accept my silence as permission? Gathering his courage, his hand went cautiously to the strings that tied my dress. The dress, which I could not put a price on the layers, fell to the bottom like a scattering of peony petals one by one. His hot breath on my neck. His breathing, which was somewhat rough, perhaps from nervousness, sounded particularly loud in my ears. I tried to stay as calm as possible, but it was not easy. Meyer couldn't stand it either, and he just laid me down on the sofa and draped himself over me. We're in trouble here. I said in a panic. L let's go to the bed. As soon as my words fell, Meyer lifted me up and took me to bed. The view went round and round. June. Meyer came up on top of me, trapping me in. It was dark for a moment as his huge body blocked me on all sides. Finally, I can hardly believe it. Meyer rubbed his lips lightly on my cheek several times and murmured softly. He was so moved that his voice, speaking alone, was full of emotion. Meyer's hand carefully touched my hip. I could feel from his fingertips that he was concerned that if he put the slightest pressure on his hand that it would break, as if thin glass. The hand that reached me was hot. I let out a breath. My head felt foggy. I wanted to throw reason away like sand being swept away by a wave, but that was not possible. I finally opened my mouth before I could think rationally any longer. Meyer, I know it's obvious, but I'm just asking, just in case it's your first time, right? Meyer's body stiffened. He had been clinging to me, but he raised his body and frowned. The look in his eyes was full of frustration. Do you think it's not my first time? That comment just now was very unpleasant. I know, but I ask just in case. But why are you asking me that? Um. I muffled my words with an awkward laugh. Meyer sighed, and then he raised his body, raising his dark eyebrows as if he really had to say a word. Like when you kissed me the first time, you keep making people. Click. The sound of a metal lock closing snapped off Meyer's words with a light heart. Phew. The handcuffs hidden behind the pillow were safely put on Meyer. 
Given his ridiculous stats, it was impossible with my reflexes in the first place. I only hoped that Meyer was caught off guard since it was the first night, but fortunately, it flowed as expected. I crossed one of the big mountains first, still breathing out and wiping the sweat off my face. Meyer, who had no idea why looked at me in a daze. June. What the hell is this? In fact, I thought I might die if the commander went crazy. But to handcuff a person. Meyer angrily tugged at his hands. I was worried that it might break for a moment, but the chain was stronger than I thought. If it had been a mediocre chain, it would have snapped like a piece of thread at once, but knowing Meyer's power figures, there was no way I could have found such a crude device. I asked Vince to raid the secret warehouse of Grand Duke Knox and barely saved a flail artifact for the cavalry. The blacksmith separated the long chain part and asked a master craftsman to modify it, which made it quite well made, even with a meticulous eye. It even became a new artifact, and there was a status debuff effect. Strength stats reduced by 20%. Meyer's 20% reduction in power does not change the fact that he is the strongest of mankind, but I don't know how pleased he would be with that numerical adjustment. The master craftsman was frustrated for a while that the first artifact he created was a handcuff, not a sword, spear, or shield. But he quickly recovered his spirits positively, wondering how many blacksmiths would try to create even one artifact in their lifetime. Of course, even though it was an amazing artifact, it should not be a job for Meyer to break the chain if he wanted to. But he chose to seek my consent. Undo this, June. I had everything in my mind. I shook my head firmly at the words handed with a sigh. Mind? Preparing holy water. How on earth were you going to overwork me? It's not for you. Meyer countered. Recently, he changed the title to you one, but when he got a little excited, the old title came out automatically. Then what were you going to use it for? Meyer did not answer easily and kept his mouth shut. He was not a man who would lie to absolve himself of a situation, so perhaps the story that he wasn't trying to use it for me is true. I know my strength and stamina. I also have in mind the possibility that I may not have the self-control to protect my reason. So. Meyer mumbled. No way. I recalled one hypothesis that had crossed my mind. The reason I didn't think of this first was because I thought, no way, even though it was our wedding night. I exclaimed in surprise. Don't tell me you were going to self-harm. Self-harm, you're exaggerating. It's just proper physical control. Proper. I don't want to spend the first night on a bloody sheet. Is it okay to have the first night in a chain? It's okay because it's included in a kind of fetish. You're making no sense. Meyer shouted loudly. As such, we remained facing each other for a while. On the other hand, I was concerned about his body temperature, which was touching me all the time. It was hot, as if his warmth had burned into my body. First of all we can't just keep doing this for now. From the looks of it, it doesn't look like he's trying to force the handcuffs off. I'll try to coax him a little bit more. I climbed up on top of Meyer's body with a sly smile on my face. As I did so, I whispered a small kiss on his cheek, just as he had done earlier. Just hang in there. I'll do my best. Why are you being nice to me wait, June Lightyisha? Why do you look so used to it? Come on, that's not the point. What do you mean that's not the? I closed my mouth around Meyer's chattering lips. His complaints, which he had spouted earlier, quieted like a demon. I kissed him, rubbed my firm body against his and put my hand down. I think he's around here somewhere. But I didn't catch him where I thought he was. Then something heavy and thick arrived in my hand. I traced it again and again. Meanwhile, Meyer gasped and gritted his teeth, looking at me as if to swallow me with eyes full of lust and jealousy. You must tell me at the end of the day. You surely had other men in your life besides me, didn't you? You keep avoiding my words. But his words entered one ear and slipped out the other. It was because I was so embarrassed by what I said that I didn't have time to concentrate on what Meyer said. It was only then that I could see why Meyer had to defend his right hand leg so far. So I was embarrassed. The bottom of the final boss is also the final boss. 
I swallowed a groan that I didn't know whether it was sighing or exclamation. But it was a multi-tiered, no, a gigantic tiered. Isn't it the same as shouting that there's nothing good about growing up, that sour grapes? Self-justification of someone who hasn't had a big one. Maybe it's me who is self-justifying. However, a woman has pride, and she has stepped forward confidently, and she can't bite the bullet now after having embarked on a confident ride. Okay. The day would never come in this lifetime that I would face anything other than mire anyway. Not wanting to cause an innocent death, I was determined to do so. The time for another battle awaited me. Chapter, 186 I heard Fabian's expedition team close the dungeon tremendously this time. Is it the emergence of new powers? Well, no matter how much you fly and crawl, they won't be a competitor for the Black Knights oh no, it's Meyer Knox. The expedition members, who had been talking alone, found Meyer Knox appearing at the end of the corridor and kept their mouths shut. They turned their heads sideways at an angle so as not to disturb Meyer Knox's path. Meyer Knox passed by without even giving them a glance, but the intimidation that pushed at their heads remained until the moment he disappeared. They breathed a sigh of relief when Meyer passed by. No, we didn't say anything bad about Meyer Knox, so why are you being so facetious? Why are you asking me that? You were looking scared with me. Is this exactly the intimidation of the 80th level? After all, no matter how many Fabian expeditions fly and crawl, it will be the Black Knights who will fight against the Demon King. They mumbled, thinking Meyer couldn't hear them, but his acute hearing caught every breath they took. But Meyer did not care. He was always at the top, and it seemed fate that the newly formed expedition would follow him. There have been many who have struck for a brief, sparkling moment. Numerous expeditionary parties had set out in great force to overtake the Black Knights, but none had been able to stand before him. Perhaps the Fabian expedition would do the same, and Meyer had gone over lightly. He hoped that this time that upstart force will be a little more excited and embark on a more aggressive approach to closing the dungeon. As such, he had no special expectations for the Fabian expedition, and he had to be frankly surprised that the gap between them and the Black Knights had been narrowing more and more. And that they had soon reached a position where they threatened the stronghold of the Black Knights. And that wasn't the end. The Fabian expedition was finally to point its sword close to the neck of the Black Knights. The word still became maybe. Perhaps the Fabian expedition would overtake the Black Knights. At that level, no matter how much he was Meyer, he could not sit back and watch them. Commander, this is the information on the attack dungeon that the Fabian expedition submitted to the performance report. Meyer read the report handed to Axion at once. The more he read the report, the deeper the wrinkles on his forehead. Meyer asked, placing the report roughly on the desk. Does this make sense? Of course I think it's impossible, but they actually did it. Axion's face was also full of doubt. The dungeons are so difficult to time that you never know when or where they will appear. But the Fabian expedition was different. They seemed to have seen it all. They had conquered most of the dungeons over the past few years. Of course, there were times when Meyer and the Black Knights also conquered dungeons that way, but that was because their base area was originally large enough to have many dungeon occurrences. It was almost impossible for a base area as small as the Fabian expedition. Axion, who knew exactly what Meyer's question was, told him the facts he had come to know. They had been mainly reaching the territory of the owner of the dungeon just before the dungeon was created. It seems that they were the first ones to get permission to go through with the dungeon. There have been one or two coincidences. It's impossible to do that unless you have all the insight into when and where the dungeon will be opened. The existence of such a person is unprecedented. That's what I'm saying. Meyer touched his chin. But even if it's unprecedented, it doesn't prove that it doesn't exist. Still, let's investigate it just to be sure. Understood. Axion left the office as soon as Meyer's words fell. Competent as he was, not too long after, he carefully organized the information about the Fabian expedition members and handed it to Meyer. Meyer read the roster slowly. They must have attacked the empty dungeon they were all good people. Some of them were people who, if they had not belonged to the expedition, Meyer would have gone ahead and made a proposal to join the Black Knights. 
who among them knew about the dungeon? The direction of the expedition dungeon was a fairly important decision. It was clear that it was the expedition leader, or at least in a position where they could speak directly to the expedition leader, just because no one else could interfere. The main members. Meyer's gaze, which had been looking at the main members of the Fabian expedition in this way, stopped for a moment at one of the people. Meyer, thinking he had looked at the wrong person, asked with a frown. By the way is the support wizard a mainstay member of the Fabian expedition? Yes. That's a bit strange to me, too. She's even a one-armed person. Axion also had a dazed face. The dungeon participation rate is higher than I expected. Is that so? Does she have some special ability? Well. I have not heard of any special abilities, but rumor has it that she is Fabian's faithful dog. She does anything for Fabian. I think that's why he keeps her close to him. Meyer countered with a cluck of his tongue. Loyalty alone determines the main members of the Order. Well, you'd be on the verge of the elite of the Black Knights, Axiom. No, I have only loyalty to the commander, don't I? I told you that I was on the verge, but you didn't think it was impossible, did you? Axiom chuckled at Meyer's joke. The two men, who were in a similar age range and had a tendency to swap their lives into one that they were immersed in, were quite in tune with each other. Meyer tapped his fingers lightly on the wooden desk in his office and repeated. Supportive wizard. It was then. He began to pay attention to a support wizard named June Carantia, whom Meyer had given him. And he didn't know if it was coincidence or not, but it wasn't long before June Carantia tried to approach the Black Knights, slowly. Her target was Nova Pelham, who had joined the Black Knights elite relatively shortly. She approached him with reasonable caution, but the problem was that the very person she approached in that manner was Nova. Information about the dungeon was top secret, and Nova was not of the smallest reach to obtain such information. Meyer, sensing something fishy, immediately questioned Nova, who, unable to resist the order of Meyer, the leader of the group, finally confided the truth. Hmm June Carantia. Do you know her? Nova, who had heard Meyer's soliloquy, opened her eyes wide and asked back. Not wanting to reveal that he had been paying attention to her for no reason, Meyer shook his head in denial. In the meantime, try to be as discreet as possible try to keep up with her tone. I understand. As Nova did not know about Meyer's suspicions, he could not understand Meyer's order, but instead of asking a counter-question, he nodded obediently. As such, Nova left, and Meyer called Axion and Agasto to discuss the pertinent matters. Axion mumbled seriously. I didn't know it was that easy to solve high-level dungeon information there must be some kind of dream. How much so, would she dare dig a pitfall for the Black Knights? August shook his head. Even with the large number of dungeons closed by the Fabian expedition, they were no match for the Black Knights, considering their substantial level. Meyer, who had been listening to the conversation, made a decision. Let's move once as per that information, just in case. But. I can't do anything but give a false kick. Meyer chuckled. Already they had been caught up within sight of the Fabian expedition. It was necessary to point out a certain amount of risk in order to know if she really was a gem of dungeon information. Axion and August expressed their concern, but a braced Meyer was adamant. Thus, they followed June's information to the designated location and soon came upon the gate in all its vividness. It really was true. As they gazed at the dizzying gate, they felt as if they were possessed by something. When it came time to come, Meyer himself was puzzled, even as he said he would try to come. The dungeon they entered was somewhat more difficult than they had been told, but that much was to be expected. Perhaps it was just a coincidence. Meyer called Nova and ordered him to interact with June as soon as the opportunity arrived. He also told him to tell him immediately if he had any information to pass along. Nova, who is far from spying, lying, and questioning, seemed to be disappointed by Meyer's orders. I feel like you're taking advantage of people, a little. Don't you realize that they're taking advantage of you too? That's true, but. Their first meeting was pure liking and coincidence, but June Carantia, who gave him the information about the dungeon when he gave it to him, must have had an agenda. Nova mumbled sadly as his large body drooped. 
but she didn't seem like a bad person. That's not your call. Meyer said deliberately and firmly. Apart from Meyer's unwillingness to order, Nova also acknowledged the importance of the information that June had given him. Nova nodded decisively. I'll give it one good try. As Meyer had expected, June gave Nova information about dungeons many times after that. And all of those dungeons had produced meaningful results. It was pointless to deny the truth when it came to this. The information June Carantia gave was solid. Of course, there was no certainty that she knew anything about the dungeon. And she might just be telling them what she picked up, too. But why on earth would she be giving the Black Knights information? Meyer stared out the window at Nova and June sitting side by side in the corridor, conversing. She lifted her left arm involuntarily, laughing hysterically at the amusing joke, perhaps oblivious to the fact that she had no left arm. However, she quickly realized that she had no hand to hit her thigh, so she smiled awkwardly and lowered her arm. Chapter 187 The tactless Nova kept on chattering without knowing it. Come to think of it, when did she lose that arm? She's a supporting wizard, so she wouldn't have had to go ahead it must have been quite painful. The information that Axion had come to know did not include such details of the situation. Meyer kept his eyes on June and Nova as they talked. Somehow he couldn't shake his eyes. August, who was watching Meyer like that, asked implicitly. It looks like you're paying attention. Oh. Meyer slowly leaned his head back after August called out to him. Isn't it amazing that she's an elite supporting wizard? Meyer's interest in June was not just because he was curious, but for other reasons that did not immediately come to mind. Having defined his own disturbed true feelings in such a simple manner, Meyer added as if to excuse himself. I guess they used her with great care in the Fabian expedition because they had some use for her. That's why I was looking at her. Useful it didn't seem that way. Why do you think so? She didn't seem to be treated very well from what I saw in person. Meyer's mouth involuntarily hardened. It was impossible for August not to notice such a sudden change in Meyer's momentum. The problem, however, was that he had no idea why Meyer was acting like that. August overturned his words a little perplexed. Come to think of it, I think I might have misunderstood. I saw it as I passed by. Meyer reflected on what he had seen in silence. All the protective gear that did not fit the known level of protection was made, and there were scars all over her face as if she had not received timely treatment for her wounds. Certainly far from the treatment a person with the ability to know information about the dungeon would receive. Was he holding too high expectations for her abilities? Not long after, Meyer happened to see firsthand how she was treated by the Fabian expedition. June exclaimed frustratedly. What's your problem when you have a choice of dungeons? We must conquer the Riikyo dungeon. But the Riikyo dungeon is an underwater dungeon. It's not only dangerous because it conflicts with our main dealer, Fabian's attribute. Why on earth would we want to go to that dungeon? Decca, the vice commander of the Fabian expedition, countered. Fabian stepped away and listened intently to their conversation, struggling with his arms crossed. Inevitably, it seemed that the Fabian expedition was in the middle of a debate about which dungeon to attack. Meyer rolled his tongue. Why are they exchanging opinions about dungeon strategy in a place like this? The place where they were fussing was the garden next to the cloister. From the looks of it, they had been given a dungeon option, but they had better be careful, as it was the core, if not the top secret, information of the expedition. I feel like I'm a spy for no reason. Meyer was not happy, but that didn't mean he could casually leave his position. Not because he was concerned about what dungeon they would choose, but because he was concerned about what June Carantia was saying. As a result, it became right that he was spying, but Meyer didn't care. June insisted on attacking the Riikyo dungeon alone, but she looked so impatient that she didn't have time to worry about the other's eyes on her. I'm worried about the properties of the water, but you don't have to do that. As long as I get to level 60. Aha, it was to raise your level after all. No matter how desperate you are to raise your level, how can you send your colleagues to death? Meyer also agreed to some extent with Decca. He was a little disappointed. Was it an argument to raise her level, not because she knew something? 
June, your dungeon participation rate has caused a lot of talk among the other members. You must realize the fact that Fabian is giving you a lot of preferential treatment out of consideration. It's not like that. There's not much experience left until level 60. I'll have a new magic skill when I reach level 60. No, you won't. And do you think it will change that much just because you'll be at the 60th level? A support type who doesn't even fight monsters properly. And even if a new skill is created, isn't it support magic? Decca had June cornered. June tried to argue with him in any way, but in the end, she was unable to say anything and remained silent. She sighed quickly and took a step back. It's not to raise my level. Even if my level doesn't go up our expeditionary force level is good enough to conquer it right now. How do you know that? April, the main healer of the Fabian expedition, who was listening attentively at that moment, added cautiously. Isn't there a reason why June insists so many times? You're the one who's making all that reorganization, and that's why she's so stubborn. But we've never had a bad time listening to June. It was just because we were lucky and competent, April. It's ever been bad, but it's never been comfortable, has it? We've suffered to death, rolling on the floor. Decca and April argued. June spoke to Fabian, who had been watching their conversation closely without saying anything until then. Fabian. I'm really serious. You know I don't say this all the time. Next time we have to conquer that dungeon. We're going to conquer the Akalo dungeon, June. Fabian. Calm down and think about it. Your proposal is too reckless. Fabian patted June gently on the shoulder as he said this and slipped past June and out of the yard. Decca followed Fabian as he did so. April looked at June with regretful eyes, but she too did not remain by June's side. April and Decca's grumbling voices grew farther and farther. You're so mean, both of you. Calm down, it's a decision made for the expedition. You're so determined for others, but why are you so adamant for her? That's. June bit her lip regretfully as she watched their backs. They were on the same expedition, but there seemed to be an uncrossable river between them. June stayed there for a while until she got up from her seat, and Meyer kept looking at June's back, which was drooping. Then, as if possessed by something, Meyer returned to the office and asked to obtain the right to attack the Riekio dungeon, which June said they would still attack. Axion was confused by Meyer's unexpected order, but he, who was competent, followed the order. And in the dungeon, Meyer was able to obtain artifacts that increased his attribute resistance. Axion was happy. With this, I don't have to worry about shields, and I can shoot my magic flat and wild. That's a terrible idea, Axion is this the kind of idea a human being could have? Nova sighed, the party that had been balls of fire going back and forth over his head. Axion giggled and held Meyer out as a shield. Our commander would welcome it. That's what I thought too inside. I thought that no one would guarantee my human rights. As Meyer listened to the dialogue between Nova and Axion, the fact that Fabian was also a flame wizard suddenly came to his mind. With an artifact like this, that one would be of great tactical use as well. Did she also know what artifacts would be found in the dungeon? But why not just reveal that fact as it was? If he were Fabian, he would fully trust and follow what she said. Maya recalled June looking blankly at Fabian's back. Why? He couldn't easily forget the particularly occluded figure. The presence of June Carantia, who gave way to Maya's brain in such a way, was greatly engraved in his mind. But it was after the results debriefing was over and everyone had scattered to their own bases. Everyone in the Black Knights, including Meyer, pushed forward with the dungeon attack, and as such, he seemed to gradually forget about June. However, every time they conquered a dungeon and were thwarted, June's image would suddenly come to the surface. If only she were with him, all these dead ends would be resolved in no time at all. After all this time, the next year's results briefing was approaching. Before going to the capital, Meyer stood firm on Nova. You must bring her to our expedition. Tell her she can have anything she wants. I understand. I will do my best. Still, we are quite close, so I think it is quite possible. 
Nova replied in a tone of conviction that was unlike him and then left the office. It was a very encouraging attitude, but he wondered why for Meyer, Nova's friendly relationship with June Carantia was not very pleasant. It's not funny. If she was close to Nova and she would turn to the Black Knights, it would be very good for him. Moreover, it was Meyer Knox, himself, who made him hang around with June as much as possible from the beginning. Unable to grasp his own psychology, Meyer leaned back against the back of the sofa with a sigh. Axion, who had been listening to the conversation between Nova and Meyer, asked in total incomprehension. Is she worth it? My instincts tell me so. Then it is accurate. Because the commander's instincts are extremely accurate in dungeon exploits. Axion broke a joke. Meyer smirked and pointed to the tropics where he drank alcohol to change the subject. Get me a drink. Yes, yes. Axion bent excessively and quickly took out the two highest looking liquors from Meyer's liquor display table. Chapter 188 The Nocantoria Castle's liquor warehouse was a treasure trove that had been passed down through the millennia. A rare opportunity to drink when Meyer proposed alcohol first. There was no way Axion would miss that. Meyer's tongue rolled when he saw Axion's frivolous smile. Anyway, greedy. So why don't you just unload a little booze for your people who usually have a hard time, this won't happen. A man who lives in a warehouse with a pile of liquor. Axion's gaze wistfully treated the liquor in the display table. Meyer snickered as Axion handed him the liquor and poured it into his cup. Humph. If I drink alcohol, it won't be with you. No, why? Why? Because if someone more competent than you likes to drink, I'll have to invite them to join me. Ha, huh, is there any expedition member more capable than me? Maybe, I don't know. Maya shrugged and pushed a glass full of liquor toward Axion. Maya was joking, but what came to mind for a moment was June Carentia's face. Does June Carentia like to drink? Soon Maya chuckled and shook his head. What a fuss. She hasn't even joined the Black Knights yet, so what did it matter if she liked alcohol or not? But just in case, he might want to take care of even one of the liquor bottles. Meyer secretly put one of the liquor bottles that Axion had placed on the table to the side. Axion, who didn't notice Meyer's insides at all, grumbled all day as he was wetted with a glass. Please take a little care of the existing members of your unit. If you keep doing that, it can be crooked. If you're crooked, I'll be right back. I'm already crooked. Do you always study how to win word wrestling in dungeons, Commander? How can you not lose a word? Actually, there is no way to lose and win at the right time. Oh, really? Until that moment, Meyer thought it would not be too difficult to embrace June. Fabian's attitude toward June was just as bad. He had heard rumors that she was Fabian's faithful dog, but perhaps it was because Fabian was the only one who would appoint her as a supportive wizard. If the Black Knights then had a proposal, she would come to them immediately. Maybe June gave information to the Black Knights through Nova in order to move to the Black Knights. Meyer did not doubt that. However, Nova brought news that Meyer had not expected at all. She turned me down. I'm disgraced, Commander. Nova bowed his head as if he were ashamed of him leaving in confidence. Axion did not hide a hint of resignation and lamented in a whisper. Wow, no matter how well the Black Knights have gotten along with the Fabian expedition recently she's not playing. No, sir. I was quite bewildered. Meyer kept his mouth shut and considered Nova's report carefully. She said no. Why? While Meyer was in a daze, Axion rebuked Nova with a furrowed brow. Didn't you make it too obvious? She seemed to have a strange plan. I know. I am not a good actor, but I still did my best. Nova looked sincerely frustrated. Axion spoke teasingly to such a Nova. Maybe you weren't as close as you thought. It was only your illusion that you were close, Nova. I am frankly a little embarrassed to say this with my own mouth, but I think I was much closer to her than most of the Fabian expedition members over there. Is her reputation that bad for the expedition team? It looks like that. Nova shook his head as if he were in shock at Axion's question. It's just you know. She's a supportive wizard, 
but she participated in dungeon attacks so many times. Axion directly prepared the report on the Fabian expedition. Axion rolled his tongue, as if he knew what it was that he could guess without looking at it with his eyes. Naturally, Meyer, who had expected June to come to him, looked at his palm, which was spread out in a blur. It was as empty as a mirage passing through. After that, Meyer often encountered June and Fabian. June was still shoddy, still desperate and tremendous, always craving something from Fabian. How could she go to such lengths and still not throw away Fabian? I would take better care of you and treat you better. Why do you follow such a man who is despised but does not recognize talented people? It was not until later that Meyer learned that Fabian had saved June's life. She went into the dungeon alone and Fabian saved her. June would give her life for Fabian's sake. She had already given up one of her arms. Fabian's dog. Meyer's lips pursed at the nickname hidden behind Grey Rose. Her loyalty was only proportioned to her savior, not to anyone else. And the salvation was that he didn't even have a chance to give it to her. Meyer Knox felt he had been ousted for the first time in his life. He was covered with an unfamiliar clumsiness that he had never felt even when Fabian turned the tables. Still, he only missed June Carantia and still had a chance to turn things around. Meyer did not let go of the string of hope. However, it was not long before the string of hope was broken and torn apart. This was because Tragula and Defectio, who had been an elite unit, had left the Black Knights and deserted en masse, taking their own members with them. The departure of the elite troops was a bigger blow than the others. Even if the Fabian expedition had been pulled out, it would have been meaningless if they had not been able to play an active role in the battle against the Demon King. It did not end there. After hearing the news later that Tragula had joined the Fabian expeditionary force, he felt empty, as if all his energy had been taken from him. Meyer buried himself in the back of the sofa. Was this the price he paid for all the heat and sincerity he put into closing the dungeon? A mere betrayal? Meyer laughed hysterically. In desperation, he called Axion and August to him. The Black Knights are over. You are outstanding people perhaps the Fabian expedition will accept you. The downfall of a man who was never going to give up, a man who was more massive than Mount Tai and more solid than a rock. Beyond the unusual, Axion and August were also perplexed by Meyer's weak appearance, which they had never considered. Don't talk nonsense. Axion, who tried to hide his upset heart, was envious and gave strength to his neck and said as if nothing happened. I have the same magical attribute as Fabian, the expedition leader there. There's no way they're going to hire me like that. There are several good healers over there, so they won't even need my help. I am loyal to His Excellency because you are a faithful follower of Esti. Marianne and I have no doubt that Esti. Marianne has led me to your side. There must still be something left for me to do besides His Excellency. August said so, but Meyer couldn't nod to him. There was a time when he had no doubt that he would defeat the Demon King. He thought that all the hardships that loomed over him would be painful. At the end of it all, he thought that he would finally cut off the Demon King's head. But now, in retrospect, all of that was just his own defensive mechanism to somehow get through this life without going crazy. What more do I need to do? What was I missing that made me lose to Fabian? Meyer lamented, biting his lip. Meyer Knox was more dedicated than anyone had ever been. He never failed to work hard, and he gave up his life to close dungeons. He could not have been more dedicated. In terms of competence and level, the Black Knights were much higher than the Fabian expedition. However, even his outstanding ability could not overturn the number of individuals who closed dungeons that's right. If only he knew the information about the dungeons. If he had, he wouldn't have missed the opportunity to kill the Demon King so vainly. But it was too late for regrets. The arrow had already left the province, time was running out, and there was nothing he could do to prevent the arrival of the appointed day. Meyer looked blankly at the backs of the last members of the group as they made their way toward the Demon King battle gate. The smallest back. June Carantia was following at the tail end of the seven. Perhaps the reason that June Carantia-like talent fell into Fabian's hands instead of his own was because Fabian was a Marianne's choice. No matter how much Meyer Knox struggled, 
he could not overturn it it was a future that had been decided in the first place. Such despair engulfed him. Chapter 189 The Demon King Castle Gate was opened and demons flooded out. He could not afford to let go of his sword from his hand because he could not participate in the Demon King battle. How long did he have to make it through such endless onslaught of demons? In the midst of all this, Meyer suddenly regressed for unidentified reasons. Although he had regressed, he could not afford to indulge the past that had returned. Time was a luxury, given the fact that he had once been defeated by Fabian. But he had lived a life buried in the dungeon to begin with. There were not so many moments when he could afford to give up. Jokes with his friends, petty drinking. He abandoned all personal matters and gradually became more and more inquisitive. People around him whispered that Meyer had no interest in others and was mad only for the dungeon. It was a similar assessment as the first round, but different. If the first round there was more respect for his constant protection of the world, in the second round there was more fear, albeit the same sense of awe. The expedition members did not call him commander either. Your Excellency. It showed the distance between them and himself. But Meyer was satisfied with that. No, in fact, he thought better of it. It was like compartmentalizing the first round and now. He could not miss out on talent and not make dumb mistakes as he did then. And if only he were the only one to defeat the demon lord. That's what Meyer thought at the time of his regression. Come to think of it, killing the demon king is something that was stolen from me by Fabian. Meyer chuckled. What had been so urgent in the past had turned out to be nothing when it actually passed. He had found a new purpose that was more important. Meyer carefully swept June's hair as she slept peacefully beside him. He could see her round forehead between her messy bangs. Amem. June wrinkled her brow and sputtered in her sleep. The gesture was adorable as she pulled Meyer into her arms, as if it were a matter of course. Immediately after his regression, he distanced himself from his surroundings but did not have much difficulty communicating. He already knew about the people around him. What they were all thinking, what their abilities were, whether they were people who betrayed their colleagues when pushed to the extreme. Since he knew everything, he didn't need to give them his attention, or so he thought. But not for June. Meyer did not know about June Carantia. All he knew was that she would not betray Fabian. Fortunately, she had a certain amount of emotion on her face, but he couldn't be completely relieved. It was because he was aware that she could hide what she really wanted to hide so that no one could find it what she really wants, what she's thinking. Meyer's true feelings were boiling with anxiety, as he had no easy idea what to expect. He did not want to be foolish enough to let her go after finally getting her to join the Black Knights. So he hung on to her every word and action, even more, anxious than before. Sometimes he went too far and June scolded him for it. Now that I think about it, I've done stupid things. Meyer chuckled and lightly touched the tip of June's nose with his hand. June squeaked as if her nose was itchy. He was worried about what he would do if June had any lingering feelings for the first round, but when the time came, it was Meyer who was still buried in the first round and held her by the ankle. He wondered how June had chosen him for the second round, how she felt about him, how she loved him he was able to fully understand all of that after the Demon King battle was over. Seeing June's body by his side with the moonlight hanging over his eyes, all of this felt unreal. How could he just enjoy this peace without the need to conquer any more dungeons? What could be more luxurious than this? Enthralled by the luxury he felt for the first time in his life, Meyer had his nose on her disheveled gray hair. The faint scent of bluebell perfume oil, a favorite of June's, wafted faintly to his nose, intoxicating him. Meyer. June mumbled in her sleepy voice. She looked like she was off for a second. It's still dawn. Sleep more, your majesty. Why are you up at dawn? Drunk on memories. Meyer chuckled and patted June on the back. Meyer's low voice lulled her to sleep like a lullaby. What memories? June closed her eyes again. Her rose-colored eyes were unfocused and blurred. Meyer spoke quietly. I was so desperate and in pain at the time, but looking back, it was all a memory. It was hard work to begin with. It's hard when you do it, 
but when you do it, it fills your heart. June yawned as she spoke. She must have mistaken Maya's recollection as a dungeon attack. Maya replied as if he were talking to her in a dazed way, smiling softly without correcting her. That's right. I was proud to do it. Meyer hugged June. On second thought, it was clear that he had already crossed firmly to June from the first round. I didn't know why I was so uncomfortable with June and Nova being attached to each other in the first round. Meyer chuckled alone. June's slender body in his embrace was like a sugar doll. It was precarious and as if it would crumble with a little force, but sparklingly beautiful and sweet, she was the most valuable thing in his life. She was a precious treasure he would have given his life for. He earned it the hard way, but his heart always went cold every time he recalled the memory of her once lost. He would make sure that never happened again. The only thing that will touch your feet is a silk carpet. No more hardships for you. Meyer held June in his arms, careful not to interrupt her again, and rubbed his cheek against her hair as he whispered. I'll clean up everything that's hanging on your toes now. He would cut down everything when a thorny field came out. If there were shards of glass scattered about, he would sweep them all away, even with his bare hands. If a sleek needle path faced her, he would get down on the flat floor and her feet would step on him to let her pass. That was the path that June Lightyisha deserved to follow for her hard work. June Carantia was a nuisance to the Carantia family. A mother who died an early death. The stepmother who was born when June knew how to count. To make matters worse, after her younger brother, Eugene, her presence in Carantia dropped to the level of a carpet in front of the front door. She was usually out of sight, and only when it rained or shoes got dirty on a good night was she finally remembered. Insect, the half-qualified, the one who can't even do what she's supposed to do right. All of these were qualifiers that replaced June's name. So much so that when June emerged as a supportive wizard, her first thought was, oh, there's one more thing to taunt me about. Why did I, of all people, express myself as a supportive magician when I did? If I had not manifested at all. A negative thought passed through June's head. June immediately shook her head. Nothing in this world was meaningless. The supportive wizards were also useful to the world, so is he. Marianne must have sent down her talents to her. The country must also believe in the potential of supportive wizards. Otherwise, she would be too miserable. June held her head and did her best to pretend to be okay. Could she help? However, everyone pointed fingers at the theme of supporting wizards, saying, imitating wizards that show off their power. Every time June expressed herself as a supportive wizard, people bullied and criticized her more and more. June still smiled unconcernedly, as if nothing was wrong, but as the sun went down and she remained alone in her room, an endless feeling of vagueness overcame her. June lay down on her old bed. The bed she had used as a child was small for her large body. It felt like a frame that cut her off and confined her. It was as if it specified that her limits were here. As if trying to deny such a reality, June also fantasized every time she slept. A named expedition would check out my abilities and make a proposal to join them. And then I would be famous as a supportive wizard. Wouldn't that make my parents and the villagers recognize me and say I'm amazing? While spreading the wings of my imagination in this way, I suddenly came to a quick realization that they would not change if I were to rise to some awesome position. Rather, it was more realistic to say that the topic was too much. I don't know if there will be an expedition to acknowledge me in the first place. If such a presence exists, I would give my life to be loyal to them. In this way, everything in the world held June down frustratingly. June abandoned her days, holding back her true feelings that were about to explode at any moment. Then one day, St. Marianne came to visit her. Chapter 190 St. Marianne told her that she needed June's ability to save the only possible hero who could protect the world. She needed her. For her, St. Marianne was directly sagacious. That fact alone was enough to make June full of elation at the same time, a dreadful feeling came over him. I I am not confident. It's a huge responsibility. June Carantia. You can do it. I'm scared. 
I'm scared that I have to give my soul to someone I don't even know besides what if it doesn't go right and I just die. I believe in your potential that she discovered. St. Marianne then showed June the existence of another world that she had to save, the hero she would become. The stranger was painted as if she could see the stranger in front of her. She spoke passionately, her eyes sparkling with enthusiasm. June saw a stranger laugh and call her name constantly. Perhaps more times than her parents had called my name since she was born. June Carantia was not a good enough person to willingly endure sacrifice for the world. It was because she knew that sacrificing herself like that would make no one pay attention to her. But at least that person would if it was that person who first recognized me. I wonder if they would remember my sacrifice. Won't they have to chew on the idea that there was someone called me? After a few moments of pondering, June decided to sacrifice, not for the world, but for her as she lay dying on the cold floor. June raised her head. Her crimson eyes shone with certainty as she gazed at the white, Holy tea. Marianne. I will try. If I had that kind of ability. Okay. I'll give you the ultimate weapon thank you for your tough decision, June. Carantia. She used the ultimate technique in such a way that she was prepared to die, but when June opened her eyes and woke up, she was inside the body of the hero. A completely different world. Her family all welcomed her. They said they really thought she was going to die, and cried out loud that there was no other filial woman. June sat in a daze, not knowing what was going on or what she was supposed to do. They all thought he had amnesia due to the aftereffects of the accident. But that doesn't matter. She's still alive. Embracing her, Yoon Jori's mother's words restrained June's conscience, which was not real. Should I say? I'm not her. However, June could not muster the courage to say the words when faced with the affection and warmth of a family, which she was feeling for the first time. Time passed in that way. The friend who had always been with her in the memories of the hero June saw visited her for a long time after that. And they talked consistently about their past memories from beginning to end, as if they were trying to revive her memories somehow. Although the word useless was at the end of her neck, the favor of my first peer was so sweet that June continued to lie about amnesia. Then one day, the friend brought up an unexpected story. You know the game you used to play often. Huh? Oh, sorry. You don't remember it's called the Holy Demon War. It's a game you really liked before the accident. It wasn't that June didn't know anything about the game. Through the memories that is T. Marianne had shown her, she knew that the hero would accept information about his world in that way. But she was taken aback because she did not expect it to suddenly pop up from here and now. The friend who thought June didn't know anything started explaining step by step. You love the character June there, but there's a weird rumor going around in the community. What kind of rumors? June's heart skipped a beat for no reason. June tried to act nonchalant. There's a rumor that there's a hidden route. There's a saying that if you get a full level of June, it opens you're the only one who got June's full level, so I actually thought you posted it. That holy demon war, how do you do it? As the hidden route opens, June Carantia becomes the main character, and Meyer turns into a playable character. It was questionable why the terms of the hidden route were her. Fortunately, June had existing data left behind by the hero, and all she had to do was start a new game. There really was a hidden route. Honestly, I thought it was just a phishing text circulating on the web. Her friend rolled their tongue in surprise. They then fussed, frankly, I wasn't sure I could get June to the 99th level, they said, I get to see a hidden route thanks to you. I think the balance is appropriate because June is a fixed character, which makes the difficulty that much higher, but Meyer is the strongest character. Most of the words she didn't catch in her friend's words, but the general background was perfectly familiar. June was immediately hooked on the game. It was very strange to see herself moving around in the little box. It was like she was playing as an expedition herself. Come to think of it, how did the hero survive? Did she defeat the Demon King? There was much to wonder about, but there was no way for June to know. She just vaguely prayed that it would work out. It wasn't easy just because it was a game. Dying and being defeated but June did not give up. 
After several months of concentrating on the game in this way, the second Demon King also collapsed. Despite the fact that it was through the screen, June clenched her fists in accomplishment, as if she had done it herself. In the game, June had become the hero who had defeated the Demon King she crouched on her old bed, still dreaming of it every night. The game ended and the ending scroll went up. A briefly written afterward. June looked back at the words floating on the screen in a daze. June Carantia became June Lightyisha, built an empire, and lived happily ever after. At that moment, the white letters on a black background blurred and widened for a moment. Then it quickly changed to other letters. Thanks to your ability, we were able to defeat the Demon King. The letters that floated as if typing one by one seemed as if they were speaking to June. June's hand on the gamepad was straining. The hero. This was the message she gave her. June snuggled up so that she could get into the screen and carve each letter that came to mind into her eyes as she chewed and swallowed. I'll live here as June, so live there as much as you want. It was then that June realized that the hidden route she had just played was after she had used the soul scale and the hero had revived in her own body. It really was real. She had become a hero. Unknowingly, tears spilled down her cheeks. June looked at the monitor screen, unable even to wipe her tears. The image of herself on the black screen was no longer the gray-haired June Carantia. Knowing that she was no longer June Carantia, knowing that she had to adapt to this body. She could not easily admit this fact because she felt guilty that she might have taken the hero's body. Perhaps the hero had guessed all of this and was therefore sending such a message. June wiped her tears with the back of her hand but continued to stare at the monitor. She wondered if the moment she blinked, a message she couldn't see would pass her by. She did not forget her sacrifice. She cared about her to the end, even to the point of sending her such a message. That alone was worth her sacrifice. June whispered quietly, smiling. Thank you. Five years after the end of the Holy Demon War, the Light Tian Dynasty was in its third year before I knew it. At first I knew nothing about what I was supposed to do as Emperor, but two years of overnight and infusion-style education made me able to imitate an emperor, even if only roughly. As soon as the emperor thought I had learned enough to deserve it, he gave it over to me and received a quiet country estate that was a distance from the capital. No longer the only emperor, but one of the nobility, enjoying his old age freely, he seemed as emphatic as if he had a huge load on his shoulders. Recently, he had gotten a taste for the chess game I taught him, and every time he saw me, he thrust a chessboard in my face, but his ability had progressed day by day every time we meet. At first I had no particular bond with the prior emperor, but perhaps because I had studied with him for two years on the qualities of an emperor, I was more likely to trust and rely on him. The previous emperor also thought of me as his own granddaughter or child, since he did not have another bloodline. Come to think of it, it hasn't been looked for this year. Chapter 191 I was also busy. Everyone treated me as a hero who had defeated the Demon King, so I had no obstacles daring to inaugurate a new empire, but it was just a lot of work. The empire was exhausted from the war against the fate that had lasted nearly twenty years. Embedding it would not be easy. What can I do? I have to change the human beings. The fire was lit at the feet of the nobility, who thought I would be more lenient than Meyer. Until now, the cooperation of the nobles was actively needed in the touchy situation where the gates had broken out, and the establishment of expeditionary forces in various places tilted the promotion of military force. The former emperor devoted himself to a tug of war with the nobles, since they would all have to die together if a rebellion broke out in the wrong direction. The shell of the empire remained intact, but its contents had long since been starved of food and drink. Therefore, it was only natural that tax revenues and fiscal management would not be tightened. But I was different. The Black Knights, including Meyer Knox at the top of the armed forces, were behind me. As I was from an expeditionary force with a strict upper and lower command, the other expeditionary forces were also the ones who respected me. I was not afraid to be candid, and I happily adjusted tax rates, built roads, and developed a welfare policy for those who had lost family members to the demons that had burst through the gates. In the latter case, people like Sevian Began, who had lost their families and joined the expedition, sent great support and help. 
To some extent, once the empire enters a period of stability, schools need to be built. This was something I had planned from the time I regained power, as I was well aware of the importance of public education. I gave the order to Axion and the other mages and scholars to try to put together an educational program, which would produce meaningful results as early as next year and as late as within three years. The list of tasks to be handled was almost as long as my life's bucket list. I guess I'm suffering from an obsessive-compulsive need to call it a bucket list. But something like the importance of education was a relatively less desperate issue unless I had experienced a world that was not a status-based society in the first place. And such problems were scattered. It seemed that I had to keep running at least until we had a stable system in place. Perhaps the fortunate thing is that the treasury is large. The reason it was wide was also really embarrassing. Meyer, who had been making commemorative coins, stamps, and this and that since the wedding, found it interesting and spurred the production of commemorative items after that. Commemorative posters, commemorative hardcover notebooks, decorative plates with commemorative drawings, commemorative liquor. Selling a set of mediocre black ink and flag pens called the Colors of the Black Knights. He even launched a grey ink named June Lightyisha Ink and put forward the tagline, Romantic Whispers in the Mist. I patted him on his sturdy, broad back as I said, embarrassed and shameful. Who buys this stuff? I've made you my motif, and of course, everyone in the world will live. Are you going to do business with that sense of nonsense? But what I really couldn't talk about was the reality. How did I know that Grey Ink would begin to gain whirlwind popularity as an essential element when lovers exchange romantic letters? There is something about the fact that it is blurred, not crisper than black ink, that makes it better for whispering secret words. That was not all. When Meyer learned of the high demand for the commemorative coinage, he immediately began coins with photos engraved with the profiles of the members of the Black Knights. Since this was a time when there were no laws against infringement of portrait rights, of course the Black Knights did not agree to this. The commemorative coins were measured at a slightly higher value than the cost of the coins because of their strong commemorative meaning. Despite this, the commemorative coins of the Black Knights sold like hotcakes. It wasn't just selling it moreover, they were sold at random. As a result, coins from popular elite members of the team were sold for more than money. When all the coins were collected, an event was held to present a specially made palm-sized folding screen portrait album of the Black Knights. In social circles, collecting and exchanging commemorative coins set spread into a new fad. To stimulate their psychology, Meyer did not forget to sell separately a case in which commemorative coin sets could be collected. The thin, wide ebony wood case was decorated with gold insignia at the corners and the Black Knight's insignia was engraved in the middle. Inside, he made a separate room for the velvet-wrapped coins but embroidered the name of the corresponding member on each platform in small letters. It was a terrible business move indeed. Isn't this gambling? Where on earth did he learn all that stuff? I seriously wondered if he had ever had a flowing, curly tail to tell, but I was sure he never did. If all of this came out of Meyer's head, he was truly a man of rare and devilish talent. It wasn't enough that he was the strongest mankind had ever known, but that he also had a talent for business. At first, I thought his pledge to help me frugally was preposterous, but it actually happened he poured money into my stomach and said proudly. I've thought about it, and I still think the more money you have, the better. It was a statement that could only be made by a man with more money than anyone else in the empire, to which the only reply was that the person who had more was stronger. What you do in the future will cost a lot of money. I want to let you do everything you want to do. But the intention itself is good, so for me, it was a bit much to tell him to be appropriate. In fact, if I only look at the rich treasury, I would be full even if I didn't eat rice. For him, I could endure enough to have my face stuffed in all directions throughout the empire. The sun crashed into the room in a window that seemed to be twice my height. I wanted to lounge around in bed soaking up the warm sun, but such luxury was a luxury I could not afford. Breakfast was as plentiful as possible. I needed to stock up on energy to keep myself busy throughout the day. After washing my face and finishing breakfast, I dressed up while being served by the maids. They tied a white shiny silk shirt with a silk string, and hung a silk vest and jacket embroidered with gold on it. It was a formal dress that Verone, the imperial cutter, 
had poured her heart and soul into. After putting on a pair of glossy black shoes, my appearance was complete. Mary, who had just become the chief maid of the imperial palace, knocked on the door. Your Majesty, all the ministers are seated in the conference hall. All right. I nodded at Mary's words. For times a year in the empire, there was a grand council where the grand duke and other high-ranking nobles gathered periodically. Today was that very day. After all, it's a bit frequent. It would seem that it could be reduced to twice a year, but the frequent exchange of information was necessary since the empire had just been founded. I couldn't help it for a while. But it's not bad to see them sometimes. The chamberlain draped the red cloak symbolizing the emperor over my shoulders and Mary handed me the crown. I lifted the crown and put it on my head. All the preparations for attending the meeting were complete. The emperor is coming. Everyone rose from their seats to welcome me as I entered the large conference room. The seats closest to me in the great council room were occupied by the six grand dukes, the seven heroes. Meyer and August occupied the front two sides, followed by Axion and Sevi, and Julieta and Nova occupied the bottom end of the grand ducal throne. And in places on the seats, I could see their faces. They were the Black Knights. Of course, there were also those who were not here. Such as Rober and the Red Wolf unit that protected Axion's territory. Rober even pushed the title she received to Julieta and enjoyed a life of freedom because she was comfortable. In the process, she would suddenly stop by the Imperial Palace to have a drink with me and then leave again without a trace, which was very much like her. The Red Wolf troops were busy cleaning up the mess Axion had made in the name of magical research in the territory. Five years had passed, but everyone looked much the same as they had in the past. It was a well-known fact that the expedition members aged somewhat slower, only because they were at a higher level and somewhat out of the human race. Rather, everyone's faces bloomed just by maintaining a comfortable daily life, because they did not have to enter any more dungeons that were dark, dull, and full of magi. Meyer's face, in particular, lit up daily. He was usually really handsome, but in the company of others like this, his face sparkled. Of course, his face did not light up just because his mind was at ease. Free from responsibility and burden, if Meyer devoted half of his day to increasing his memorabilia business, the other half was invested in keeping his body fit and cultivating his good looks all day long. Grand Duke Knox's officials were still left to Vince. I thought I'd say a word to Meyer about how awful it was for Vince to do it, and how he had to be responsible for it as Grand Duke. However, when they hear the news that medicinal herbs were rather good for the skin, they would gather them up like ghosts and spur Meyer on to skin management. Something about the fall of the Emperor's favor, and that His Excellency would not be able to re-establish himself. After hearing that story, I gave up thinking further about the internal affairs of the Grand Duke of Knox. As for the adults, what about the children? Sevi and Jean were growing up at the time of the Holy Demon War, and every year was different. Chapter, 192 Now twenty-one years old, Sevi has become a beautiful young man with sharp eyes. His long green hair was tied back, and quite a few people seemed to be flirting with his shimmering locks. Most of all, he grew much taller, it was embarrassing to be teased by Began and the others. As he grew bigger, so much bigger than the taller Axion, I repeatedly reminded myself not to cut the young child's future short too fast. Jean, who grew as beautifully as a clear ice flower, remained the quiet one and did not speak much. The others found such a figure quite difficult to approach, and they all rolled their tongues, she seems to be her title of ice wall, they said. Despite the distance, both of these beauties were of marriageable age, which drove the suitors away. Anasta, the guardian of the two, seemed quite troubled by it. People would come to ask permission for them or whatever they call it. But in my opinion, half of the suitors who came to Anasta came for her, so it wasn't just unfair. At some relative distance, Tragula and Optatio were sitting side by side. Optatio, who was ten years old at the time of the Holy Demon War, has grown up and is now a young count of fifteen. Optatio grew grayish-brown hair that resembled Countess Nearest to cover his face, but the thin chin tip and softly visible eyes definitely overlapped Tragula's figure. He looks more and more like Tragula as the years go by. I don't know if Tragula made it clear that he was his father. 
I saw Optatio's face and thought he'd find out soon enough. Well, family matters are sensitive and Tragula will do well. I circled the meeting room that way, and as soon as I sat down on the throne, everyone's eyes were on me. I didn't want to be a group project presenter, so I was preoccupied with the PPT, but how did I end up like this? I had forgotten for a while before I became emperor that the emperor was originally a position that undertook this type of work. I swallowed a sigh and got right down to business as soon as I took the throne. I appreciate you all taking time out of your busy schedules to attend every meeting. So, what's on the agenda this time? Anasta, who had taken charge of the meeting, checked the list of items on the agenda and opened her mouth without hesitation. The first issue is the recommendation of Grand Duke Ventus. Rejected. No, why? Sevi rose from his seat. But as soon as Meyer raised his eyebrows, he sat down again. I shook my head and said. You haven't missed anything since you turned twenty, Grand Duke. I don't say this much, but you need to learn to give up. Your Majesty, honestly, isn't that too much? I can't live with that title for the rest of my life. Sevi said, pretending to be very poor as if he were begging. It used to be a title that he craved so much for, but it's too bad that he can't put it in his mouth. The request to change the title of Sevi was like a cannonball that signaled the beginning of a meeting, and everyone in the conference room was not keen on it. I think I clearly tried to stop you. You should have stopped me more. Don't you think it's too cruel to keep a child's mischief in the archives for generations to come? He pretended to cry before, but now he's angry. Of course, I understood Sevi's mind. Beyond remaining in all literature as Sevi Ventus, the destroyer of Gales, the title of Sevi Ventus was also widely disseminated because of Meyer's memorial project. But there was no way around it. The historian recorded that even the imperial state could not back out. As if aware of these circumstances, Sevi spoke with dignity and desperation. The request I present to you is different. I already know that I cannot correct what has already been recorded. Please just correct the title. Or at least take my title off the Black Order souvenirs that Grand Duke Knox prints. Whom I'll give my positive consideration. Now, the next item. It was then that the face of Sevi finally brightened. This is why you shouldn't get ahead at such a young age. If I had to continue to use my adolescent internet nickname as an adult it's terrible just to think about it. Since then, ordinary and distant agendas have passed by. There will be a good harvest everywhere, and taxes will be available in a relaxed manner. All of this is due to your majesty's reign. Meanwhile, a single nobleman sneaked in a sneaky quip in his face. Arend, who wielded considerable power in the south, was also a count. What use could I, who knew nothing of farming, be to a good harvest? He must be flattering me to look good. I snickered. Well, I didn't do anything. Still, a bountiful harvest sounds pretty good to me. A look of embarrassment spread across the Count's face, as if he was still not used to flattery. Count Arend shook his head and spoke hastily. I believe that the roads that your majesty has built in each region have helped the regions to develop, avoid bad harvests, and promote the exchange of information and farm products. We all owe it to your majesty's grace, don't we? Yes, yes. I understand. I understand. I thought he was going to paint my face in gold with every word until I admitted it, so I nodded my head indifferently and waved my hand. It had been two years since I ascended to the throne, yet he seemed to have no idea what I liked and disliked. To them, efficiency was the extreme opposite of aristocracy. Otherwise, it was not explained that I, the emperor, couldn't understand the efficiency. The count, who had also started the conversation, Arend, continued cautiously, sweating. Our empire is already on a solid foundation it's been a good year and the people of the empire are at peace. Ichem. While talking, he felt strangely self-conscious. The subtle diagonal shift in his expression was. I glanced sideways at Meyer. Meyer didn't do anything to him, right? Meyer was sitting with his back in a chair with his natural eyes down. I frowned and brushed off the count, who didn't seem to be able to get to the point. So what's the point? Since there is plenty of room in the empire and your majesty has been immersed in work without a break until now, 
why not enjoy a break and preserve the rooftops for a while? Meyer shook his head and added a hint as if he was good. He had recently lived up to his word to rest a bit, so it was not surprising that he had intrigued Count Aaron to offer his opinion. I sighed and shook my head. I don't need to do that. Even though I have lower stats than my level, I am a member of a titled expedition. I don't have the physical strength to be this tired. But. The Count hesitated, his words slurred. It was a face wondering if he should talk or not. But as if he had quickly made up his mind, he added with his eyes closed. But it's time to see an heir soon. Meyer's face contorted and he said. His spine stood in and his otherwise large body drooped dangerously forward. Hm I guess the latter wasn't what he was consulted about. Or they didn't discuss the rest in the first place. From Meyer's point of view, he said he was good, but he put a knife in his back. Flames rose in Meyer's golden eyes. Meyer reached like a demon crawling up from the depths of a sulfur-boiling hell. I ordered that the latter story should not be mentioned, Count. No. Did he talk about it? When? Why on earth? I looked at Meyer in a panic. Come to think of it, Meyer and I have never exchanged a conversation about an air I was so busy that I didn't have time to discuss it in depth. I thought he was oddly consistent with contraception, but. From that attitude, I guessed that he did not like the idea of me getting pregnant, but I did not realize that he tried to control the public opinion of the nobility. The reaction was more sensitive than I had expected. Ah, uh, no amount of Grand Duke Knox can stop me from admonishing loyalty to things for the sake of the peace of the empire. Count Arundo did not shudder and refuted him firmly with his eyes closed. There was no other loyalty like that spirit. However, Meyer does not seem to feel much of such loyalty. He shouted loudly. Loyalty? Do you say that because you think you are more loyal than I am? Do I seem less loyal toward Her Majesty than you? In the dungeon, without trying too hard, the 80th level of anger was enough to shut the mouths of all. But the Count was more tenacious than I thought. Is it because you are incapacitated and hold on to the absence of an heir with your obsession? Your Majesty, only with an imperial heir can the country remain unshaken. Listen to my words of advice. Ah. It's an ulterior motive to use the lack of an heir as an excuse to force others as concubines. He seemed to have no doubt that Meyer's incompetence was to blame for the fact that we still had no heir. Surely he didn't think for a minute that we would use contraception. Because there is no reason to use contraception. How could I make that mistake? I shook my head. My first priority was to get rid of this mess. I first of all stopped Meyer, who was anxious to get rid of Count Aaron from the world because he couldn't stop him from talking. Calm down, Grand Duke Knox. But your majesty. Meyer shouted loudly, but when I pointed my palm at him, meaning to stop, his mouth closed. I continued my words quietly, looking at the party that had ignited the succession issue. I have heard about an heir, Count Arundo. The Count's face was smudged with color. He seemed to expect me to take his side. I cruelly defied his expectations. But you are right that there is no talk of a successor, and I have been too busy to do so. For a start, you have to clap your hands to make a sound. As soon as I spoke quietly, several people turned their heads softly in embarrassment. Why, what, why? Once I decided to be brazen, I wasn't wild. I continued talking without hesitation, with a vigor that no one could interrupt. Thank you for offering me a vacation just in time. I will enjoy my rest and talk with Grand Duke Knox about my successor, so please know that. Be but. Count Aaron's expectation would have been for me to pull out a concubine and fill them in the palace during my break. Unfortunately, his expectations would never be met. I don't like repeating the same thing twice, Count. When I revealed my annoyance, Count Aaron also shut his mouth. If he was going to confront me with a concubine, he could not get out of my sight even more so. However, I have no intention of retreating honestly here. How could he cloud the atmosphere of the imperial family by pretending to be loyal? How dare he climb up? I smiled and completely killed Count Aaron's temper. The Count thinks of the country so much, my tears are covering my eyes at your loyalty. You know, 
Just recently the rain that fell in the southern region caused some rivers to blow and collapse their banks your territory was in the south, wasn't it? The Count's face lost color. Chapter, 193 I am not one to use force often, but that did not prevent me from accomplishing what I once decided to do. Once I put it in my mouth, that was it. That fact meant that no matter how much Count Aaron refused, it was useless. In the end, Count Aaron had no choice but to make a donation in return for the bullshit. Count Aaron was handled that way for the time being. The meeting then continued as if nothing had happened. However, Meyer still seemed unsettled. I glanced sideways at Meyer in the middle of the meeting. It was impossible not to be bothered by the fact that his complexion, a hero of the reversal, had been saturated with blue by an argument with a nobleman during the meeting. Could it be that there is something he is hiding? I need to talk to Meyer. I wonder what he's thinking. Up to now, I had reacted somewhat insensitively to the succession issue, as I too have been busy with my work as emperor, but I certainly can't live as a dink forever. At least the title should be continued. How can I be a part of the empire? I sighed softly in my mind. I'll have to find out what Meyer meant after the meeting. Thus, the conference ended with nothing but confusion. That did not mean that I could afford to have a conversation with Meyer right away. The reason was that once I rose to the position of emperor, I had more to handle than I had expected, and there was more time to spare after I had given my seal of approval to a large number of projects. If you don't get approval straight from the top, you'll be paralyzed from the bottom. I sighed softly, stamping my seal on the papers. As soon as I tried to catch my breath for a while, August came to me. Your Majesty, you asked for me. Ah, Grand Duke D. Winnetis. Welcome. I welcomed August. The door closed and August and I were left alone in my office. I threw off the courtesy I had been solemnizing. I asked, hastening to linger at my desk. August, has Meyer ever said anything to you? About why he's so sensitive about an heir? In public, we were polite to each other, but in private, everyone was exactly as they had been in the old expedition days, using the same language and designations. The Grand Duke, the trio, treated Anasta, Rober, and began with respect, and so did I, the Emperor. August answered curtly, wondering to what extent he had perceived the baptism of questions that had suddenly flown in. I am not sure. I haven't heard anything specific about it. Ha! I sighed a little and leaned back in my chair. I don't know what he's thinking, but I'm sure he's stuck in something weird that we can't guess. I agreed with August's words. The problem would be to get a sense of what the weirdness was, and only then would we be able to get a clue about the dialogue. The succession problem I leaned my forehead on my little finger, glanced at August, and asked. Come to think of it, August, what are you going to do with the succession problem? August's Grand Duchy had become a sanctuary for priests and attracted many priests. The Grand Duchy, which was no different from the Holy Land, was the second largest power in the empire. Now that August and I work well together and maintain a confidential relationship it would be just as confusing without someone to take August's place. I am going to make the most faithful person my heir. I don't know how far the bond of faithfulness can last and I know that one day intentions will change, but isn't blood the same? You're not going to get married. I have sworn to be faithful to Sti. Marianne, and of course, I do not intend to marry. August said proudly, sticking out his chest. A smile full of faces looked proud. St. Marianne is not forcing you to be celibate. Why do you have to be single? Marriage is about putting your partner first. Yes. But for me, there will never be a better partner than religion. If I married someone in such a state, I would end up deceiving them because I would not be able to give them my best. And since deceiving people is a violation of the teachings of a Marianne, Mary Ann, I will not gain anything in the end. Marriage is about putting your partner first I repeated August's words in a small way. Perhaps Meyer's avoidance of succession might have something to do with me. Still, I had a small clue. Next, I have to ask him directly. I brightened my eyes with determination. When I finished my work, it was already after dark and the sky had been dark for some time. Stretching myself, I said to Mary. I'm going to bed soon, 
so ask Grand Duke Knox when his work will be finished. Mary returned shortly after the order was given. Mary told Meyer's answer with a bewildered face. He said he was tired today and went to bed first. There should have been no word more irrelevant to Meyer than the word tired. Meyer, who said it, me, who listened, and Mary, who told me, all knew it was true. A quick-witted guy. He seemed to have a pretty good idea of what I was going to talk about today. I clicked my tongue and let go of the pen I was holding. Then I'll go to the Grand Duke's bedroom. Mary hesitated and blurted out her words. Since it was the first time this happened, she seemed to be choosing what to say for a long time. I waved my hand out. Go to sleep first. How big is the Grand Duke's bed, and isn't there any place for me to crawl in? Then I'll get ready for bed. Mary quickly answered with a bow of her head. This is what I liked best about her after I made her my chambermaid. She agreed so quickly that I didn't have to speak to her twice. After I finished getting ready for bed, I went to Meyer's bedroom. The shimmering silk robe fell gracefully along with the flecks of my body in translucence like the wings of a dragonfly. It was Meyer's favorite. He had never said he particularly liked it. But I couldn't help but notice that every time I dressed like this, his eyes would flare and his gaze would become strangely insistent. And so I arrived at Meyer's bedroom. Meyer was lying on the wide bed, placed under a decor as elegant and old-fashioned as my bedroom, with his back to me. Humph. I can't believe he's going to bed. For someone who wakes up quickly in his sleep if he hears someone's presence, pretending not to hear me like that and showing his broad back meant nothing more than that he did not want to face me. I leaned back with my arms crossed against the bedpost and asked. Meyer, are you going to turn your back that much for the rest of your life? If you avoid today, what about tomorrow? What about the day after tomorrow? When I persistently asked, he stood up quickly from the bed. A crack between his eyebrows, like he had been frowning all day. His eyes flicked subtly for a moment as he saw my appearance, and he stealthily avoided my gaze. Yeah, that means it's not going to be easy today. In fact, he was also dressed up. I could see his firm chest and bright abs through his loose-fitting shirt. If Maya was aiming too, I thought, he was accurate. I moistened my lips with my tongue and sat down with my hips secretly attached to Meyer's side. Meyer, who did not know my true feelings, asked me with a serious face. Do you really need a successor? You're the Grand Duke. I'm the Emperor. We need a proper successor for the balance of the Empire. I could cite a number of examples of countries that have failed to have a successor in a timely and decent manner and have fallen in vain. Even if they were not the countries of this world. Meyer's face turned pale as I replied matter-of-factly. But are you really going to get pregnant? It's dangerous. In a moment, through his golden eyes, I could see the worst things that could happen to me in the future rise up and disappear. If it's a child you have to have anyway, it's not a bad idea to have it early. You're right, it's dangerous. Delivering a child in old age is not good for your health. That's why you don't have to have a child in the first place. Without knowing the reason, words continue to turn. What is the reason for Meyer's refusal to get pregnant so far? Does he really think I'm in danger and oppose the pregnancy? But this is a world with healing magic a world where even if your arm is cut off, as long as you receive healing magic in a timely manner, your arm will soon be attached. If it were not for this world, I might never have thought of pregnancy. Of course, just because you use healing magic doesn't mean you can't feel pain well, that didn't matter because I was used to pain in the first place. I proceeded slowly and patiently to figure out Meyer's more intimate inner thoughts. There's August and Anasta. What else could be dangerous to me when we can use all these healers? You never know. Meyer shouted loudly. He turned and looked at me as if glaring at me. On the other side of his gaze, as I looked closely, disgust quietly simmered. Chapter 194 Disgust Am I mistaken? but the more relentlessly I dug into it, the more certain I became that I had not misjudged it. If it's disgust, maybe he doesn't like it being my child or jealousy that the child might be depriving him of my attention. No way, I thought, but it was a good enough possibility. I sighed and asked openly. Do you dislike children? 
I dislike situations where you might be in danger. Meyer shook his head strongly in denial. His face widened in confusion as he kept his mouth shut. Looking at his mouth, which was closed tightly like a shellfish, it seemed that it was useless to try to question him any further about his true feelings while spinning around in circles. I raised the white flag and spoke to him openly and honestly. Whatever you say will be understood, so please explain it a little more carefully. Meyer still did not open his mouth for a while. Many emotions and thoughts seemed to swirl in his mind. Come on, this way. Lie down comfortably and let's talk. He and I lay down at an angle against the long, thick pillow that was leaning against the bedside. Then, with one arm outstretched, I slammed the space inside it. Even though Meyer was heavy, I was also over sixty levels. I could at least pillow my arms and with the pillows supporting my arms behind me, it wasn't particularly difficult. Even so, it was not often done. Maya was a head taller than me, but more so when I calculated his body in volume. It felt good to have him like that digging into my arms, but sometimes it was tiring. But today I was going to make him open his mouth, even if I had to be his arm pillow. Maya was perplexed by my sudden attitude. That said, he didn't want to miss out on the opportunity of me being an arm pillow. He sneaked over to me. The wider bed spared him the mishap of his legs popping outward, but the balance was the same. Pulling back the covers to cover his thick back like a large animal hanging over me, I lightly patted his hard shoulders. It was always a pleasant sensation that poked deep into my soul when the strongest person in the world became vulnerable and weak in front of me. I nudged him quietly and waited for a moment. The silvery locks of his hair fell wildly from my fingertips. After a moment of patience, Meyer cautiously opened his mouth. I'm nervous. It looked like he was. But instead of replying, I quietly waited for him to continue. Meyer cried out as if to tell me a secret he had kept hidden in his heart. There is concern that something will go wrong while you're pregnant, but when the time comes to have a child I'm not confident I can raise that child well. We would raise the child together. But the child will have my blood. The blood of Grand Duke Knox. Meyer raised his hand. His veins appeared blue beneath his large palms, which seemed to cover my face. A parent who has their child trapped in a spire, and a child who has killed them. Think about it, June. What if I could not love our child? What if our child acts ungratefully toward you? His concern was a bit more compounded. Distrust of himself and his own bloodline worry about me. Concern in light of the past for a future that cannot be certain until it is imminent. The more upset he gets, the stronger I have to appear. I pretended not to be upset and held my mouth tightly. That's speculation. I know I'm being silly and stubborn you want to hand over the empire to your own flesh and blood. Meyer chuckled. He leaned his head toward me. His silvery hair smelled of silverwood. But in this world that you gave your life to protect, walking the path you have honed if our child grows up to be such a person who cannot respect your greatness. Meyer's eyes glistened grimly at the thought of it. His golden eyes filled with disgust. You are gentle and would embrace such a child in your arms, but you would be hurt. I am so afraid of that. That something following in my blood could hurt you. The long confession of our feelings was over. Our succession issue was a conglomeration of all the traumas of Meyer Knox. On the other hand, it was just that I didn't even have in mind in the first place to conceive another man's child for my successor. I licked out the words with an intake of breath. And carefully, I comforted him with a combination of words as I stitched them together one by one. You're different from your parents. Isn't it natural not to respect someone who hasn't done anything to admire? We just need to become adults, parents that they can respect. You probably have someone like that too. Like your nanny Janata, or your current butler Vince. Meyer's eyes grew rusty as he thought of Janata and Vince. The only reason Meyer could relate to my half-hearted words in any way was because his childhood was not only completely painted black. The gap that remained white was filled with gratitude to Janata and Vince for creating that gap. I swept Meyer's disheveled bangs up one by one. Then, as I kissed his revealed forehead, I added huskily. I think you'd make a good parent. Well, maybe you'd be too much sometimes. 
would I be overly strict? Meyer asked, smiling coyly as if he had finally regained some composure at that point. I said counter-questioningly as if I had nothing to talk about. No, I'm afraid you would babysit too much. Oh, no. I laughed aloud, which produced a bemused reaction from Meyer, and soon he laughed too, facing me. I held his head and whispered. Listen, Meyer. I never intended to have children in the first place. Meyer's hands naturally wrapped around my waist. I felt the warmth of his hands, and I confided my true feelings, which I had also been hiding. You are right. I was afraid of having a child, but I was also afraid of what kind of person that child would grow up to be I had my hands full just trying to hold myself together. I enjoyed playing around. I couldn't give up drinking and laughing with friends. Sleeping in. I could skip a meal once in a while if I didn't want to budge. The fact that I might have to give up everything when I became a mother tightened my neck. I thought that I grew up as I got older, only, I didn't grow up at all. My sense of responsibility was too selfish and my patience too thin to properly raise one properly. But after meeting you, I naturally thought I would have children. Not only for the succession of the title but also I thought that with you I would be a good parent. Because I am not the only one raising the child. Because you will always fill in the missing pieces for me. Like in a dungeon. And because of that, we saved the world too, didn't we? So at least raising a child was challenging enough. You will be a good parent. And our child will love you as much as you love me. The amount of love you will show me will be enough to raise our child. Meyer's eyes shook as if the golden waves of dawn were slowly coming in. And I'm not as good as you are when it comes to being ungrateful. I added jokingly with a small laugh. It was not a funny story, but it was rather funny under the circumstances. You said I wanted to cede my empire to flesh and blood, but precisely I want to cede it to your child. To your child whom I love. That child may resemble me, or they may resemble you, or perhaps they may resemble a suitable mixture of us. Either way, they will be lovely. I pulled out the arm that was supporting Meyer's face and mounted him. His face was trapped under my arms I looked down at him and whispered. I want to have your child. I whispered, stroking my grey hair down. But I left the gown flowing under my shoulders. I could clearly see Meyer's neck moving wide in my eyes. I smiled, folding my eyes. In Meyer's eyes, I had a bewitching smile on my face. You don't like it? You are so cruel. Meyer swallowed his saliva and sighed. His big hands wrapped around my thighs. The hem of my skirt fell into disarray. If you say so, I can't resist. That's what I said, don't say no. I smiled. I lowered my head and pressed my lips cautiously, but not a moment too soon, still as if to put a seal on Meyer's lips. Then I quietly put an end to our conflict. We, as I said, are going on vacation. A long vacation. After a whole night of such open-minded physical and verbal dialogue, we reached a suitable compromise. In the first place, there must be a successor to the empire. But then there was disagreement. When I asked Meyer what he was going to do about the Grand Duchy, he replied in a nonchalant manner, for the time being, the title itself will belong to the next emperor, and then it can be allocated later as we see fit. He was very dry about his own family affairs. Rather, he insisted, the Grand Duchy has been around for about 1,000 years, so it's time for it to disappear. But as for me, it was a waste. Isn't it a living history? Well. I can change his mind gradually after going on vacation. Or maybe after we have our first child. There is still plenty of time but that time was approaching faster than I thought. For two months after I went on vacation, I learned that I was pregnant. They're twins. Meyer jumped in horror at hearing August's pronouncement. Twins? Yes, two imperial children have entered. As if to deny Meyer's expectations, August spoke again, putting more force behind his words. It was almost as if he was enjoying the sight of Meyer's panic at his own words. As August had intended, Meyer's mind had gone blank. He wandered around the room in a panic, at a loss. What am I going to do with this? It would be an even greater burden of danger. 
and if something goes wrong with June in the meantime. Maya was horrified, but I was frankly delighted. It's the same with the deterioration of condition during pregnancy, and wouldn't it be more efficient to end it once than to get pregnant twice? Both the Light Yisha family and Grand House of Knox were fortunate to have less to worry about in terms of succession. I breathed a small sigh of relief as I patted my still peaceful belly. Please grow up properly you are Meyer's blood, so I can only guess how you will grow. Those were the first words I whispered to our children with earnest hope. Chapter, 195 It's been a year since I gave birth to the twins. They've just turned a year old, and they're fluffy and chubby. They don't look like one-year-olds at all. The twins grew like sprouts. Their development was so rapid that no one could believe they were a year old. I can't believe it's already been a year. I remember giving birth as if it was just yesterday I replayed the events of the birth. They say childbirth is painful, but it was uniquely painful for me. It wasn't because I wanted children, it was because, as I feared. Both twins were extremely healthy. Again, not just healthy kids, but extreme, healthy kids. Carrying them around in my belly was hard enough. But the real hell was giving birth. In my mind, I might as well just cut off my arms and reattach them. The level 60 stats made childbirth less dangerous, but they didn't make me better at it. I walked into the birthing room feeling like I was about to enter the Demon King's War for the fifth time, and just as I felt like I was about to enter the Demon King's War for the fifth time, my children came out into the world. A princess and a prince. Just the right size. Exhausted, I spat out the words as I dropped my head and breathed raggedly. Mary wiped the sweat from my face with a busy hand. August, who had been working his healing magic on me, clicked his tongue as he checked on the children. Your majesty is strong. I can't believe you didn't scream. Well, I'm still a hero for defeating a demon, so that's something to show for it. At my best bravado, August's expression turned grotesque. He looked at me like I didn't have the energy to make a joke at this point. Not having the energy to giggle, I smiled faintly. August handed me the children. They were heavy, like the man who had pushed my high-level stamina to the limit. Look at them, Meyer, there are kids. I whispered, leaning my face into Meyer's arm that was supporting my body. Meyer's forearms were stained red. I could clearly see my hand and nail marks on his forearms, which had never left a mark no matter how hard I beat him. I must have pinched and twisted him a lot. While I was giving birth, Meyer insisted on joining me in the delivery room, saying he couldn't leave me alone. I was sure he'd freak out 100% if he saw me giving birth. I went into the delivery room half worried, and half anxious, but all of that went away as soon as I started to push. My head was so white with pain that I couldn't think. I was in Meyer's arms, using his forearm for support to push through the pain. It didn't seem to do much to relieve the pain, but I realized that whatever little it was, it didn't matter, because I had given birth safely. At that moment, hot water was dripping on my forehead. You are very undutiful kids. The boiling sound rang in Meyer's throat. I struggled to look up. Meyer was crying, his face distorted. He looked more distressed than I was. I can't believe you put your mother through this. That's mean. At this point, it's easy to get out. I smiled and reached for his eyes. My fingertips smeared with moisture as they touched the corners of his eyes. You can hug them too, I can't hug them anymore because my arms are numb. W what if they get hurt? Newborn children are weak entities. They may be newborns, but they have your blood. They're not that weak. I glanced at their stats and pushed them into Meyer's arms. The children's base stats were outstanding, as befits the children of a black knight. The stats made up for all the hard work I'd put into them. Yes. It's better to be strong and big like Meyer than weak and ordinary like me. As I thought this, I looked at Meyer, stiff with helplessness, and the twins crying in his arms. Born at the end of spring in the beginning of summer, I gave the names of spring and summer. From then on, the twins grew rapidly, they walked fast and babbled fast. Being twins, they seemed to have some competition. Still, there were subtle differences, with Belle, the older sister, being more persistent and greedy. 
Her brother, Istas, wasn't as easy to please, but. Hey, Belle, you can't push your brother like that. I exclaimed in panic. We were walking along, holding on to the railing together, when Belle pushed Istas to the ground, thinking he was in her way. Istas immediately rolled over and stood up. This one didn't cry much. Istas grunted and lunged angrily at Belle. However, because he was still not balanced, he fell to the ground again as soon as Belle reached out. Where does that belligerence come from? Is it education or heredity? If it's heredity, I don't think it's on my side of the family, it's the blood of the Grand Duke of Knox after all. But Maya grew up to be a well-behaved, good-natured adult. Although somewhat selfish. I still had faith that they could be reformed, and I searched for a tutor for the twins. Fortunately, I quickly found the right person. Anasta. Thank you for trusting me with this. I, too, thank you for taking care of the troublesome work yourself. I know I can count on you, Anasta. I squeezed Anasta's hand and shook it. These were the children of the next emperor or duke, and only someone with a title could be in charge of their education. Anasta had a title, she was trusted by me, and she was used to dealing with children. She was also a healer, which made her the perfect choice for the children's education. Anasta smiled shyly at my enthusiastic cheers. It's just that Jean and Sevi are both grown up and need less of my care, and I'm bored, so it doesn't bother me at all. But you have the estate, you could have chosen to concentrate on it. No. I guess I'm more suited to taking care of one or two people like this than many. The weight of many is too much for me. Anasta smiled bitterly and shook her head. She still seemed to be reeling from the aftermath of Fabian, and since it wasn't a good topic to bring up, I turned the conversation away. So you've left the estate to Jean, then? Phew, that's what I said, but I'm glad you agreed right away. If you said you cared about being the Lord, I was going to at least ask my clinging to you. Don't you think too highly of me? Anasta, who knew nothing, laughed out loud. I shook my head seriously. No. It's not like it's easy to find a healer, and August is busy with so many things, I don't want to leave the kids in his care. Are you in a hurry for a healer? I thought the children were all in good health, taking after Grand Duke Knox. Anasta lowered her voice in concern the worry on her face made me realize I had been vague I added hastily. Oh, of course, they're healthy. They've got great survivability, great immunity, great stamina. And? They just get hurt a little too often. Hurt. Anasta exclaimed, startled. I furrowed my brow in a serious expression and lowered my voice to a whisper. They get into too many little accidents together. If I so much as glance at them, they'll scream and fight. Or they get into trouble together. Already? That's what I'm saying. I screamed and grumbled. I know it's hard to believe now that kids who've just passed their first birthdays are fighting, but she'll see for herself soon enough. I shook my head. I'm not going to be your average nanny. They need the focus and attention of an expeditionary force. They're like your own children. That's not a compliment, is it? Anasta didn't respond to my prodding, only giving me a vague smile. She still thought I was exaggerating. I was relieved. She hadn't signed yet. I didn't want to say anything too bad about the twins and have Anasta run away. Chapter 196 I went on, confirming Anasta's arrival in the capital. Jean must be lonely with Sevi and you at the palace. She's fine on her own, she might even be glad I'm not nagging her. Is that the case these days? I asked, startled. I wasn't sure what Anasta had to nag Jean about, but Jean's response was also unexpected. Anasta giggled and shrugged. Seriously, she's all grown up. She used to try not to fall off my skirt. Kids grow up fast. I know. Anasta sighed, a little wistfully. Her eyes clouded over as if looking far away, then curved into a wry smile. I'm sure the prince and princess will grow up quickly and I'm honored to have been allowed to be a part of it. Then let's finalize it, and sign it right away. Impatient, I pulled out the contract I had prepared. Was that too obvious? Anasta's eyes narrowed. 
It's suspicious that you're in a hurry. What do you mean? I just want to be sure. I excused myself, trying to sound nonchalant. Anasta smirked in that teasing way of hers and trailed off. Hmm. Something like that. After much pushing and pulling, Anasta picked up a pen. Once I saw her signature on the contract, I breathed a sigh of relief. Of course, later, when Anasta saw what the twins had done, she would go on a rampage, accusing me of deceiving her, but so what, the contract was already written. I smiled in satisfaction. It didn't take long for Anasta to realize the truth. In fact, it would not have taken long to figure out the situation because the twins were not old enough to have an accident while looking at the situation. Anasta gritted her teeth, feeling betrayed. How could you leave me in charge of those little monsters, calling them newborns? Little monsters, they are still prince and princess. Your majesty made a bad appointment, you should have chosen a shield bearer, not a healer, to train them. It's not that bad. It's that bad. Anasta shouted as she burst into my office. I smirked at her uncharacteristic outburst, as she was usually quiet and obedient to my every word, and excused myself. I told you they were accident prone. I didn't think it would be this bad I've got both hands and feet up, and I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to comply with your majesty's request any time soon. I can't believe you'd put a trustworthy person like me through such a trial. I'm afraid I've done a number on Anasta's trust. But I can't help it. Sometimes you have to give up something to get something important in life. I desperately clung to Anasta and pleaded with her. Anasta, if it's not you, I have no one else to take care of the kids because even though they're monsters because they look like mire, they still have my blood in them. So they get hurt, they get sick. I rolled my eyes, and Anasta sighed as if she couldn't help it. They're unusually maneuverable and strong, and I can't handle the scope of the accident. I can't do it alone. I'll get you someone. As many as you want. I grinned and grabbed Anasta's hand and shook it. Anasta clicked her tongue as if she couldn't resist. It was then that she realized what Bell and Istas had done, and heard the sound of the maids fussing over the door to the chamber. Anasta sighed in frustration. Ugh. Really? What a bunch of troublemakers. They're cute, though. Look at them. They'd be cute in your majesty's eyes, they look so much like Grand Duke Knox. Anasta exclaimed, her eyes watering. I don't see what looking like Meyer has to do with being cute. I shrugged and asked back. So you don't think they're cute? It's not fair to talk like that. Anasta grumbled, but eventually, as if she had no choice, she headed for the kids. She didn't forget to turn around and look at me, adding firmly. You'll have to get somebody to watch them, someone strong and sturdy. No worries. I smiled and waved Anasta off. It wasn't long before I heard Anasta scolding my children from beyond the office. Oh no, princess, prince, that's not a toy. Put it down. No. It's mine. You can't be so insistent. As I listened to them slowly walk away, I swept my hand across my chest, afraid that Anasta really couldn't do it. I was terrified that Anasta would say she couldn't do it, but I finally relented. If it's not Anasta, there's no one else who can handle them. I thought, what if, just in case, Anasta says no in a more forceful way, and I started looking for a replacement. But there was no such thing as a role reversal. The reliable ones were busy, and the unreliable ones weren't, so. When Axion heard of my troubles, he insisted that it was all karma, rolling people as they are to favor efficiency. But to my ears, it sounded like a vain argument from a man who didn't want to work. All he wanted to do was stay in his lab and work on his magic, but his mouth was pouting because I had just given him the job of Grand Duke. Of course, being a Grand Duke wasn't all work. There was one person left in the world who was the most reliable, had the most time to spare, and had the stamina to handle the children. The children's father, Meyer. But what can I do? He freezes up whenever he goes near them. I sighed. Even though I was busy with work, I tried to spend some time with my family. But every time I did, Meyer acted like the kids were clay figurines that hadn't dried. As if they would crumble to dust if he touched them. 
If I forced him to pick them up, his limbs would tense up. He's not a dog that can carry a raw egg in his mouth. And I've given up on leaving them with Meyer for the time being. Maybe when they're older, but it seemed to me that they'd have to get past his waist before he'd be able to hold them properly. Whereas Meyer kept his distance from the kids, they purposely ran and clung to him as if he were a wall of hurt or a plaything. I guess it makes sense that kids who have just passed their first birthday wouldn't run instead of walking, but they really ran. Every time that happened, Meyer would let out a strangled groan and turn to me, and I would pull them away from the frozen Meyer, who would then turn back to them, and they'd repeat the process, obviously recognizing it as a fun game. Anyway, I'm glad Anastat didn't quit. With that out of the way, I could finally concentrate on my work. By the way, there was a recent report that caught my eye. After having kids, I cut back on quarterly meetings to once a year and replaced them with more frequent reports. It's hard to get your mind off things and your face to face, and it's an immediate exchange of information, but it was definitely a waste of time and money. Of course, I had no intention of letting the local nobles think otherwise, so I set up a special organization to inspect the provinces. An inspectorate of sorts. They would cross-check their reports against what they knew, verify them, and punish them for any omissions or false reports. After shuffling through the reports for a while, I finally found the one I'd been craving. Found it. Pilgrims have been going missing near Erend. I tapped my fingertips on the desk. Count Erend was a man who had earned Meyer's ire two years ago when he'd brought up the matter of his heirs at a meeting and used the opportunity to shove them in. I know he's been living like a mouse under Meyer's nose ever since, but I didn't expect his name to come up again like this. It might be nothing, but my senses were screaming at me that something was fishy. All's well that ends well. It couldn't hurt to check, so I jumped on it.